Overlord. Volume 8, The Two Leaders. Side Story 1, Henry's Tumultuous and Hectic Days. Henry Emmett rose before the sun came up to make breakfast. She was not as good a cook as her deceased mother, and there was a lot of food to prepare. Counting Nemu, Henry herself and the nineteen goblins loyal to her, she had to make breakfast for twenty-one people. Cooking for two more on top of those would make twenty-three in total. Preparing that much food was a lot of work, and could be considered a battle in its own right. Henry trembled while looking at the vast quantity of food in front of her and realized that it would all be gone in one meal. This is nearly six times as much as before. After taking a deep breath, she rolled up her sleeves, psyched herself up and got to work. She silently sliced up the vegetables, and then the meat. The process was engraved into Henry's mind by now. Although Henry was not especially talented at cooking, the fact that she had learned to cope with such an enormous task in such a short time was a textbook example of how diamonds were made under pressure. Her little sister woke from the sound of Henry making breakfast and rubbed the sleep out of her eyes. Morning, Pony Chan. Let me help too. Morning, Nemu. I'm good over here, but there's still that thing I asked you to help me take care of yesterday. Unhappiness flashed over Nemu's face for a moment, but in the end, she did not complain, although she did droop her head and reply K as she obeyed Henry. Henry's hands stopped. Her heart ached. Nemu was ten years old now, and she had been a lively and spirited girl once. After that incident, the formerly naive and carefree Nemu was now slavishly obedient to her sister, without any of the playfulness or tantrums of children her age. She was a good girl now, so good that it hurt. The smiling faces of her parents appeared in Henry's mind. Although several months had passed, the wounds from that incident had not yet healed. If they had died because of illness, she could have prepared herself for it. If they had died from an accident or a natural disaster, she would not have hated anyone else for it, and maybe she would not have been scarred either. But her parents had been murdered in front of her eyes, and her heart was now filled with resentment. There was no way she could feel otherwise. Henry squeezed her eyes shut. If there was someone nearby, then she could work hard so they would not see her weakness. But when she was by herself, the loneliness reopened the wounds in her heart. Isn't that right? She still saw her parents' kind smiles floating in the darkness behind her eyes. Even when she opened them, their forms did not fade from her vision. She replayed the tender moments of the past in her mind, over and over again. After that came the maelstrom of black emotions in her heart, her hatred for the people who had murdered her parents. Driven by them, Henry slammed her cleaver into the meat with all her might, splitting it in half. However, since she used too much force, she also chopped a divot out of the block, which made her furrow her brow in frustration. If the blade gets chipped, it's going to be hard to fix. I'm sorry, Okaa-san. Henry covered up the hole as she apologized for damaging the cleaver that was her only link to her deceased mother. She gently ran a finger along the edge to make sure it was fine, and at that moment, the door beside her, which led to the living room, opened up. The person who entered was not human, but someone shorter, one of the demi-humans commonly known as goblins. Morning, Anne San. Today's my turn to. What's wrong? The goblin paused in the middle of a perfect bow to turn concerned eyes to Henry's hands. Henry was a mere village girl, but the goblin served her without hesitation because she was their summoner. After that incident, when the villagers had wondered if they needed to take shifts standing guard, Henry remembered the horn she had been given and used it to summon the goblins. The villagers were initially surprised and afraid of the goblins since they had suddenly appeared out of nowhere, but they calmed down when Henry told them that she had summoned the goblins with an item from their saviour, Ein's Ul Gaon. Needless to say, this was because of the gratitude and trust they felt towards Ein's. Thereafter, the work the goblins had done was enough for the villagers to put aside their suspicions and welcome them from the depths of their hearts. Good morning, Kajali San, I just used a bit too much force with the cleaver. Kajali was one of Enri's summoned goblins. He furrowed his brows, 
looking like a man-eating bear awakened from his winter hibernation, and put a concerned expression on his face before looking at Henry. That's no good, you need to take care of that cleaver. The village doesn't have a blacksmith, so we can't repair our equipment either. Is that so? Well, it's all right. We'll think of a solution when the time comes. Kaijali spoke in an earnest, yet cheerful voice while he helped make the breakfast. He drew a smoldering wick from the pot he was holding, and with a practiced maneuver, lit the stove. The deft ease with which he turned a faint ember into a roaring blaze was evidence of his skill, but they can't cook. Why is that? Goblins could not prepare even the simplest meals. Since they ate raw meat and vegetables without a complaint, she thought they might like raw food more, but it became clear that they preferred cooked meals, although they could still stomach raw food without trouble. Is it because summoned beings don't know how to cook? A mere village girl like herself had no answer to this question, and with it she threw herself into her work once more. Fortunately, the cleaver's edge was still intact. Eventually, breakfast was ready. There were a wider variety of dishes on the table compared to the days when her mother was cooking. For example, there was meat. Although the local rangers often shared their kills in the past, the amount they could bring back was nothing compared to now. The reason why they had so much more meat now was because the villagers had expanded their area of activity. The great forest of Tob provided its bounty to them in the form of firewood, food in the form of fruits and wild vegetables, animals for meat and fur, and even medicinal herbs. Although the forest was rightfully regarded as a treasure trove, it was also home to wild beasts and monsters, which could make their way back to the village. As a result, the forest was not a place where the villagers could casually enter. Even the experts like professional hunters were forced to skulk like thieves seeking treasure on the edges of the wise king of the forest's territory. However, with the disappearance of the wise king of the forest and appearance of the goblins, the situation had changed radically. The greatest change was that the villagers could now easily enter the forest and harvest its resources. The work of the goblins, who were strong beings, were a key factor in this, meat, which had previously been hard to obtain, could now be easily acquired, and their tables were decked with fresh fruits and vegetables. As a result, the food situation in the village had dramatically improved. In addition, since the goblins were Henry's subordinates, they delivered the lion's share of their kills to her home. In addition, one of the newest additions to the village was a ranger who had made contributions to the provisions. She was a woman who used to be an adventurer in E. Rantle. For various reasons, she moved to this village, and was learning the ways of the hunter from the ranger who was living in the village. As she had been a warrior during her adventuring days, her skills with the bow were excellent, and she could bring down even the biggest game with a few arrows. It was partly because of her efforts that the distribution of meat in the village had improved. The improved standard of living brought changes, which were reflected in the villagers' bodies. Henry curled her biceps, flexing her muscles. Her gains were quite impressive. Mm, I feel so pumped they're getting even bigger. The goblins praised Enri at every opportunity with phrases like Anne Sands totally ripped. Yeah, pump it up again. She's too swole to control. Aim for a six-pack. Look at how cut she is, they most likely meant well, but as a girl, it was difficult to accept such compliments. If I ended up like how the goblins described, it wouldn't be good. Enri swept the goblins' idealized final form of herself from her mind and began serving breakfast. That too was a tedious task. While the goblins would not quibble over a small difference in portion size, the amount of meat in their soup was a huge issue. Henry ensured that everyone's dishes and bowls had a similar amount of meat before moving on to the next task. Eventually, breakfast was ready, and sweat dripped from her forehead. Then, let's call everyone, the goblins, and Nfeya over. Hmm. Yes. I'll go. Let me do it. I want to do it. As Henry turned around, she saw Nemu standing behind her with eyes alight. Have you done your chores? Her sister nodded by way of reply, and so did Henry. Really? Then go get Nfi. No. I want to call the goblins. 
Enri had no idea how to answer her little sister's sudden outburst. Kaijali nodded gently to Nemu, presumably indicating that he would entrust her with that task. I'll leave that to you, then. I'll go get Nfaya. That's more like it. A capital idea. And San, let me go with you. Although this would leave the house empty, it did not bother Enri. After all, there had never been any issues with thieves breaking in before. Together with Kaijali, Enri left the house just after Nemu did. The wind blew on Enri's face, carrying the scent of grass and warmed by the gentle light of the morning sun. Enri took a deep breath, and when she turned to look at Kaijali, he was breathing in the scent as well. Enri could not help smiling at the sight, and Kaijali scowled, trying to regain his lost dignity with a fierce expression. Perhaps the Enri of the past would have been afraid, but Enri was used to living with the goblins now, and she knew this was just how he smiled. On this refreshing, cool and clear day, Enri proceeded to the house next to hers. It had been left ownerless from the tragedy that had befallen their village recently, and had become the home of the alchemists from E. Rantel, the bears. The house was occupied by two people. One of them was an old woman, the grizzled, experienced herbalist Lizzie Bear. The other was her grandson and Enri's friend, Faya Bear. The two of them spent their days cooped up in the house, processing herbs to make potions and other medicines. Not working closely with other villagers was a good reason to be isolated, and in the worst-case scenario, to be kicked out of the village. But it was different for those two. In every village, an apothecary, someone who could prepare medicines in case of disease or injury, was indispensable. They could be said to be important enough that the villagers would plead, you don't need to do anything except make medicine for us. This went double for a place like Kani village, which had no access to priests who could use healing magic, incidentally, priests would double as the village apothecary in larger villages. Priests would charge an appropriate fee for their healing magic. Or rather, it might be better to say that they would need to charge the fee. If the villagers could not afford to pay, then they would offer up their labor instead. For those who lacked the ability to even do that, the priests would use medicines compounded from herbs, since herbal cures were less expensive than magical healing. One of the goblins in the village was a cleric, and he could heal minor wounds with ease, but the villagers had come together with the opinion that he should save up his power for an emergency, unless someone was very badly hurt. Not to mention, the cleric's healing spells were very limited and lacked the ability to heal diseases or neutralize poisons. Therefore, everyone was grateful to the bears for the work they did. Even so, the villagers did not dare approach them despite the vital job they performed. The reason for this was abundantly clear as one approached the bear's residence. Enri scrunched up her nose, as did Kaijali, although the expression looked more evil on his face. An acrid stench wreathed the house which they were approaching. The odor was not actually that awful, though it still made them feel ill. The smell released from crushing up herbs might be off-putting, but ultimately it was only the scent of plants, and was not dangerous in itself. Breathing through her mouth, Enri knocked on the door. She knocked quite a few times, but nobody answered the door. Just when she thought nobody was home, the sound of someone approaching came from the other side. She heard someone hastily fumbling with the lock on the other side, and then the door opened. Dash. She did not want to react with her expression or words, but the smell coming from inside the house was truly unbearable. It was painful. A harsh, stinging pain seared her eyes, nose and mouth. Worse still, the vile stench from inside the house suggested that the miasma around the house was nothing more than what had leaked out from inside. Good morning, Enri. Nfaya's eyes, which were visible from between the gaps in his long hair, were wide open and bloodshot. He must have stayed up all night for alchemical experiments again. She did not want to open her mouth to speak when she was enveloped by the eye-watering odor, but it would be rude not to return a greeting. Gee good morning, Infi. She felt her throat dry out as she said that. Morning, Arnie-san. Ah, good morning, Kai. Kaijali-san. Ha, huh, it's morning already? I was working so hard I didn't notice. 
Seeing the sun makes me realize how the time just flew by. Ah, I've been doing so many experiments recently, I need to get out of the house. Dufaya stretched like a cat and yawned. Looks like you've been burning the midnight oil, huh? Henry was about to add breakfasts ready, come over with Orbar Summer, but Nferia interrupted. Or rather, instead of saying he interrupted her, it might be better to say that she was overwhelmed by his boyish enthusiasm. It's amazing, Henry. Nferia rushed up to her. His work clothes reeked of that same stinging odor which filled the rest of the house. Although Henry wanted very much to back away from him, she forced herself to endure it, because Nferia was her dear friend. What, what happened, Infi? You've got to hear this. We finally managed to perfect the procedure for brewing a new type of potion. This is going to change the world. Even though all we did was to mix the herbs that we gathered into the solution, we managed to produce a purple potion. The only reply he received was a huh? Henry had no idea how this was amazing. Was the potion purple because they infused purple cabbage into it? and it can cure wounds. The healing speeds on par with alchemically refined potions. Henry raised his hands, showing off his delicate, slender arms that were unmarred by injury. Henry thought, I have bigger biceps than he does, but Nferia didn't stop there. Which is to say? Yes, yes, that's wonderful, tell us about it later, Kaijali spoke as he took a step forward. Arnie San here looks like he's been sleeping too little and partying too hard. Maybe he's high or something? An San, let me take care of this. Why don't you go back first? Will it be all right? Sure it will. I'll splash some cold water on his face and when he calms down, I'll bring him over. If you take too long, others will get worried. Say, what about Bar San? Obachan still got her head buried in her research. I don't think she'll be coming for breakfast. I'm sorry, you went through all this trouble to prepare breakfast for us. Ah, don't worry about it. I was thinking that Lizzie Summer would probably be doing that. Situations like these had come up quite a few times already, so it was hardly a surprise. Then, and San, you should head back first. With that said, there was nothing to do but leave. Then, I'll leave him to you. As he watched Enri leave, Kaijali turned a cold stare on Furya. The hell were you doing back there? The only time a girl listens to a man talking about what he likes is if she likes the person. If she doesn't like that person, then that blabbering's only going to turn her off. I'm sorry, I just thought that since we made that amazing discovery. But it was really amazing. Revolutionary, even. Kaijali interrupted the motor-mouthed rant with a chopping motion. Clearly, the furrier had not gotten the message he was trying to convey. Look, Arnie san Are you all right with this? You're in love with An san aren't you? The furrier replied with an mm and nodded his head vigorously. Then you have to make her the most important person in your heart. More important than your potions. I get it. I'll try do, or do not. There is no try. You need to win her heart. Me and the rest of the lads will do our best to back you up. Plus, it's not just us, even Emoto-san agreed to help you out. I hope you get yourself together and do your part, Arnie-san. Mm. If you're just waiting for her to say I like you first, then more likely than not, someone else is going to snatch her away, you know. You've got to work up the courage to tell her how you really feel. That line pierced Nferia's heart like a dagger between the ribs. Still, despite everything I said, looks like you've been doing pretty well on that front yourself, Arnie san Used to be you couldn't even say a word in front of her. Now you can carry on a normal conversation, right? That was because I didn't have much chance to talk with Enri unless I came around to gather herbs. Now that I've moved into the village, I'm around her a lot more. That's it. That's the spirit. All that's left is to gather your courage and step up to the plate. Maybe you should show off your strength first. According to the villagers, strong men are still the most attractive. Well, for the 49-year-old women in the village, anyways. I'm not too confident in my arm strength, 
Maybe I should do more farm work or something? Nah, what you should be using is this, Infi Niazan, Kaijali spoke while gently tapping his head. Settle things with this. And then work your magic. If me or one of the lads think you've got a chance to score points with her, we'll pose like this. That's your cue to say something or act in a way to make her fall in love with you. Kaijali flexed his arms in a front double bicep curl. They bulged mightily under his skin. Kinda like that. And if you need a more impressive demonstration. Next, Kaijali flexed his pectorals with a side chest spread. Although he was quite short, his athletic, muscular body attested to the fact that he was a born warrior. Nfeya wondered why these poses. However, he could sense Kaijali's goodwill, so he did not actually ask that question. Still, there was one question he wanted to ask. I, I'm curious, why are you guys doing this? I mean, I know you're Enri's subordinates and you're loyal to her, but I don't understand why you're helping me. Well, that's simple, Kaijali replied with an inscrutable expression on his face. In a tone better suited to coaxing little kids to behave, he replied, that's because we all want Ansan to be happy. And from where we're looking, you fit the bill. So the faster you two get married, the better. And no need for such a rush. T the two of us can slowly reduce the distance between us, right? That would be too slow. I mean, don't humans take a long time between getting pregnant and having kids? Dufaya's eyes went wide and his face turned pink as the conversation suddenly jumped to pregnancy, the final form of male-female relationships. T that would be about nine months? Hmm, then it would take a really long time for about ten pups, I mean, ten kids, right? Ten? Isn't that a bit much? Five children were the average for a farming village family. In tough times when it was hard to survive to adulthood, this number would go up. In the city, this number was usually less, with the help of priests to cure diseases or the use of contraceptives. So, a woman giving birth to ten children was not a bit much, it was way too much. What are you on about? It's pretty normal for us goblins. We're not goblins. All right, point taken, our races have our differences. But still, you gotta have lots of kids to make Anne San happy. All right, I can't deny that she might be happy with a house full of children. But it still seems kind of wrong. Really? Nfeya was at a loss for words as he saw Kaijali looking at him with his head tilted at an angle. But on the whole, he was still grateful for their assistance. Then, let's head out, Arnie san I hope you make a move soon. Although keeping her waiting for too long might cause problems. Well, I think a steady, tactical advance on the main objective is a strategy worth pursuing. Where did you learn all of this? Nfeya shook his head. Oi, Obachan, I'm going to Enri's for breakfast, what about you? The reply that came from the house was a refusal to Nfeya's question. Most likely, she was in the middle of repeating an experiment, and had no time to bother with trivial things such as eating. Nfeya could relate to that feeling. The alchemical tools and other paraphernalia in the house were of an extremely high grade, and they did not know how to use most of them. The maid in the service of the great magic caster Ein's all gown had brought them over. The two of them had been ordered to use these materials to produce new potions and alchemical items. Oh, and the maid had even brought some sort of legendary herb said to cure all illnesses. When he asked her about the solvents and the proper usage of the instruments, all he got in return was a figure-it-out-yourself Sue Tilda, which did not help things. So, the two of them had foregone food and sleep in their ceaseless quest to learn how to use these devices for experiments. It was a slow process, but they had finally made some progress. Of course, they had made mistakes as well. The past two months had been very busy for Lizzie, of course, but Nfeya was no exception either. The fruits of their labor stood on the table, that bottle of purple potion, which Lizzie examined endlessly and filled Nfeya with excited joy. I'll bring back some food, then, Nfeya spoke as he closed the door behind him. Then, he turned to Kaijali. Let's go. Although everyone was supposed to eat together, Enri's house was nowhere near big enough to accommodate them all. 
As such, they usually ate outside when the weather was good. Because they were outdoors, a certain amount of rowdiness was expected and tolerated. Had they been inside, it might have been unbearable, but even under the present circumstances, the situation had quickly turned aggravating. That's why I'm saying, Henry Ann San is going to be my wife. Hey, punk, are you forgetting the agreement we all made not to touch Ann San? That's right, if you try and pull a fast one on us then I'll make my move too. You what mate? I was first. Several goblins kicked over their chairs as they suddenly stood up, and some even jumped onto the table. Henry swallowed her anger and spoke kindly to them. Everyone, please settle down. However, the anger in the goblin's eyes had not faded in the slightest. Just give it up, lads. The victor has already been decided. Behold, this hunk of marvellous, radiant meat. One of the goblins, Quinell, raised up his spoon to prove his point, displaying a piece of meat that onlookers might well have mistaken for a pea. It was nothing more than a tiny bit extra that Henry had missed while portioning out the food to everyone. I finished my meat, yet there was more at the bottom of the soup. Do you have anything like that? I didn't think so. This is nothing less than the proof of love. You must be kidding me. That's nothing more than a piece of meat and San mistook for a chunk of vegetable. Maybe that's just wishful thinking on your part? Maybe the meat you ate was just potatoes or something, and the actual meat you got was that miniature thing. You'd better watch out, it's proof that Anne San doesn't like you. Plus, my god clearly told me, you must make Henry happy. Isn't the god you believe in an evil one, Kona? Half the goblins were standing, and the other half were seated and squabbling, fanning the flames of conflict. Even Nemo had somehow joined the agitators. Only a few people were not participating in this battle royale. Those people had their heads lowered to the table, and the most prominent one of them was Nferia. Powdered ruby. Arcane feathers. Ashwood pestle. More. Mortar. Tar. Tatars. Nferia was muttering to himself as he spooned the food into his mouth, but the food in the spoon did not even reach his mouth before it went back to the bowl. His eyes were hidden by his long hair, but in all likelihood he was walking on the thin line between dreams and reality. Infi, are you all right? The goblins were still arguing, and although it probably was not safe to leave them alone for too long lest the conflict spiral out of control, Feria was really out of it, and she could not ignore him. He was most likely suffering from sleep deprivation, judging by the way he had begun wobbling the moment he sat down, as though he was about to fall over to his side at any moment. When he actually started on breakfast, he looked like one of the undead, completely bereft of life or intelligence. Ah. Uh, don't. Worry. About. Me. Henry, who? Hey, Enfi, get it together. Besides, weren't you the one who said Nema was my waifu and all that earlier? That was then, this is now. I only just realized it recently. I used to think since Nemu san was ten and was about the same height as us, that she was of a marriageable age. But humans. They only consider them adults at fifteen. Eh? Is that true? An san isn't a species like hob human? The goblins leapt from topic to topic with incomparable speed. Enri wanted to ask them what a hob human was, but before she could open her mouth, the goblins had already gotten tired of the discussion and started a whole new argument for everyone to participate in. Ah. You stole my bread. My wolf's still hungry, don't be such a tightwad. Everyone. Henry was shouting at this point, but her voice still could not carry over the racket the goblins were generating. Spoons and plates were flying, while shouts and angry roars rose and fell like waves in a storm-tossed bay. Of course, Everything being thrown was empty, because none of the goblins would even dream of wasting the food Henry made for them. Still, it was utterly inexcusable. Stealing herself, Henry furrowed her brows and took a deep breath. Don't wolves eat meat? Just because you're higher level than me, don't go thinking I can't whoop you fist to fist. Fist to fist, you say? Since you're so hungry, how about a knuckle sandwich? And just as Henry stood up, 
everyone immediately returned to their seats and calmly resumed their meal as though nothing was wrong. That's enough, all of you. Quiet down. Henry's furious bellow echoed across the silent air above the breakfast table, ah. Surprised, Henry looked all around, but the only thing she could see were the goblins looking at her with expressions on their faces which said, we were all quietly having breakfast, is that a problem, or being suddenly shouted at for no reason at is really vexing. After standing silently for a while, she plopped back into her seat, red-faced. Ha 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 ha. The first to break the silence was Nemu. Then, unable to contain herself, Enri followed suit, clutching her stomach as she laughed and then the goblins joined in as well. That flawless coordination and timing could not have taken place without careful discussion and preparation. It was quite amazing how seriously they had prepared for a prank like this. Ah, that was just weird. Were you all planning to make fun of me from the start? Even though she was tearing up because she was laughing too hard, Henry made a show of being angry as she asked them. Of course, and San. We wouldn't argue about things like this for real, that's right, and San. Yup, yup. The goblins bragged without the slightest hint of shame, deflecting Henry's questions with jovial expressions on their faces. In response, Henry targeted Kaijali, turning a fierce stare on him. Under her stern gaze, Kaijali wilted, averting his eyes as he responded in a small voice that abdicated all responsibility. You see, how do I say this? We thought you looked a little down, Ansan. Several nearby goblins shrank away, their heads lowered as they looked around uncomfortably without saying a word. Everyone. That's because. We're all your bodyguards, Ansan. That's right. Yep. Bodyguards. We put a lot of thought into our bodyguard entrance pose too. That's right, that's right. Now, and San and Nemu San, stand here, in the middle, like this. Eh? Me too? Of course you do, now, the two of you, raise both your arms like this, that's right, in a totally cool and awesome way. Yes, that's it. Even if she gave them the benefit of the doubt, this pose made them look like frogs stretching their arms out to the sky. Look, I understand your good intentions, and to begin with, you don't need to be my bodyguards. Right, Enfi? Enri turned her head to her childhood friend sitting beside her for aid, but found that there was nobody there. She had a bad feeling about this, but still shifted her line of sight down just a little bit. And found that Enfi's head was resting face down in his bowl of soup. Enfi. Enri immediately scooped up the toppled Enfi, crying out as her face turned pale. Kona quickly rushed over, and peeled Enfi's eyes open with his fingers. He's just asleep. If you leave him like this until noon, he should be all right. Enfi. What am I going to do with you? Enri was thinking that she should return Enfi to his own bed. So she hefted him onto her back, and began heading out, leaving behind such conversational gems as shouldn't their positions be reversed normally? Nemu san, you can't say these things. Arni san, you. After the wheat was harvested, the tax collectors would come around the village. Enri was obviously worried about how she was going to explain the presence of the goblins in the village. Should she say they were summoned beasts, or that they were her henchmen, or maybe she should say, Enri had the feeling that they were always concerned about her. They did not simply concern themselves with protecting her life, they thought about her feelings too. What could she do for these goblins? What could she do for these rowdy and reliable new members of her family? Enri bundled up the weeds she had just finished cutting and used the still clean back of her hand to wipe away the sweat trickling down her neck. The large pile of shredded plant matter gave off the scent of freshly cut grass. Her body was tired from working long hours in the field and the way her sweat-slicked clothes clung to her body made Enri uncomfortable. To lift her mood, Enri stretched herself out. As she did, her eyes swept across the sprawling fields. The wheat they had planted had grown slowly but steadily, and as the harvest season approached, the wheat would slowly turn golden. Although a wheat field painted gold was a beautiful sight, 
the weeding worked before that was both essential and annoying. If it was not done, the gold color would be very sparsely distributed. Her labor now was entirely for the sake of the harvest to come. She straightened her body to loosen up her stiff muscles, and to let her tightly wound body relax. The wind felt refreshingly cool on her skin that had been overheated from long hours of field work. The wind also brought the sound of a commotion from the village to her ears. It sounded like something banging on something, and shouts for getting people to combine their strength as one. These were sounds that had never been heard before in the village. At this moment, the village was working to turn all manner of plans and ideas into reality. Of these plans, the ones with the highest priority were the walls surrounding the village, and the construction of the watchtowers. It went without saying that all these projects were intended to turn the village into a fortress. Kani village stood at the edge of the great forest of Tog, and the forest was the home of many wild beasts, in other words, it was dangerous territory. It would be impossible to live in peace there without the protection of sturdy walls. However, Kani village was laid out in neat rows of houses radiating from a central square in all directions. Without anything like a wall in place, anyone could easily enter the village. Until recently, the village had been peaceful and the monsters had not entered, even though it was right next to the forest. That was because the mighty creature known as the wise king of the forest had continually expanded its territory, and as such, no beast dared move around in the forest near the village. Thus, the village defenses were nigh impregnable. And then, all this had changed due to human intervention. The knights of the empire had attacked the village and killed her parents. As a result, nobody in the village held on to the hope that things would go back to the way they used to be. To that end, the leader of the goblin troop, Jugam, had proposed the fortification of the village as a countermeasure against such a scenario. Once he mentioned that the goblins would be unable to protect the village if it was attacked again due to their lack of numbers, the motion immediately received unanimous approval from all parties concerned. This was because even now, many of the villagers still could not forget the nightmare that had taken place. The first step was to dismantle the unoccupied houses and use them to build a wall. Of course, those materials were insufficient on their own, so they would have to enter the forest to cut down trees for lumber. Since entering the forest's depths might mean trespassing in the wise king of the forest's territory, they had to travel a long way, along the outskirts of the forest. Naturally, the goblins were the ones who provided security for the wood-cutting villagers. As a result of them taking on that task, the villagers' wariness of the goblins had almost completely disappeared. Part of that was because the knights who had attacked them were human, just like themselves. They had tried to kill the villagers despite being members of the same species. In contrast, the goblins might have been of a different species, but they worked hard for the village under Enry. The decision of which side to trust was no longer one which could be easily settled by deciding along racial lines. And the most important reason was that the goblins were stronger than anyone else. As warriors they could conduct patrols, and when people were hurt, the goblin cleric Kona could heal them. It was difficult to despise goblins like these. In this way, the goblins managed to establish themselves in the village in just a few short days and quickly became an indispensable part of village life. This could be seen from the house the goblins lived in, no consideration had been made of the fact that they were from another race, and a large house had been built close to Enri's own home in the middle of the village. Although the villagers and the goblins had worked together on the village defense plan, there simply were not enough hands to make the work go quickly. As such, in the beginning they had only built simple fences. As fate would have it, the wise king of the forest, who had kept the monsters at bay from the village, became a follower of an amazingly skilled black armored warrior and abandoned its territory. Although they had managed to complete the fences with great effort, the villagers could not take joy in their accomplishment, but instead sighed about their rotten luck. However, a sturdy wall now defended the village. All this was thanks to the stone golems which the beautiful maid who served the village's saviour, Eins Ulgaun, had brought with her. Golems were inexhaustible constructs, when given an order they would silently execute it, and their strength far outstripped that of a human being. 
Although their lack of dexterity meant that they could not perform certain tasks which required precision, their participation in the work had enabled it to proceed with an unbelievable speed. With the effort of the unsleeping and untiring stone golems, the construction of the wall practically flew along. They could accomplish the tasks which the villagers and goblins could not, such as chopping down trees and transporting them in large quantities, digging pits, or laying the foundations for the walls. What should have taken years to accomplish in theory had instead been finished in a matter of days, and the constructed wall was even bigger and sturdier than expected. They had not just aided in building the walls either, even the construction of the watchtowers had been sped up. Their current task was to complete the watchtowers on the eastern and western flanks of the village. Ansan, I'm done here. Enri's thoughts were interrupted by the goblin assisting her in the weeding, a goblin called Papo. Ah, thank you. No, no, it's nothing you should thank me for, Ansan. Although Papo waved his dirt and grass stained hands to ward off Enri's thanks, Enri still felt that she owed the goblins a debt that could never be repaid. After losing her parents, Enri was in a dire situation, where tending her family's plot by herself would be impossible. She wanted to ask the other villagers for help, but given the overall lack of manpower in the village, it was already hard enough for every household to take care of their own crops. With the help of the goblins, the problem was easily resolved. In addition, she was hardly the only one the goblins had helped. Turning to the direction from which her name was called, Enri saw a plump woman standing by a field. Beside her was a goblin. Thank you so much, Enri Chan. Because of Goblin San's help, the field work's almost done. Really? That's wonderful. It was their idea to help out with the village chores, so if you want to thank someone, you should thank them directly. Ah, I've already thanked Goblin San. He said that he was only your subordinate, so he hoped that I would thank An San as well. Hearing the word An San made Enri furrow her brows, which she quickly covered up with a bitter smile. The goblins themselves had suggested that they should help the households who had lost farmhands in the attack, and the woman before her was one of those people. There was no way the villagers would shun the contributions of the goblins. Kani village thought so well of the goblins that it was quite common to hear people say that goblins were better neighbors than humans. Speaking of which, are the other goblin sands around? I wanted to treat everyone to a meal as thanks. The others should be patrolling the village or helping the people who just moved into the village. But I'll pass the message on to them, Orba San. Then I'll leave that to you, Enri Chan. When the time comes, I'll make sure everyone gets to enjoy a feast made with all my skill. In the meantime, I think I'll make lunch for this goblin San first. Really? Then, since I've been invited, it would be rude to refuse. An San, sorry I can't join you, but I'll be having lunch at Morgan San's place. Enri nodded, and the woman headed back to the village with the goblin in tow. It would be nice if the newly arrived people realized that you guys aren't bad sorts. Well, a lot of them didn't look happy to see us. After all, in their hearts we should be the enemy. Most pioneer villages other than ours would treat goblins as the enemy, right? That's why we sent so many people to help the villagers with their work. It's not easy. But, but we've cleared up a fair bit of their suspicions. I just saw how they can greet you normally. Well, quite a few of these people remember how their family members were attacked and killed. Or no, the memories they bear might be even heavier than that. Although Kani village had been devastated by the attack, about half of the villagers managed to survive. On the other hand, the other villages which had been attacked by knights had lost most of their people. When Kani village began taking in immigrants, many of the ones who came were survivors of those villages, the two of them fell silent. Enri stretched her back once more and looked to the sky. Although the lunch bell had not rung yet, it seemed like it was about time. They had worked enough of the field to take a break as well. Then, shall we have lunch? Despite his smashed-looking face, Papo managed what was instantly recognizable as a smile. That would be great, your meals are always delicious, Ansan. Oh, they're not that great, Enri replied, slightly embarrassed. No, no, 
I'm serious. Helping you in the fields is one of the most hotly contested positions among ourselves. That's because we get to eat your delicious lunches, and san. Aha ha, then should I make lunch for everyone as well? Like how we handle breakfast? There were quite a few reasons why it would be hard to do so. For instance, there was a difference between lunch for three and lunch for twenty. Just slicing the vegetables would be a chore in itself. In addition, she had to make sure everyone had sufficient portions, which would be a tiring task. That said, in comparison to the amount of hard work the goblins had put in and the praise they had received in turn, it was nothing at all. Oh, no, we couldn't impose on you like that. Plus, enjoying your handmade lunch is something like a bonus for the one who wins the right to help you, and Sam. Henry could only return a troubled smile to the diminutive demi-human's beaming face. Although she knew the goblins decided who would take the job via rock scissors paper, Henry did not know if she was cooking something that actually deserved all that praise. Then, shall we go back and eat? Sounds great. Papo's words cut off halfway as he looked to the distance with his keen eyes. With a deep breath, the formerly relaxed and cheerful little demi-human became a veteran warrior in an instant. Henry followed Papo's eyesight into the distance. They saw a goblin riding a black wolf. They seemed to glide across the plain as they approached the village at high speed, its Kume San. Among the goblin troop that Henry had summoned, there were twelve level eight goblins, two level ten goblin archers, one level ten goblin mage, one level ten goblin cleric, two level ten goblin riders and one level twelve goblin leader, for a total of nineteen goblins. Kaijali from this morning and Papo who had helped with the chores were level eight, while Kume, who was mounted on a black wolf, wearing leather armor and carrying a lance, was a level ten goblin rider. The goblin rider's job was to patrol the plains and act as scouts. The riders periodically returning to the village to deliver reports was a common sight. Looks like it. However, Papo's tone was very somber. It made her think that something bad had happened. What's wrong? He's back a little early. He should have been prowling the forest today. Did something happen? After hearing Papo's explanation, a surge of unease rose in Henry's heart, and she feared that some bloody disaster awaited them. While the two of them waited in silence, the large wolf which rode on arrived in front of Henry. From its rapid breathing, she could guess how much of a hurry he had been to get back here. What's the matter? Hearing Papo's question, Kume bowed to Enri from on top of his wolf while replying, Something's happened in the forest. What? I'm not too sure, but I think it's like before. A whole bunch of unknown guys are moving towards the north. Are they knights? Enri unwittingly interrupted the two of them. Even though she was powerless to change anything, she still could not ignore the conversation. She still could not forget her fear when the village had been attacked. The whole lot of unknown guys heading north they talked about referred to the tracks they had found of thousands of people marching to the north. Although the prints were similar in size to those of humans, they were made by bare feet, so in the end they had concluded that those people were not humans. I don't have any hard proof, but I think it's different from that time. I sense something's happening deep inside the forest. Is that so? Hearing that, Henry couldn't help but sigh in relief. Then, I'd better go report to Leader. All right. Good job. Thank you for your hard work. After waving to the two of them, Kume spurred his wolf on and departed. Henry and Papo watched him enter the slowly opening village doors. Then, shall we go back, too? Yes, let's. After washing their hands beside the well, Henry and Papo had just reached home when they heard a young girl's voice. Welcome back, Oni Chan. The voice was accompanied by the sound of rock grinding against rock. Following the sound to its source, Henry saw Nemu turning a millstone behind the house. A pungent smell came from the millstone. Although it was similar to the smell that had clung to Henry's hands just before, it was several times more intense, enough that one could smell it from some distance away. Nemu was used to the smell, which was all well and good but Enri's eyes almost teared up as the odor assaulted her. Papo, standing behind her, 
seemed unaffected in comparison. It remained to be seen whether that was because the smell only had an effect on certain species, or because it would be terribly rude to make a face like that to his mistress' little sister. I'm home. How's things? Have you ground them all up yet? Mm, I did. Have a look. Enri looked along Nemu's line of sight, and saw that the herbs that she had piled up before leaving the house had been reduced to a small handful. Aren't I great? There's not much more left. Before she had left the house, Enri had asked Nemu to help her grind the herbs into a paste. That was because some herbs had to be dried to be preserved, but others needed to be shredded to be preserved. You were, you worked really hard, Nemu. Enri opened her arms to praise Nemu, and a look of pride blossomed on Nemu's face, perhaps she had been influenced by Nferia, or perhaps she wanted to help her sister out in some way, but Nemu had diligently and quickly accomplished her tasks. Herbs made up a major portion of Kani village's income. It could be said to be the one specialty export that did not require much manpower for a frontier village to produce. Given that it was a crucial method for them to obtain valuable currency, all of Kani village's residents knew at least a little about herbs and where they grew. Enri silently considered the situation. The herbs from Kani village were incredibly profitable. However, they could only be gathered within an extremely short window of time before the flowers bloomed, and could only be treated as a temporary income at best. However, all the places they knew about had been fully harvested, so they would need to delve into the forest to find clumps of herbs which had not yet been touched. Of course, those woods were where monsters lurked, and they were hardly a place where people like Enri could just stroll into for a picnic. However, now they had the goblins and the experienced herbalist and Nferia. If only she could get their help, they should be able to make a great deal of money. After some hesitation, Enri spoke of her plan to Papo. I want to go to a new place to pick herbs, could you come with me? Logically speaking, there was no need for Enri to go herself. All she needed to do was to ask the goblins, who could take care of themselves, to go into the dangerous great forest on her behalf. However, the goblins she had summoned had a strange weakness. That was to say, they had no aptitude at all for herb picking, butchering animals, and that sort of work. Just like how they handled cooking, even if one handed goblins a sample of a herb, they would not be able to match it up with identical herb in front of them. The surprising thing was, it was as though they were born unable to do that sort of thing, or even learn it, as if someone had removed the capacity to do so from them. Therefore, if they were assigned to pick herbs, the goblins needed to have a non-goblin with them, it should be all right, but it might be a little difficult for you to come with us, Ansan. Hmm? Why is that? Well, like Kume said, there's some kind of change in the depths of the forest. If that's the case, the insides of the forest will be a mess now. Seeing the surprised expression on Enri's face, Papo patiently explained himself. Even the cautious ones are going to want to expand their territory. If that's the case, then for a while, their territory is going to overlap with the others, and that's going to cause all sorts of confusion. Simply put, the chances of meeting a monster's going to increase, and so will the danger. And if you're unlucky, you might even run into something outside the forest. We know you're brave and cool, but there's no need to walk into danger, Ansan. Is that so? I'm not too sure about the brave and cool part, but that's probably just the goblins being polite, Enri thought. There was also that big movement earlier. What happened there? I don't know. Originally, we should have sent someone familiar with the great forest's conditions to investigate, but if we go, the village's defences will be weakened. Ah, got it. Why not hire adventurers to check it out? That could be difficult, Enri said, knitting her eyebrows. According to Enfi, the cost of hiring an adventuring party is very high. Although the Lords of E. Rantel will subsidise some of those costs, it'll be very hard for a village like us to pay for adventurers out of our own pocket. I see. Collecting lots of herbs and selling them afterward should help with one part of that problem. Otherwise, all we can do is sell off the items we got from Gown Summer. She had received two horns from Ein's Ul Gown. 
although one of them had disappeared after she used it, the other was safely hidden in Enri's home. Forget about that, and San. We'd rather you just blow the horn instead. Of course, there's no way I'd sell it. Enri did not want to become the sort of despicable person who would sell off a gift given out of goodwill. There also existed the possibility that it might not even be possible to sell it off, so she decided not to do so. Even now they were still benefiting from the generosity of the maid who had brought the golems to the village. She would never commit such an ungrateful deed. But that's going to be problematic. The herbs can only be gathered in this season, so although it's a bit dangerous, I still have to. Enri smiled to Nemu, who had a worried expression on her face. She did not want to sadden the last surviving member of her family, nor did she want to pass up this chance to make lots of money. Although, when she considered her priorities, that was clearly a mistake. Rather, she should bet her life for the good of the entire village and repay the goblins who considered her their mistress. I need to earn more money and see what kind of gear I can buy for the goblins. Full plate armor looks like it could protect very well. Speaking of full body armor, there's that gentleman in the black colored armor. What was his name again? Although she did not know how much armor and weapons cost, she was fairly certain that it was not a small sum. At this moment, Papo held out his hand in front of Enri, indicating that she should wait a bit. Um. Although this is just my personal opinion, how about discussing the matter with Lida? You don't need to make the decision so early, and San. I don't want to be scolded by the boss because I opened my mouth without thinking. Plus, I think Arnie San would like to get his hands on all sorts of herbs too. Just as Enri's troubles were filling her head, an adorable gurgling sound came from beside her. Turning to look, she saw Nemu looking at her with a frown on her face. Oni-chan, I'm hungry. Can we eat yet? Mm, sorry. Then, wash your hands after we pack up. I'll go get things ready. K. Nemu's response was full of energy. After taking apart the millstone, she scraped the accumulated green paste into a small urn. Enri returned to the house, wondering what she should make for lunch. Enri stood before the great forest of Tob. Of course, she was not alone. Beside her were the loyal members of the goblin troop. The goblins were equipped with chain shirts, round shields and sturdy machetes, which hung from their belts. They wore brown-colored tunics under their armor and furred leather boots on their feet. On their belts were bags for small items. One could not say they were under-geared. The fully armed goblins made their final checks of their personal equipment. They topped up their waterskins and made sure their machetes were sharpened. Everyone was well-geared, but they carried little baggage. That was because the plan was to swiftly complete their work, and not to mount a long expedition in the forest. Not everyone in the troop was assigned to Enri's protection. Their objective was to thoroughly scout the surrounding area and further verify the information the goblin riders had collected. That is to say, they were to carefully observe the current situation within the great forest. In order to protect the village, the goblins had decided to scout its surroundings and the hinterlands. Only three goblins would accompany Enri. There was also one more person, Furya. He had made his preparations too, dressed in suitable clothing for collecting herbs in a forest. With Furya around, the herb harvesting trip would definitely be a success. Perhaps he had sensed Enri looking at him, and turned around, asking what's the matter? Although Enri had waved her hands as though to say nothing, nothing, one of the surrounding goblins took notice and drew closer to Enri's side. He was a goblin whose body was so muscular and athletic that it would be hard for bystanders to think that he was a goblin. His torso was protected by a crude but practical breastplate, and the great sword he used was sheathed on his back. This was Jugum, the leader of the goblins, named by Enri after a goblin hero called Jugum Jujum. As an aside, there were other named knights who did battle alongside the goblin hero, and she had used their names for the other goblins. There shouldn't be anything wrong. What's the matter? No, really, it's fine. I was just looking at him. That's great, after all, once you're in the forest, you can lose your life over even a tiny slip. If anything happens, 
Let me know. That's right, and San. Just like we agreed before, we're all scouting the forest, so if anything happens and we can't get there in time, it'll be okay, right? Jugum's brutish face contorted with what looked like an expression of worry, and he glanced at Enri's face. Seeing that, Enri smiled and replied to him. It'll be fine. We won't go too deep, and they'll protect me. That's good to hear. Jugum followed Enri's line of sight to the three goblins ahead of them. Then he shouted. Oi! You punks! You'd better not let Ansan take so much as a single scratch, got it? Got it. The three goblins, Boku, Kaijali, and Anrai, responded with a hearty shout, and Ani San, you'll be taking care of Ansan too, right? Enri suddenly noticed that Kaijali, for no apparent reason, was flexing his muscles in a front double biceps pose. You mean I should take over from here? Korf. Of course. You can count on me to protect Enri. For a moment, Enri imagined Nferya showing his shiny teeth as he radiated self-confidence through his smile. His attitude now was very different from his usual one, and to be honest, it felt kind of gross. However, that was probably just his excitement about trekking into the forest. Just like a little boy, Enri smiled, feeling like she was his big sister. Thank you, Infi. I'll be in your care. Strange, is he doing a side chest pose now? What's with that? Ah, that again. Oh, about that, I prepared a bunch of alchemical items that I made myself, so leave it to me. After seeing Furya's second sparkly smile, the smile fell off Enri's face. Ah. Hmm. You go do that. Ah, well, it's been settled. Although, honestly speaking, even if we weren't doing this dangerous job, this. Jugum turned to look at Enri, a sour look on his face. Enri was starting to get a little annoyed after hearing this question again after answering it so many times in the village, but he was only asking out of concern for her, so she could not just ignore it. That might be true, but the fact remains that without the herbs, we can't bring in any money. How about animal skins? We can get those. That's not a bad idea, but herbs are the most valuable. Animal pelts and medicinal herbs were in completely different price categories. The difference was comparable to that between the heavens and the earth. Granted, some especially rare animals had skins that were worth a fortune, but those were few and far between. If Arnie San could share his. We're not touching the bear's money. We need to help together and split the benefits. We can't just take advantage of them. Helping each other in difficult situations was a keystone of village life, therefore, a family could not survive if they were ostracized from others, however that was not an excuse to take advantage of others, because that would imply that a person could not support themselves, and the village could not take care of people to that extent. Self-sufficiency was a strict requirement. The two of them started looking away from Furya, who was quietly saying, Kaijali-san, please read the mood and stop making those weird poses. If that's the case, then it's definitely. And like that too. Well, if you lived with Arnie-san, you could certainly pull the wealth. But. Looks like nothing's stopping that. Jugum's words gradually lost their force. He knew that he could not stop Enri from entering the great forest. Although Enri did not want to make things difficult for Jugum and the others who cared for her, she would not be swayed from her course. After all, she had decided to venture into the forest despite knowing its dangers because she had heard Jugum say, We can't repair our gear. The kitchen knife was one thing, but the goblins required the services of a professional blacksmith to maintain their arms and armor, which meant that a subtle danger threatened all the goblins. If their equipment deteriorated, it would mean their lives would be in danger. The maintenance of their battle gear was essential. What could she do for them, who had pledged their lives to protect hers? How could she hide in safety and enjoy the fruits of their labor? Just as they had given their all for her, she too had to do everything she could for them. That was Enri's decision. The goblins were not just Enri's bodyguards, they were also the village's protectors. If she decided to press that point, 
she could probably squeeze the money needed to equip the goblins from the villagers. However, Henry decided to give up on that idea. No matter what, Henry was simply trying to repay the goblins' service through her own efforts. This expedition was the proof of that. Normally, the safest thing to do would be to confirm the area was free of danger before you went in. Interrupting from behind was the goblin mage, Dino. Dino was an arcane magic caster who wore a humanoid skull for a helmet. She carried a gnarled staff that looked shabby, but was even taller than herself. She was adorned in strange tribal ornaments all over her body, and her bust swelled up slightly. Her face seemed softer than those of the male goblins. Henry could recognize this because she was their mistress, but normal people probably would not be able to pick up on those details. However, you can't confirm it's safe, can you? Hmm, that's right. Sadly, we can't do that. The most we can do is confirm that the forest seems peaceful, but even that needs time. And if we want to find out when tensions are going to run high again, that'll take even more time. If they did that, they would miss the opportunity to gather the desired herbs. After hearing Dino's words, a firm conviction gathered in her eyes and she made her reply. It'll be fine, we won't go too deep. After hearing her repeat that answer several times, Jugum finally realized that he could not change Enri's mind. Instead, he looked to the three goblins who would travel with her. What he told them was the same as what he had said to them before. We won't be able to protect Anne San, so you guys are going to have to do it for us. You'd better guard her with your lives. And Arnie San too. Got it. It would be safest if we'd all stuck together as usual. Splitting up our fighting strength is just asking for trouble, Dino muttered under her breath. If we did that, then we'd be forced into reacting to the enemy, right? That's right. If any of the monsters coming to the village decide to settle down in the forest, getting rid of them for good would be extremely troublesome. Once they build a nest, they'll never leave. Even if we chased them away, they'd come right back after a while. Since the balance of power in the forest had changed, reconnoitering the great forest, especially the area surrounding the village, was critical. This was the first pass, the first pass implied that the danger was the greatest. As such, they could only arrange for three people to be Enri's escorts. Good. Well then, let's move. We'll finish up quick and meet up with Anne San. In response to Jugum's call, the goblin troop thundered their ascent. This was the interior of the Great Forest. Although they had only travelled about 150 metres in, the temperature had fallen by several degrees. This was simply because no sunlight shone in here. That said, the interior was not completely pitch dark, and Enri could still see what was happening around her. Enri and the other four members of her party advanced into the forest, surrounded by cool air. At the moment, the forest was dominated by silence. Apart from the gentle sounds of the tree branches swaying and the occasional cries of birds or beasts, there was nothing else. The footsteps of Enri and her companions echoed loudly. The other team led by Jugum had already gone deeper in, and they could no longer be heard. Enri and company formed a roughly triangular formation as they advanced into the forest. In the center of the formation were Enri and Thuria. It was very difficult to maintain a wide formation in the forest. Normally, they would have gone single file, but in order to protect the two of them the goblins had insisted on doing things that way. They lost speed as a result, but that could not be helped. As they moved deeper inwards, Thuria began looking up and towards the north. He sought the treasure sleeping in the dense forest, medicinal herbs. Enri was not a novice to herb gathering. A girl her age would know all about herbs that could be taken orally or smeared on an affected area, or the ordinary herbs used as ingredients for potions. However, in this field she was completely outmatched by Nferia. Not only was he thoroughly familiar with medicinal herbs, he even knew which ones were useful as bases for alchemical compounds. Found any rare herbs? Of all the questions Enri had asked, this seemed like the one he had been waiting for. The surrounding goblins began posing in unison. A double bicep flex again. Is that the latest trend or what? 
The tilt-headed Henry did not notice the faint expression of annoyance on Faye's face. Why didn't I tell them to stop posing? It sucks to have no courage. Say, is that a brown moss over there? As it turned out, there was brown moss growing when Faye was pointing. That's Bibeamokugok. Mix some with a healing potion and it'll slightly improve its effects. Oh, really? I thought it was just a simple patch of moss and missed it. Without Infi, I probably would have ignored it completely. That's Infi for you. You were, you're pretty amazing now, Arnie san Is it worth a lot? It's worth quite a bit of money. Ah, uh, wait. Don't pick it. What Henry and I are aiming for is worth even more. If we can't find it, then we'll pick this on the way back. I see. Yeah, we got it. Speaking of which, to Arnie san this forest must be like a treasure trove, since it's so easy to make wealth. Ah, I feel much more at ease with you around, Arnie san This sort of thing. The surrounding goblins' poses changed. Yes, hmm, well, it might actually be like that. One thing's for sure, people traveling with me won't have a hard time. I'm pretty confident of that. Hmm. I'm sure you can do it, Enfi. An awkward mood filled the quiet forest. Then, Ansan, is that all? Hmm. Kaijali-san, what do you mean? Hmm. No, I actually, nothing. Ah. Uh, come to think of it, there's a question I forgot to ask. What sort of herbs are you looking for? We didn't tell you. It's an herb called Inkaishi. Afterwards we'll let Nemu grind it up. I see, I see. Got it. Although, even if you describe it to us, we won't be able to tell the difference. Then, let's move on. Step by step, they ventured further into the forest. As they went on, their noses started itching from the thick scent of the forest's fragrance. There was no sign of human activity here at all. Immersed in this place, Vaya felt like this was a world where humans were weak and tiny. Then, he opened his mouth to speak. Let's start looking around here. We're looking for places with lots of shade and humidity. Are there any water sources nearby? That herb grows near them. There's no sign of monster activity around here, what a stroke of luck. Got it, Arnie san With his vast experience as a herbalist, it was unlikely for Nferia to make a mistake. The goblins and Enri replied in approval. The group put their things down, which lightened their load. Ah. And San, could you go give Arnie San a hand? Ah, yes, that's right. Infi must have his hands full by himself. Enri walked over to where Nferia had put down his luggage and assisted him in his labors. Thanks, Enri. No problem, Infi. Although, now that I think of it, all this specialist equipment is amazing. You need so many things. Out of the corner of her eyes, Enri could see the goblins nodding as though to say very good, very good. Although she was surprised by why they were so happy, she eventually decided that her first priority was getting the job done. Then, let's start the search. With a subdued O. Oh. To keep the noise down, they began. The goblins watched the perimeter, while Enri and Nferia began searching. Although Enri had been prepared for the work to be difficult, they were fortunate and soon found dense growths on the herbs in the cracks of tree trunks. It's over there. We found where they grew right away. As I thought, it's best when I'm with Infi. No, it's nothing like that. We're lucky we found it in a deserted area. If there were monster tracks, it would be pretty nasty. To the two humans, the large quantity of herbs, while not exactly a treasure in its own right, was akin to a mountain of coins. Enri desperately fought the desire burning in her heart. This place was dangerous, it was better that she put her greed aside and worked to steadily complete the job. However, Enri knelt down, and began to pluck, minding the roots of the herbs. Inkaishi's medicinal value resided in its roots. But they could not just pull the roots out like that. Grasses like these were incredibly hardy, and they would grow again as long as the roots remained. It seemed a shame, but depleting this patch of herbs, which had been quite a challenge to find in the first place, 
By over-harvesting it would be like killing the goose which laid the golden egg. A strong odor seared her nose as she did the picking, but she was used to that sort of thing, so the smell did not impede her work. Compared to Nferia's house, this smell was like heaven. She plucked the herb stalk by stalk, holding it carefully to avoid crushing it by accident, and then carefully placed it into the bag under her armpits. If the goblins came to help, they could probably have finished faster, but they were too busy watching their surroundings. Henry was not stupid enough to take them off their sentry duty to help her pick herbs. In comparison, Furrier's harvesting methods were like poetry in motion, he swiftly pulled them out of the ground without pause, in a way that did not damage their potency as medicine. Only a professional like himself was capable of such a feat. Henry silently watched Nferia, who was staring at the herbs with a diligent expression on his face. The face that had become so familiar looked like someone else's before her. He's a man now. What's wrong? Nferia suddenly looked up. He must have sensed that Henry had stopped work. Henry had done nothing wrong, but she still looked down in embarrassment. Ah, well, I just thought you were amazing, Infi. Really? I didn't think it was that fantastic. I'm only a dabbler when it comes to herbalism. This level is about par for the course. Is that so? I guess. The conversation ended, and their bags slowly filled with herbs. After they were just over half full, the goblins, the goblin suddenly hunkered down and crouched next to the two of them, as though looking for somewhere to hide. Kaijali gestured at Enri to keep quiet. This was an emergency. Enri, who understood, pricked up her ears. From far off in the distance, she could hear the sound of plants being trampled. This is... Something's coming. It's coming for us. Or rather, it's advancing and most likely it's going to end up here, so we need to get away from here for a bit. Then, we won't need the noisemaker decoys. That's right, Arnie Sam. It's better if we don't have to use those, it feels like things will go bad if we do. Come, let's move. The five of them began moving away from the direction of the sound, hiding in the shadow of a nearby tree. They did not go further because they did not want to risk making noise on the nearby vegetation. If the other party was just advancing forward, there was no need to risk being discovered. Since the tree was not very big, it could not hide all of them. The most they could do was crouch at its roots and hope they weren't too obvious. In this way, the five of them quieted their breathing and prayed that the source of the sound would turn in another direction. But unfortunately, this did not happen, and the figure making the noise finally came into Enri's field of view. A. Eh? A tiny gasp of surprise escaped from Enri's mouth. It was a ragged-looking little goblin. His body was covered in tiny wounds which bled profusely. His breathing was rapid and uneven, and the smell of his blood and sweat spread throughout the area. Even though goblins were already smaller than humans, this goblin was small even for another goblin. Enri and the goblins concurred that this goblin was a child. The goblin child looked fearfully to his rear, in the direction where he had come from. There was no need to listen up for the sound of trampling plant life that followed from behind him. From the looks of things, they were hunter and prey. He frantically moved his spasming feet, taking cover in a patch of shade different from Enri's own. That. Please be quiet. Goku had not even looked at Enri as he interrupted her. Those unrelenting eyes were fixed on the direction from which the kid had come. Just over ten seconds later, the pursuer revealed itself. It was a huge magical beast that resembled a black wolf. The reason why they could instantly tell it was no ordinary wolf was because of the chain wrapped around its body. The serpentine chain did not hinder its movements at all, as though it were merely an illusion. Two horns sprang from its head. Nferia muttered the name of the beast to himself. Bargist. Although it could not possibly have heard him, the Bargist sniffed around like a dog, and then its face twisted. It was an evil grin that no mere beast could ever make. It slowly looked around its surroundings and its eyes settled on the tree where the goblin child had hidden. Just like the beast it resembled, the Bargist had a bloodhound-scenting ability. 
there was no way it could not sniff out the goblin child who had bled so much on the way here, from the look of things, the reason why the goblin had managed to get here was not because he had been able to evade the Bargast. Rather, it was because the Bargast was a sadistic creature, or maybe it was because it was hunting for sport. Suddenly, the Bargast stopped moving, surprise knotting its face, and it stared at the place where they had gathered the herbs. Ah! Henry pulled her face back. The others quickly followed suit. Behind the tree trunk, Henry opened her hands. Her skin was green and speckled with stray bits of plant matter. Beside her, Verya did the same thing. The sap and juices from the herbs we picked. This was the same sort of thing that Nemu was soaked in when she ground up the herbs. Although it did not affect those with numbed noses, like themselves, the powerful stench still hung in the air. She found the sudden pounding of her heart noisy. It started moving, it's moving away? Could it be it didn't smell us? Unrai had his ear to a tree, and a question mark appeared above his head. Maybe it can't pinpoint where the scent's coming from? What do you mean, Arnie san Don't monsters have very sensitive noses? That's the reason why, Mfeya quietly explained. The key point was that because it had an extremely sensitive sense of smell, the stench floating in this area was particularly effective against it. The Bargast had confused the scent of Enri's hands and bag with that of the already harvested areas. Even better, the smell had covered up their original scent. It was also possible that the Bargast had torn up the herbs to smoke the goblin child out. Although the powerful stench was everywhere, if they fled in haste, the displaced air from where they were fleeing might catch the Bargast's attention. Then, let's use the kid as a sacrifice and be done with it. We don't know how strong this Bargast is, and engaging it without prior knowledge would be too risky. That cold-blooded reply made Enri look at Goku's face, however, these words were logical ones. The goblins put Enri's personal safety as their top priority. With that in mind, avoiding combat with that magical beast was only to be expected. They would even sacrifice one of their own kind for that without a second thought. He was probably correct, given the conviction with which he had spoken those words. However, Henry disliked it. Even if they were of different species, not helping someone you could help would disgrace herself as a human being. Who knew? If she had not been a silly village girl who had never known a goblin attack and lacked a sense of danger, she might not have thought that way. Enri looked around to the others. The goblins knew Enri's wish. They simply did not want to speak it. After that, Enri looked to Nferia. Infi. Ha. I'll help. Who knows, the goblin child might become a valuable source of information. If we don't find out why he fled here, it might end up causing danger to the village. The goblins knitted their brows, is there a chance you might lose? Certainly. But if that's a Bargast, we're in luck. Bargast leaders are pretty strong. But from the look of that guy's chains and the size of his horns, I don't think he's of that type. If it's just a Bargast, we're sure to win. Wait a minute. Anne San's here too. We should avoid danger. Henry swallowed. She knew what she was saying was only to satisfy her ego, and her foolish words would endanger not just herself but the others around her. But even so, Enri still opened her mouth to speak. If we abandoned someone we could have helped, it would be as bad as tormenting him ourselves. I don't want to be like those people who harm the weak. Please. Kaijali, who had been watching Enri's earnest expression, sighed in defeat. At the same time, the monster's strange bark rang out. They could clearly hear the sound of mocking laughter within it. In response came the goblin child's pitiful wail. There was no more time for confusion or debate. It can't be helped. Get him, lads. The goblins took the lead in jumping out, followed by Nferia. Enri felt a terrible, wrenching pain in her heart as she watched the warriors who went into battle to fulfill her wishes. All she could do was watch them from behind. Then, Henry thought, at the very least I should stay here and watch them seriously, without blinking even once. The four who had leapt out saw the Bargast pressing the goblin child down beneath it. 
The goblin child sported new wounds but was not dead yet, because the bargast had the bad habit of toying with its prey. The bargast's movement stopped, and it stared at the group of people who had jumped out and then at the goblin child. Perhaps it was afraid that its prey had led it into a trap. Hey hey, come on boy, Unrai said, pointing to himself with his thumb. Want to play? I'll play with you. Come on. The bargast growled, full of menace. In a natural, flowing motion, Kaijali drew the machete at his waist, the other goblins followed suit. No need to think so much. I'll teach an old dog like you new tricks. How about we start with play dead? Agya ah. In response to the goblin's taunts, the bargast squeezed the goblin child it was stepping on, who wailed in pain. Although it could not speak, its actions made its intentions clear. Make a move and I kill the brat. However. Very good. Go ahead and kill him. The three goblins ignored the bargast's taunt, and charged him with shouts of their own. This unexpected response brought confusion to the eyes of the bargast. The bargast could not have known that the goblins had not shown up with the intention of saving the goblin child. They were only here because of Enri's wish, and their attitude was as long as we tried to save him, it's good enough. Since they had shown themselves for a confrontation, their precious Enri might get hurt if they did not bring down the bargast. As a result, they had to make sure they killed the bargast. So if the goblin child was murdered, if that wasted their opponent's first action and let them seize the initiative, then the goblins would gladly let the kid die. Seeing itself reflected in the blades of three machetes, the bargast understood that it could not use its hostage against them and froze, paralyzed by its own indecision. It was confused as to whether or not it should finish off the boy it was pinning down. Taking his life would be easy. It would be gone in one bite. However, if it did that, there was no question that it would be hacked to pieces by its enemy's weapons. The threat to its life led the Bargus to its decision. Ignoring the goblin child, the Bargus leapt at the goblins to meet their attack. A Bargus was heavier than a goblin. The Bargus was hoping to pin its foes under itself and finish them off by ripping their throats out with its fangs. However, this was a poor choice. The targeted goblin easily twisted out of the way of the attempted attack, and at the same time the other two goblins on the left and right slashed at the bargast with their machetes. One blade was deflected by the bargast's chains, but the other ripped into its body, sending blood everywhere. At the same time, a small hurled vial shattered after hitting the tip of the bargast's nose. Ya ah! The vile miasma which now clogged its eyes and nose drew an agonized howl from the bargast and at that moment, three more jolts of pain ran through its body. It could sense that it was in trouble from the outflow of blood alone. The bargast wept, its vision shaky and blurred, and made its move. Its target was the one who had thrown the vial, a human. However, the bargast had only taken a few steps when its feet stuck to something below and could not move. Looking down, it saw that the ground was covered in a strangely colored slime. The bizarre liquid was not absorbed by the earth. The glue won't be able to resist a magical beast's strength for long. Take it down in one shot. In response to the human's voice, the goblins shouted their battle cries and charged. In addition, the human cast a powerful spell in its direction. sa a a The bargast used all its strength to wrench its feet from the ground. Although its movements were slowed because its feet were still coated with adhesive and dirt, it was still able to fight. Watching the goblins close in for the kill again, the bargast used its superior intellect, compared to a regular beast, and acknowledged the fact that these goblins were mighty foes. It acknowledged that these were different from regular goblins in one crucial way, they were enemies who could kill it. This bargast knew three methods of attack. It could gore, piercing its foe with its horns. It could bite. It could knock its foe down and rake it with its claws. Unlike stronger bargasts, it did not have any special abilities. But in truth, it had an ace in the hole. This tactic completely abandoned defense, and if the bargast failed, it would be doomed. But now was not the time to worry about holding back. It had to make full use of what could be the last few seconds of its life. 
the Bargast howled wildly, checking the advance of the enveloping goblins. Reinforce armor. The spell from behind, cast by the human, made the goblin's armor glow brightly. The Bargast panicked, predicting that it was some sort of enhancement spell, but the goblins in front of it simply grinned. Maybe it made them reckless, but with their armor reinforced, the goblins advanced as one. Perhaps it might be called a foolish move, but then one could also say it was a brave step forward to quickly end what could be a long battle. Indeed, it was, if the Bargast had not expected them to do this. If a Bargast could change its facial features as easily as a human, it would have smiled to itself. The chains on its body rattled like a snake. Then, the chains binding the Bargast suddenly came to life. The thick chains began swinging with tremendous force. The special ability, Chain Cyclone, would severely wound the goblins, if not kill them outright. The Bargast was giving this its all. This was a big move that could only be used once per day, and after the chains were used it would be unable to use them as armor for at least ten seconds. The risk was high. The unexpected attack threw off the goblins' dodge by a second. This was a fatal mistake. However, get down. A thunderous order cut through the air before the chains could. The Bargus that had bet everything on this attack stared at the other human who had shouted, and its eyes widened. The goblins who should have been too late to evade it had nimbly dropped to the ground, as though the voice had injected them with a fresh dose of vitality. The Bargus stared at the commander who stood behind the magic caster. And then, the Bargast's forelegs and one rear leg were severed from its body as it took machete blows. It howled in pain. It tried to recover its chains, bare its fangs, threaten them, but the goblins were having none of that. Arnie San, no need for the magic support, for safety's sake, just put up an alarm around this place. The Bargast, which knew it had already lost, was desperately trying to get away. Its normally limber body was now cumbersome and slow. That was only natural considering that three of its four legs were now stumps. Even so, the Bargast wanted to flee with all its might. But the goblins would not allow it. Sticky blood coated the grass all around and the stench of iron drowned out the odor of the plants. The Bargast lay dead, the viscera spilling out of its corpse still warm from its body heat. The goblins turned away from the Bargast, their blood-stained machetes in hand, and turned to look at the goblin kid. The kid had been hurt badly and had lost the strength to flee, but he still forced his body upright against a tree. Hey, who are you guys? Which tribe are you from? The goblins looked at each other, wondering how to respond to the questions of a kid who was half frightened and half suspicious. In each other's eyes, they wordlessly discussed the strategy for what kind of attitude would yield the most benefits and what kind of information they should reveal, but Henry felt that there were more pressing matters than that. We need to take care of his wounds first. What can we do, Enfi? The kid was hurt very badly and he had already lost a lot of blood. Left alone, he would definitely die. Although Enri had no idea how to help him, she was hoping that her childhood friend would know what to do. The most normal herbs can do is stop the bleeding, it won't help against blood loss. However, the fire began rummaging through his pouch. There's the newly created healing potion. I wanted to hand it to Gown Summer, but. Could you show me your wounds? The fire walked forward, withdrawing the potion vial from his robe. W. Wait, what's this dangerous looking liquid? Is it poison? Hostility flashed across the kid's frightened face as he saw the purple potion. From Henry's point of view, perhaps even Thurya's point of view, this was a natural reaction. The potion looked too much like poison for him to not be on his guard. However, the goblins were very upset by the child's words, and they immediately stalked over to him. Oi, punk. Anne San's the one who decided to save you, along with Arnie San. You'd better watch your words to the people who saved your life. That's for your own good too, got it? The kid turned to look at the blades brandished before him. Although he was only a child, he still knew that the goblins before him were very angry. He shrank before their eyes. 
Henry felt that it would be better if they did not have to intimidate the kid, but she knew the goblins had their own rules which they followed. It would not be a good idea for her to butt in with her human sensibilities. I'm very sorry. Ah, it's all right. Don't worry. As he answered, Freya poured the potion on the kid's body. The wounds were visibly closing up. You oh. What's this? The color's so gross but it's so amazing. The kid felt the stares of the surrounding goblins on him and trembled. Ah. No, I, ah, th thank why you very m much. Oh, looks like the punk has some manners after all, very good. This way, I can tell Gaon San that the experiment was completed without a hitch. Feuer looked around, seeking approval. Henry and the goblins, who got what he meant, nodded to him. The potion Feuer created was made from the materials provided by the great magic caster Eins Ul Gaon, who was the savior of Kani village. Not only was there no need to spend money on research fees, but he had even provided all the necessary ingredients. With that in mind, the meaning and value of the potion that he had created was plainly obvious. The fact that Feuer had decided to use it on his own was a major problem, but perhaps he could pass it off as a practical evaluation of the potion's effects. If he explains it to Gaon San after the fact, he'll probably allow it. Herbalists have their own rules too, I guess. You, you used me as a guinea pig. Unable to read between the lines, the kid gasped in shock, while Henry and Feuer smiled bitterly in response. A reaction like this was only natural from someone who did not know the full details of the situation, although the two of them had at least managed to smile at the reaction, there were others present who did not possess their forbearance. The goblins were clearly furious, they clicked their tongues and someone went, that little bastard. Henry held out her hands to try and calm them down. He did not know any better, so it was only to be expected that he would react that way. Besides, he was just a kid, so there was no need to think too much about it. Well, if you say so, and Sam. Anyway, we should get moving. Who knows what other monsters will be drawn by the scent of blood. And, although we won. And Sam. Please don't do this sort of thing again, okay? Our job is protecting you. Exactly. Still, hearing Henry shout like that really scared me. Well, it's because of that voice that we're fine, oi, brat, you'd better not run off. We have a lot of questions to ask you and if you don't want to go home in pieces you'd better answer up truthfully, Unrai San. And San, this is for the villagers' sake too. Get over here, kid. The kid got up, slowly and painstakingly. His wounds were healed, so they should not have hampered his mobility, but his stubborn resistance made his movement slow. Goku, whose machete was dyed red with blood, spat on the ground. Enri turned to Nfurya for help. However, he silently shook his head. As she turned to look at the goblins, she saw that there was steel in their eyes, and with it, silent approval of their colleagues' actions. And San, don't worry, I won't kill him. I just want to ask him some questions about what's going on. Besides, don't you think he'll die if we left him here? It seemed as though the question was aimed more at the goblin child than Henry herself. He seemed to get it, and the resistance in his eyes faded away. I got it. I won't run off. That's good. Then the sooner we move, the better. Can you be sure that there's only one of those bar guests, kid? I can't, apart from them, there's several ogres too. I don't know if any of them chased after me. And I'm not a kid, I'm a goo the fourth son of Ah, the chieftain of the Gigu tribe. A Gu-kun, hmm. I think Kid will do for him. We'll talk about that later. It's not like it's important enough to argue about it now. Since Agu wants us to use his name, maybe we should, in order to build trust between us. Arnie san you're really mature. Then let's gather our things and go. In accordance with Kaijali's words, the group set off in silence while watching their surroundings warily. The heavy atmosphere that hung around them was almost visible to the naked eye. Although Henry wanted to lighten the mood with conversation, the forest was not a place for humanity. 
she could not act lightly here, especially considering that there might be further pursuers after them. They left the dark and gloomy forest, and after bathing in the sunlight, the tension which filled their bodies melted away, replaced by the flexibility and relaxation that had returned to them. In that moment, they felt like they had returned to the world of mankind once more. Bufaya was walking beside Enri, and a loud fewer escaped him, sounding like both a sigh and a yawn. The goblin's movements had lost their tense edge, but Agu's expression still looked stiff. He seemed distressed by the sunlight and the wide spaces, and it showed on his face. That was probably because he had grown up in the shadowed forest. There, the village is there. Agu's face scrunched up as he followed Enri's finger to the distance. What? That wall? It feels. Feels kind of like that monument of destruction. Monument of destruction? That's right. It's a scary new place in the great forest. Anyone who goes near it will perish. They say there's undead there too. You say everyone who goes near it will die, but you sure know a lot about it. While the Monument of Destruction was still under construction, the brave ones from our tribe went there and saw monsters of bone building it. Did you know about this? No, I'm sorry, but this is new to us too, Arnie San. If we go too deep into the forest we might meet enemies even our boss can't defeat. So we try not to go too far. Hey, which tribe are you three from? You're stronger than any goblins I've ever seen before, so where? A goose sneaked a peek at Enri, and then mumbled something about usually humans are. To himself. Do you serve the humans? Is that weird? Isn't it normal to work for someone who's strong? But strong people. No, I mean, I've heard that humans as a race have strong members and weak members. But you're a woman, right? And the one with his hair covering his face is a man, right? Enri's eyes went wide. If she were not a woman, then what was she? No, it was just that he could not tell if Nferia was male. Could it be that goblins could not tell the sex of humans? Enri, I think this boy hasn't seen humans before. At most, he knows what his fellow goblins told him. Also, is it really so hard for goblins to tell us humans apart? Well, our clothes are different. Like I said, he doesn't know things like that. Don't all goblins wear the same thing regardless of whether they're male or female? Of course, sometimes they're civilized goblins with a country of their own, but he's not one of them. I see, Enri suddenly realized, and then she realized she had not answered Agu's question yet. That's right, I'm a the girl. So are you a magic caster? No, is something wrong? A profoundly disturbed expression appeared on Agu's face. I'm the magic caster. An arcane magic caster. You two are husband and wife, right? Eh? The two of them exclaimed in perfect harmony. No, I mean, for some races, the wives can use their husband's power and authority. Is it not like that? No, no, it's not like that at all. The surrounding goblins seemed to want to say something in response to Enri's adamant refusal, but all that anyone saw them doing was sagging their shoulders in silence. Then, what's going on? How come that woman's number one? We call you a kid because you don't understand why. Anne San's strength isn't something that can be seen with the eyes. Henry wanted to deny that, but Agu's earnest eyes looking at her exerted a pressure that left her unable to speak. While Henry was confused, Kaijali asked a question. Then, another question for you. Why were you being chased by those guys? What happened? That. Say, can this wait until we get back to the village? And the one who answered Enri's suggestion was. That's right Sue. It would be better that way Sue. A woman who had not been with them until now. Everyone exclaimed in surprise, and looked to the source of the sound. What they saw was a stunning beauty. She was a woman with twin braids and brown skin. She was dressed in what she called her maid wear, and she carried a strange-looking weapon on her back. She was a suspicious-looking individual, and at the same time a familiar one. Lupus Regina Beta. She was a maid serving under Ein's all gown, the saviour of Kani village, 
and she had been responsible for delivering the alchemical items and apparatuses to the bears as well as commanding the stone golems. Her cheerful and carefree attitude made her very popular with the villagers. However, she had a habit of appearing out of nowhere, just like she had done just now. The villagers believed that it was only natural that a maid in service to a great magic caster should know magic of her own, and Henry had shared that opinion too. Even so, appearing like that all of a sudden was still frightening. Lupu San, W where did you? Really now, N Chan, I've been following behind you guys from the beginning Sue. Huh? Don't tell me you guys didn't notice me Sue. I thought everyone was ignoring me because I had no present Sue. Eh? Eh? Although she sounded like she was kidding, her tone was very serious. Henry looked around for help from the others, then, Lupu Nizen, could you stop joking around? You were people think I'm just a joker Sue. I'd like you guys to remember me Sue. Nah, I was just kidding anyway Sue. Just a joke Sue. Silence resumed, until someone sighed tiredly with a ha. Well, not like there's anything wrong with that. So who's this little goblin? Could, could it be? Henry felt the goblins between her and Lupus Regina swapping annoyed looks. Fufu, Infi Chan, you got cut by a goblin? Fufufu. As everyone rolled their eyes, Lupus Regina was still laughing. What's all of this then, Sue? A pure, innocent boy's love, trampled just like that, Sue. Ah, what a riot, Sue. Fugia, all right, enough kidding around, what really happened? A goose body trembled fiercely, as though he had seen some kind of monster. Although, Henry could understand why. Lupus Regina's cheerful expression changed ceaselessly, like a high-strung person under stress. The way she could go from laughing to dead serious all of a sudden was frightening in its own way. Or, don't worry, I won't eat you Sue. It's okay Tilda Sue. Come on, tell Oni-chan all about it Sue. Lupu Nizen. We should talk about this later. Didn't you agree on that? Oya? Hmm, I definitely recall saying something like that Sue. Ah. I hope you can hand this potion to Gaon Summer, Beta-san. It's newly developed, but its effects have been tested and proven. Oh? Infi Chan, you finally made it? That's right. Unfortunately, it's not completely red, but I think we've made significant progress. Well, that's great. I'm sure Ein Summer will be very happy to hear it. With that, Lupus Regina's attitude seemed to have become that of a normal person, and not the flighty, carefree girl from before. However, that expression only lasted a moment. In the next, she was back to her old self. Ah, how exciting, really, I picked a great day to visit Sue. Also, no need to call me Beta. Lupus Regina will do Sue. Special exception just for you. With the, apparently, high-spirited Lupus Regina in tow, they entered the village gates. The villagers said nothing when they saw the unfamiliar goblin child. One could say that they were not nervous, but it could also be said that they trusted Enri very much. Perhaps they had assumed that the goblin child was a relative of one of the other goblins. They went through the village and passed Enri's home. Their destination was the goblin's house. Excuse me for a bit. I'm going to call Britta San over to listen to what Agu has to say. Sounds like a plan, Arnie San. She's training to be a ranger, so she'll be entering the forest, which means it would be good to share this information with her, so what should we do, An San? Eh? Me? Enri panicked briefly, not having expected her name to come up during the conversation. With no particular reason to oppose it, she simply nodded her head. Hmm. Well, it's not like I'm opposed to it or anything. Rather, I hope she hears what Agu has to say. I'm counting on you, Enfi. With an understood, Nferia left the group behind, while I don't mind just waiting here. Maybe I should make drinks. Great idea, Sue. I'm thirsty, Sue. Lupu Nizen, aren't you a maid? That means you know how to make delicious drinks, right? Velp, I'm the maid of Ein Summer, and the other supreme beings, so. 
I don't want to work for anyone else Sue. I just want to laze around Sue Tilda. Not interested in working at all Sue. Is that so? Well, that's a shame. Although Unrai and Lupus Regina's conversation seemed quite normal, Henry could still feel a chill run through her. As they walked and talked, they reached the goblin's house. This was a huge building, with a wide courtyard where one could raise and let wolves run around, capable of housing almost twenty people. There was ample space to train with and prepare their weapons. The goblins opened the door, and led the way for Enri, Agu, and Lupus Regina. Few EEI didn't know there was a place like this Sue. Hmm? Lupus Regina San, you're not coming in? Yup yup Sue can't just barge in without an invitation Sue. Well, it's just a matter of etiquette, it's not like I can't really go in Sue. I guess the only one with such a weird legend surrounding them is Flatchist San Sue. Flatchist San? That's right, En Chan Sue. It's the name of a tragic beauty Sue. Well, it wasn't as though that person couldn't really go in Sue. It's all legends, myths and folklore. We eel, let's not talk about that anymore. We're here to listen to what Goblin over there has to say, right Sue? Ah, yes. Then, drinks. M, how about herbal water and fruit water? There's black grass tea and hyuri infused water. Agu and Lupus Regina looked completely baffled by Unri's question, so Enri helped explain for them. Hyuri are citrus fruits, you cut them open and infuse them into water and it tastes clear and good. Black grass tea is a little bitter. I'll like a hyuri water. Same for me Sue. Got it. How about Ansan? I think I'll have the hyuri water too, and... How about washing our hands? Even if our noses are used to it. Ah, that should be all right. Oi, kid, I mean, Agu, you come over here too. Gotta clean yourself up. And bro, sorry about this, but you mind taking care of our dirty weapons? Is it all right? Of course it is. Not like he can do anything. Our rules here are very simple. If that's the case, let's go. Kaijali left the room with three sets of weapons. Agu, come over here quickly. Why do I have to wash? I'm clean, aren't I? Enri saw that Agu's hands were very dirty, they were not clean by any definition of the word. Your opinion is irrelevant. This is the owner of the house telling you to wash up. Or are you saying you're going to defy the owner in his own house? Agu puffed up his cheeks, and plodded over slowly to Enri's side. Enri poured the water from the large tank into the pails. After preparing four sets, she stuck her hands into the unexpectedly cold water and started to wash up, the green stuck in the gaps of her nails melted away. After she was sure it was all gone, she brought her hands in front of her face. The stench was gone. Satisfied, she then looked around herself. Goku and Unrai were washing their hands too, and the water was dyed red by the Bargast's blood. Next, she looked to Agu, but what she saw left her dumbfounded. Even a child would know better than to wash up like this. He stuck his arms into the water, waggled them around a little, and that was that. He did not even dry himself off. It was only after Enri had washed off the plants sent on her hands, Agu still reeked of torn leaves. For goblins who lived in the forest, a scent like this was a form of self-defense against magical beasts who had keen senses of smell. As such, they might have never developed the habit of bathing. Even so. You do it like this. Agu made an annoyed face as Enri tried to teach him. However, he thought of his own position and what the other goblins had said earlier and grudgingly, he started to thoroughly clean himself. That's right, you're doing great. Hey, after this, use this to wipe your body. Make sure you get all the blood off. Agu looked unhappy, but he still took the towel with damp hands and used it to wipe himself off. So we just dump the dirty water outside? Yeah, just like that. Ansan, go have a seat. We'll take care of the rest. Enri took advantage of those words and headed to the nearby table. 
It was surrounded by chairs since so many goblins lived here. As she chose a place to sit, she suddenly realized how tired she was. Her arms and legs were like logs, and her head was heavy. Although part of the reason had been gathering herbs, what had really worn her out was the battle against the Bargast. All I did was watch. Infi and the goblins were fighting, but they're still moving around after all that. Looks like I'm never going to be a warrior. Or rather, Infi's gotten stronger. Even though she knew that her childhood friend could use magic, she hadn't expected that magic to be so powerful, he's amazing. As she thought of her suddenly different childhood friend, Enri's heart swelled with an emotion she could not put into words. It was a mysterious feeling that seemed to be surprise, but then again it seemed like something else entirely. A clear sound brought Enri back to her senses, and her eyes fell on the ceramic cups on the table. They were filled with a transparent fluid that gave off a citrus smell, and Enri decided to help herself to a cup. The refreshing, sweet and sour taste washed over her entire body, and she felt like she was filled with energy. A goo had sat down beside her at some point, and he gulped his down in one shot and immediately asked for another. Lupus Regina did not touch hers. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen Lupus Regina San eat or drink. Hmm? Something wrong? You've been sneaking glances my way recently. Are you in love with me? Ah, how troubling my, how shocking, to think that Enchan is a lesbian Sue. Looks like I need to let everyone know Sue. What? No. No. It's not like that. Wahahaha. Just kidding, I know Enchan likes men. Enri did not know how to reply, and her mouth narrowed into a straight line. Still, they're pretty slow. Hmm? Looks like they've arrived. Enri turned to the door, but she could not sense anyone outside. Really? But I don't hear anything at all. Agu cupped his ear forward with his hand. Hey, are humans a race with good hearing? That, that, I don't know about that, but I don't think Lupus Regina San would lie about this sort of thing. Though she might. Prank people a little. Then, was she lying? A goo's eyes suddenly went wide as he stared at Lupus Regina. No, really, I heard them. They're coming for sure. You're amazing. Hmm? Not at all, Sue. Compared to Enri San over there, I'm nothing much, Sue. A goo seemed to swallow it up and looked back at Enri with a surprised expression. No, that's not how it is. That smile on Lupus Regina San's face is so damn fake. Enri wondered how she should tell Agu the truth, but before that, a knock came from the door. Shortly after, Pfeya and a woman in leather armor entered the room. Britta, the former adventurer, had moved into the village after Pfeya did. Originally, she had been an adventurer in E. Rantle, but had retired after certain events. Even so, she still needed to earn a living, and so she responded to the village's solicitations and moved here. She was studying to be a ranger, and she had potential. Even though she was weaker than Jugum, she was still one of the strongest people in the village and the leader of the village's self-defense force, even though it could hardly be called that. They had brought her along because she led the defense force, and because she entered the forest while practicing her ranger field craft. Ah, it really is a new goblin. No, hmm, I keep thinking from an adventurer's point of view. I shouldn't treat him as an enemy. Britta smiled bitterly. It was not as though Enri did not understand where she came from. In stories, goblins were the enemies of mankind. Killing them on sight was the right thing to do. However, this village was different. Frankly speaking, the villagers felt that humans seemed to be the real enemies in this case. Then, since everyone's here, let's listen to what he has to say. Agu, can you tell us why you were running while covered in all those wounds? Simply put, I was fleeing from an attack. That's too simple. What kind of monster attacked you? The minions of the Giant of the East. The Giant of the East? Who's that? What do you call him? No, it's not a matter of what we call him, we didn't even know he existed until just now. Britta San, do you know anything about this? The most widely read person in this place was Nferia, 
but when it came to the forest, Britta still knew more than him. Even so, all she could do was shake her head. I'm sorry. I haven't heard anything concerning this giant of the East. And I don't think Master Latterman knows either, we've never ventured into the depths of the forest and so don't know much about its residents. Then, Agu, tell us the basics about him. When you say the basics, you mean. Henry understood Agu's confusion. In situations like these, it was better to ask discreet questions one by one, so it would be easier for him to answer. Then, can you tell us about the powerful monsters in the forest? Well, to me the Barghests and the Ogres are all strong. But if you want to talk about things on the level of the Giant of the East, then in the forest, there are the powerful ones called the Three Monsters. The first is the Beast of the South. They say it's amazingly strong and slaughters everyone who enters its domain. However, we haven't heard anything about it recently, and apparently they did not see it even when they entered its territory, so I don't know what happened to it. Then there's the Giant of the East. He's built an army beyond the withered forest. Finally is the Serpent of the West. I heard it's a disgusting snake that can use magic. Strange. How about the North? There seems to be a lake in the North with all kinds of races. As for who rules them? I don't know. But there seem to be twin witches in the swamp. And when the beast of the South vanished, the forest became weird. I'm not too sure what exactly happened, apparently some really scary guy showed up, and then the balance of power shifted. Is that the Monument of Destruction? That's right. I also heard that the Master of the Monument of Destruction can command the undead, little black shadows that can move through darkness. That's what the survivors told us. Everyone, with the exception of Lupus Regina, looked uneasily at each other. The first thing was the Beast of the South. Since its territory was supposed to be nearby, then when one thought about it, the creature must surely be the magical beast tamed by the adventurers who had escorted Nferia here, or more specifically, the one who wore jet-black plate armor. It certainly had the look of power and strength about it, and so the description fit it perfectly. The beast. The wise king of the forest, Hamsuk Sam. That's it. Ah, yes, that certainly qualifies as a beast. Britta said as she heard Nferia. She had not been in the village at that time. Apparently, she had seen it in E-Rantle, from far away. And there were two more monstrous creatures out there who could equal it. Nobody could not feel shock and fear at that realization. Then, how did you escape? Until recently, the three of them held each other in check. The Beast of the South didn't leave its territory, but nobody could guarantee that would always be the case. If the East and West fought, no matter who won, there was always the chance that in their moment of victory, they would be finished off by the beast in their weakened state. As such, none of the three powers actually engaged in battle. All right, I can accept that. However, if the East and West cooperated and... No, the beast of the South wouldn't leave his domain, so there's no need to ally to defeat it, no need to provoke it. I don't know what those guys are thinking. They just claimed their own territory and turned it into their own kingdoms. However, the owner of the Monument of Destruction messed up the power distribution. Because of that, the East and West decided to make war on that King of Destruction, and they went around gathering disposable troops for their forces. Agu just kept talking and talking, without a pause. They forced us to ally with them. Although, we were hardly allies. Eyes more like we goblins were worthless to them. They used us up and threw us away, and if we messed up, we suffered. Because of that, we ran away. However, it didn't work, right? Yes, that's right. The bar guests and ogres came after us. We couldn't fight them, so we scattered. I fled in this direction with a few people into the Beast of the South's territory, but we didn't expect them to come in after us without hesitation. He said there had been a few people, but there had been no sign of anyone other than a goo. A pained expression drew across Enri's face, and Goku spoke. We have people scouting out the forest, if anyone's still alive, we can bring them back here as long as they don't resist. Yes, there's that. Wolves' noses are very sensitive. Then. 
The question is, besides the Bargast, what else is out there? Did they have friends that came over too? If it goes badly, the pursuers might end up coming all the way here. Oi, Agu, what other monsters are there? There's Barghests, Ogres, Borgats, Bugbears, and some kind of wolf thing. They're fairly common monsters. I'd like to hear more about the Giant of the East and the Serpent of the West, specifically, their looks, their abilities, that sort of thing. Do you know anything? Agu shook his head. I don't know the details. I know that the Giant of the East carries a big sword, and that the Serpent of the West has a head like you, but what kind of magic he uses, I don't know. Everyone's attention went to Nferia, who shook his head, there was simply too little information to work with. The question now is what are we going to do? If something that can fight evenly with the beast shows up, frankly speaking, we're done for. The most the self-defense force can do is take the women and children to safety. Indeed. If all we needed was a sturdy defense then it would be fine, or maybe we should think about some other methods. If the disturbance in the forest blew over by itself, it would be great. Everyone began thinking. For them, as people who lived outside the forest, it would be best if matters within the forest settled themselves. However, that would mean they would be unable to enter the forest at all, which would be problematic. Still, they might have no choice but to do so if the worst came to pass. However, if the enemy can easily take out a forest tribe, that means they must have gathered a lot of fighting power. Wrong, originally, our tribe was a lot stronger. However, when we went in search of new places to live, our tribe dispatched mixed teams of ogres and adult goblins, if they're still alive, we can still fight back. Then those adult goblins still haven't come back yet? As Britta spoke, Furrier tilted his head, as though thinking about something. About that. Although this is a completely different topic, could I ask you about something that's bothering me? Do you speak the same way that other goblins do? What do you mean? Ah, that might be a little hard to understand. In the past, I've met goblins myself, and don't take it the wrong way, but they spoke like morons. In the village though, Jugam San and the others speak normally. The same goes for you, as in you both speak fluently. Because of that, I was wondering if the ones I saw were savage goblin tribes or something. No, it's just that I'm particularly smart for a goblin. Most goblins speak in single syllables. That made conversation in the tribe really troublesome, I can tell you that. I was seriously wondering if I was from another tribe instead. Now, just to be safe, let me ask you this, was I born in a tribe from around here? Have you heard anything about me? No, we don't know. You. Could it be? An San, Arnie San, could you come over here for a bit? Nferia and Enri followed Kaijali to the corner of the room. Could it be that a goo kid's not a goblin, but a hobgoblin? Hobgoblins were offshoots of the goblin race, and they were superior to goblins in many ways. Goblins were about as big as human children when they were adults, but hobgoblins could reach the height of an adult human. They were similar to humans not just in physical abilities, but in mental attributes. Since they could breed with goblins, they typically formed mixed communities with them. However, Hobgoblins were not as fecund as goblins, and so they tended to be leaders or elite guards within a tribe. But if my father or mother was a hobgoblin, wouldn't they know themselves? Both his parents were goblins and he was a hobgoblin. Eh? Isn't that the kind of weird plot that shows up in stories? This is the first time I've seen Henry make a face like that. But unfortunately, I don't think that's the answer, just as humans adopt children, I think the goblins might have done something similar. That's certainly possible. Well, in that case, we don't have to worry too much about it. The three of them returned to the table, and as they did, the hitherto silent Lupus Regina opened her mouth to speak. Velp, made a decision Sue? If anything happens, you can always ask Iron Summer for help Sue. Ask him to help solve the problem and all that Sue. That would be everything they wished for. If the hero who saved the village decided to make a move, not even the three monsters could hope to stand against him. However, we'd be counting too much on him. 
Enri mumbled to herself, and the goblins agreed. Only Britta and Agu, who did not know of Ainz, were baffled. Lufaya had a complex expression on his face. This village is our village. That means we should do as much as we can by ourselves. Although, some people might think that I shouldn't put on airs because I haven't bled or led anyone, I still. No, I agree with An San's opinion, this village is An San's. Kaijali went him, and then tilted his head as he corrected himself. An San and our. No, that's not right either. You're trying to say that the village belongs to everyone who lives here, right? That's right, Ani San. You got it, just like I expected. Well, even so, I think borrowing the power of that magic caster summer should wait until we're completely out of options. But if we do that, everyone might die soon. Getting hacked up hurts, you know Sue. Ha! Lupus Regina San, we won't let that happen. We'll sacrifice ourselves so everyone has time to run first. Lupus Regina seemed disappointed. Is that so Sue? You'd better work hard, then Sue. And I also want to contact the Adventurers Guild in E. Rantle, or maybe reporting to them would be a better word to use. The guild will send someone over to look after they accept our request. It would be troublesome if we put in a request after it became an emergency, Britta followed on Afton Furrier's suggestion. That's true. The Adventurers Guild doesn't want to lose their people to unexpected monsters. Of course, workers and other madmen will all scoff and say that the guild protects adventurers too much, but they're just greedy pigs looking to pick a fight. It's only natural that an organization would want to protect their own members. Britta San, although I don't want to speak ill of adventurers, but during emergencies, the hiring cost might go through the roof, or they might even reject it. Why is that? Adventurers don't want to die, and the guild doesn't want them to die either. Therefore, the guild jacks up the prices to attract higher-ranking adventurers to deal with a problem, even if the situation ultimately doesn't warrant them. That's it, really. As a clueless village girl, Henry found the words of this former adventurer easy to swallow. It was quite hard to have to accept this when they were being pushed into a corner. However, when she looked at it from the adventurer's point of view, it made sense too. Well, even if the guild checks it out, people might still die anyway, that sort of thing happens a lot. Britta bit her lower lip. When I think of that vampire attack, I can't help but shiver. Used to be I couldn't even sleep without taking medicine for it. Vampire? What's that? Agu asked without any reservation, and Britta smiled bitterly. It's a secret. Or rather, don't make me think about it. I'll piss myself. But I was the one who was asky. You're not in a position to ask questions, brat. So the plan for now is to report it to the guild, and if the situation permits we'll make a request. It'll probably be frighteningly expensive, but we should at least get a quote from the guild. Also, we'll have to tell Jugam San and the chief about it later. Can you do that, Henry? I'll take care of the self-defense force. Frankly speaking, I'd have done the same thing too, and Furya nodded as Britta spoke. Then, I guess I'll go walk about the village for a bit before going back so you really won't ask Ein Summer for help Sue. Yes. We'd like to do as much as possible by ourselves. If possible, we'd like you to tell Gaon Summer that much. Got it, Sue. As Agu looked at Enri and Vifuria, who were moving off, a hard-to-describe feeling welled up within him. Just what's so great about that woman? Huh? The threatening tone in the adult goblin's voice made Agu's body tremble. Agu felt that the adult goblins were stronger than anyone else in his village. It was only natural for him to break out in goosebumps when threatened by them. Yet, this still could not overcome his childish curiosity. Are women really that great in this Kani tribe? From Agu's point of view, Enri did not seem particularly strong. Although she had some muscle on her arms and legs, it was nowhere near enough. She did not need to be as muscular as an ogre, but as a leader, she needed way more than what she had now. If she were a magic caster he could still understand it. The female who became leaders in goblin tribes often used that mysterious power. However, 
that woman did not look like a magic caster. Frankly speaking, Agu did not understand why Enri was superior to the goblins. It's not like that. The hunter woman who came later was stronger than her, right? Well, Britta's not bad in her own way. But we're better. Agu's opinion of the grown goblin in front of him went up another notch. He was shorter than that woman, yet he had spoke with unyielding conviction. Surely there must have been a reason for his self-confidence. And then, that woman who appeared from behind you, she's not that strong either, is she? Though the way she showed up out of nowhere scared me to death. The adult goblin suddenly clammed up, and stared at Agu. Sensing a strange pressure all over him, Agu nervously asked. W what? What's with that woman? That woman who suddenly appeared. Her name is Lucas Regina, and she. She's very dangerous, since you'll be staying with us for a while, do not ever go near her or speak to her. It's for your own good. Ah. Ah. I get it. And I have to say this up front. Although it should be blindingly obvious, if you do anything to the people in the village. Let's be honest here, you won't just get away with a scolding, you'd better be prepared to die. I, I got it. So I'm basically like someone from a defeated tribe, right? I promise that I will not harm anyone from Kani tribe. All right, that's good. Stay away from Lupus Regina, okay? Agu understood the mix of caution and dread in the adult goblin's heart, and he engraved the warning into his heart. With that done, he realized his first question had not been answered, and so he asked again. Why is Enri San so great? Even Agu could learn. Or rather, it was easy for him to learn, since he was the smartest in the tribe and could not talk much with other goblins, so he picked up on things like that quickly. Ha, huh, Enri. The truth is. She's very strong. Eh? It's because you're too weak that you can't tell. If An San got serious, she could crush a bargast or what not to death with just one hand, and squeeze the blood out into a cup to drink, you know? Really? Oh yes, yes, of course it's true. Agu thought of Enri. When he thought about it calmly, it was true that she had been able to give powerful orders that shook the soul. Maybe that was just the tip of the iceberg? An San just pretends to be weak. If you ask too much and get her mad, she'll crush you to death with one hand. After that, clean-up will be a pain. There'll be blood everywhere. Is, is that so? Then why, why does she have to pretend to be weak? If she were strong, wouldn't there be fewer problems? If you show off your strength, you'll get people coming from all over to challenge you. That's pretty troublesome too, you know. Agu had thought that strength was the solution to all problems, but that was not the case. Locked in a labyrinth of self-reflection, he did not realize that the adult goblin in front of him had a joking expression on his face. In the middle of the night, Enri suddenly woke from her slumber. Though there did not seem to be anything strange nearby, Enri remained still while she moved her eyes to check around her. The world before her was pitch black, lit only by a slim ray of moonlight from between the window shutters. She could not see anything strange in this weak light. But Enri's ears could hear just fine. There were no sounds of horses neighing, armored knights clanking, or people screaming. She could not hear anything like that it was just a normal night. Enri sighed softly, and closed her eyes. She had been sleeping soundly until just now, so she was still groggy and could not get up right away. A lot had happened today. After the talk with Agu, she had gone to explain things to the village chief and Jugam, who had returned from his scouting. It'll be all right, right. In order to confirm the new information, Jugam had decided to enter the forest again and they had left at night. Moving at night in the forest was just too dangerous. Goblins were different from humans, they could see with small amounts of light, so they could move freely. However, there were many nocturnal magical beasts and monsters, and they would become active after the sunset. It was much more dangerous than in the day. If there had been no need to urgently confirm that there were no more monsters chasing Agu, Jugam would never have set out. It was true that the goblins were strong, but that was only in comparison to Enri. 
There were many creatures in the forest who were stronger than the goblins, such as the three monsters. A sense of dread and loss fell over Enri, making her twitch, and because of that, her little sister moaned in her sleep, scooting closer to Enri's body. Enri half opened her eyes, and peeked at her little sister. It would seem that it had not woken her up. She could even hear her gentle snoring. He he. Just as Enri chuckled in her throat, the sound of soft knocking resounded on the door. This was definitely not a trick of the wind. Enri frowned. What could there be so late at night? Then again, it was precisely because it was so late at night that meant it had to be important. She gingerly separated herself from Nemu and the blanket and slowly got off the bed, moving carefully so as not to wake her little sister. The boards creaked as she got out of bed, making Enri's heart beat faster as she worried about waking up Nemu. After that incident, Nemu had to sleep with Enri at night. She had suffered very severe trauma. Enri had no intention of scolding her for it. That was because Enri felt safer when she slept with her sister. But she knew, even when the two of them were together, Nemu would sometimes be awoken by her nightmares. Because of that, Enri insisted on being with Nemu even when she was sound asleep. Quietly, and therefore slowly, she inched toward the threshold, but the knocking did not stop. Enri nervously peeked out the window, and the moonlight illuminated Jugam's silhouette. She sighed in relief. In order not to wake Nemu, Enri quietly spoke outside the window. Jugam San, you're safe. Yeah, and San. In the end, it was all right. Sorry to wake you up, but I think you ought to know this as soon as possible. Enri opened the door slightly, and squeezed her body out through the gap. She was worried that the moonlight coming in would wake Nemu. Understanding from her movements, Jugam lowered his voice and spoke. There's something we need you for, An San. Right now? Enri smiled playfully. Of course, I don't mind. I'm really sorry about this. Enri followed in Jugam's footsteps while telling him not to apologize. It might have been better for Nemu to be awake for this, and she had considered that, but Jugam had come for her knowing that everyone else was asleep. There had to be a reason for it. I'll explain as we walk. He usually spoke more lightly, but when it came to work, or what Jugam judged to be work, his tone was stiffer. Although Enri felt that it was okay to be more casual with a simple village girl like herself, Jugam had refused to change that part of him, so Enri gave up on that idea. Firstly, we found some members of a goose tribe. That's wonderful. But they're emotionally fragile, and I think they'll need to rest for a few days. We had to borrow Arnie San's strength for this. Sensing Enri's surprised expression, Jugam followed up with an explanation. When we found the survivors of a goose tribe, they were being held by the giant of the East's ogres as prisoners, and used as food. Although Kona healed their physical wounds, their minds are still scarred. Arnie San has some medicine to calm them down, and we want him to help treat them. After that, there's a somewhat more troublesome matter. Jugam watched Enri's expression before continuing. When we rescued them, we captured five ogres. Although we only did it to question them. It seems ogres normally coexist with goblins, and while the ogres fight, the goblins provide food, shelter, and so on, in a mutually beneficial relationship. Because of that, they said they're willing to fight for our tribe. According to Agu, this isn't uncommon. So, what should we do? Can we trust them? Agu says we can. The ogres have a strange habit, they won't fight for anyone apart from the goblins of their tribe, and they betrayed the giant of the east because he wasn't of their tribe. It's something like that. Hmm. But, man-eating ogres sound kind of scary. Once they accept the people in the village as part of their tribe, all you need to do is feed them and it'll be fine. You can give them just about any kind of food too. Fortunately, they're omnivorous. Honestly speaking, this decision was very difficult for a simple village girl to make. How about killing them? This was delivered in a casual tone. Frankly speaking, I have no problems with killing them outright. It would save us a big stack of problems. In the first place, people like them who betray others might turn on us if things start to go bad. 
A goose says they won't, but blindly believing everything a kid says is a little. And what do you think, Jagam san? If they could fight for us, it would be great. We don't know how many pursuers might come from the forest, so a few extra meat shields would help a lot. Then, one more question, will they eat people? An San. Although ogres have a reputation for eating humans, they're just monsters who eat meat. The only thing is that it's easier to catch humans to eat than wild animals. For ogres, it was better to catch humans than say, rabbits. It was only natural when one considered that humans were easier to capture and gave more meat too. Well, if you give them something to eat, they won't attack the villagers. In the first place, they only attack people to fill their stomachs. You have my word that we'll hunt enough animals to fill their bellies. Of course, they'll still need to be supervised, and we'll have to see how things go. I promise we won't let anyone in the village be hurt. In that case, it would be good if we could trust them enough to make them subordinates. Not just for now, but for the future as well. I'm glad you understand. Only thing is, there's a small contradiction with what I said just now. If what happens next goes poorly, we'll have to kill them all. Truthfully speaking, I've been thinking of how to impress on those ogres that you're their boss, Ansan. Eh? Henry let out a noise that sounded like she'd been flipped upside down. This was too much of a leap for her. Why did a simple village girl like herself have to become the leader of a band of ogres? Would it not be enough for Jugan to be their boss? This is planning for the future. It'll be troublesome if the ogres think of you as just another human being, and San. Although we listen to you, a situation where orders have to be relayed through us goblins is potentially very dangerous. As a frontline commander, anything could happen to me at any time, so I feel that we need someone safe in the rear who can command the ogres. Enri considered the problem with her village girl sensibilities. Which means you need two people who can command them. Jugam nodded. In that case, Enfi could. Arnie San might end up being on the front line too. I see. Enri suddenly understood, and nodded. Someone in a safe place like herself ought to be useful too. That was also what Enri wanted as well. However. But can I really control the ogres? That's what we're about to find out, and San. How good are you at acting? Both the front and the rear gates of the village led outside, and Jugam led her to the rear gate. Beyond it were five ogres kneeling on the ground. They were also the source of the stench that had been hanging in the air. Surrounding them were the goblin troop, all of whom were present and unhurt. On one side of the door was an observation platform, which would normally have been manned by villagers or goblins, but not now. The goblins had temporarily left it, Bfeya was there too, along with Agu, who was some distance away. Yo, Enri. Nice night? Yeah, Enfi. The moon's really pretty. Indeed. It's so big and clear. Sorry to interrupt your conversation, but let's get this show on the road, Jugam whispered to Enri before shouting, Oi. You lot. Our Anne San is here. She holds your lives in her hands. When the five ogres heard this, they raised their heads to look at Enri. It felt like there was a palpable pressure crushing her, but Enri forced herself not to take a step backward. If she gave in, the plan would fail, and the goblins would nip potential problems in the bud by killing the ogres on the spot. Enri could already see the goblins' hands going to their weapons. Infi was calmly taking out a potion bottle himself. An eternity seemed to pass under the withering pressure. Enri endured the stares of the ogres and returned it with one of her own. Her gaze was steady and unyielding. In her eyes, the ogres overlapped with the image of the knights from back then. Enri clenched her fists, recalling how she had felt back then, when she had punched the helmeted knight straight in the face. Don't look down on me. Everyone else is protecting the village, so I have to protect it too. After a tense second, a second which seemed to stretch out forever to Enri, the ogres wavered. They peeked at each other, and then at Jugam. Told you, didn't I? Our boss, our An San, is the strongest. Faces down, all of you. Enri shouted out just as Jugam finished. 
The forcefulness of Enri's voice surprised even herself, and a goo at the edge of her vision twitched violently, but that was fine. What was important was that the ogres had bowed their heads to her. For the time being, the ogres had acknowledged Enri's superiority. Well then, what do you have to say to our boss, the chief of Kani village, our Ansan? With their heads still lowered, what emerged from the ogres was a torrent of confused voices. So, so scary, little boss, forgive. Sorry, we attacked your tribe. Please forgive. By your tribe, the ogres probably meant a goose tribe. Though the reality was somewhat different, it was easier for them to understand the situation as the goose people being part of Kani tribe, in order to avoid overloading the ogres' brains. We will, work for you. That's right. Work for me and my tribe. That last statement was made with the dregs of her spirit she could muster. She had only said two or three sentences, Enri was already very tired. It was as bad as the encounter with the Bargast. Just as Enri was about to drop out of boss mode from fatigue, Jugum helped her out just in time. Wonderful. Looks like An San saved your lives. The strength had visibly ebbed from the ogres' bodies. Given that they could be killed at any moment, that was a natural reaction. One ogre looked at Enri and spoke. Chief, we, what do? She had not considered that yet. Still, if she did not know, she could entrust it to someone else. Jagam San, I'll let you take care of them. Use them as you see fit. Got it, An San. The goblin leader bowed to Enri, then turned back to the ogres. Well then. First of all, we're going to pitch tents outside the village. You lot will be shacking up there. And you too, help them with the tents. The ogres left, accompanied by the goblins. Pitching tents outside the village might cause all sorts of problems, we'll need to make a place for them to live in the village. Even so, we need to train them not to attack the villagers first. I'll need to go around to talk with a lot of people to make them accept it. Yup. Although, I think it'll be fine if you do it, Enri. And, about tomorrow. According to the plan, Enri and Nferia would be setting out to E. Rantle, with several goblins as guards. I'm sorry. I still need to help treat the survivors from the Goose tribe, so I can't go. After all, they would be living in the same village as the same ogres who wanted to eat them. The mental trauma had to be treated along with their physical wounds, and Lizzie's personality would only frighten them and have the opposite effect. In the end, there was nobody better for this than Furya. Eh? I feel a little uneasy about this. Enri didn't have any experience with visiting a big city like E. Rantel, so from her point of view the burden seemed quite weighty. Then, how about getting the village chief to go with you? I think that could be difficult. The village chief had to maintain order in the village, perform repairs, and keep an eye on their new residents. It would be very difficult for him to travel too far. How about the chief's wife? Hmm. Well, frankly speaking, there's not enough hands in the village. It used to be that way and now it's even more so. Kani village was a village with a very small population. As a result, when their numbers decreased, their ability to do anything decreased with it. This was why the villagers had suppressed their opposition to inviting more residents to stay with them. When I go to E. Rantel, I need to go to the temples and see if there's anyone who wants to move to the village. Really, this is too much for a village girl to be doing. All the best, chief. Enri pouted as she heard Jugum's words. Part of her was thinking, the nerve of you. After all, they were one of the reasons why Enri was so busy. I really wanted to come along. Nfeya mumbled in a depressed tone, and then covered it up in a flustered flurry of desperate hand-waving. I it'll be fine, I'll take care of Nemu chan so you can go without worries. All right, I get it, am I the only one in the world who has to go through this? One moment people worship me and make me out to be someone great, the next I have to go somewhere I've never been to before and do things I've never done before. Don't be so pessimistic, Enri. There's got to be someone out there who can relate to you. Jugum and Furya chuckled quietly as they saw her shoulders droop in fatigue, 
Agu watched from the distance, muttering to himself. So she really did take control of the goblins by force. The chief of Kani village, Henry Anderson. As the name implied, the fortress city E. Rantle was surrounded by three concentric rings of fortified walls. Of the gates set into those walls, those on the outermost walls were the thickest and most solid of them all, and they radiated an air of strength and weightiness. It was a common sight to see travellers on the street staring open-mouthed at the gates of the city that was said to be able to repulse any invasion the empire made. And the people on the streets had surely made similar expressions in the past. Besides these gates were customs inspection posts, manned by several soldiers who were relaxing just out of the direct sunlight. Although some people might have asked if it was all right for the soldiers of a city near the front line to be so relaxed, the truth was that the troops at the inspection posts were there to vet travellers. Their job was to uncover contraband and spies from other countries, so they had nothing to do when nobody was entering the city. As a result, the currently idle soldiers, though they maintained discipline instead of passing their time by playing cards, could not resist the urge to yawn. Though they looked slack for the moment, but when they were busy, they were very busy. In particular, the sheer amount of work they had to do in the morning, just after the gates opened, practically defied description. With the sun at its highest point in the sky, the travellers began appearing on the streets in small groups, scattered sparsely among the other pedestrians. It was only natural that people would travel in numbers, given that this was a world inhabited by monsters. When they show up, they show up in force, we're going to be busy soon, thought the guard who was idly contemplating the streets from his window. His eyes rested on a wagon about to enter the street, waiting for some pedestrians to pass. A woman sat on the driver's seat. He could not see anyone else on the uncovered wagon bed. She was traveling alone. She was unarmed and unarmored. From that, the guards concluded that she's just a village girl. Even as he thought that, the soldier tilted his head as he promptly second-guessed himself. People from the nearby villages were hardly a rare sight here. However, a woman travelling by herself was a different matter entirely. Even the area surrounding E. Rantle was not completely free of bandits and monsters. Thanks to the efforts of the legendary adventurer Team Darkness, most of the dangerous monsters and bandits had been wiped out. But most did not mean all, and there were still mundane beasts like wolves and the like to look out for. This situation was not unique to E. Rantle, it applied to all of the other cities as well. And come to think of it, could girls travel by themselves? Perhaps she had outrun a bandit encounter, but he did not sense any tension or nervousness from her at all. She looked to be at ease, as though she knew her journey would be a safe one. What kind of girl was she? The soldier shifted his now suspicious gaze to her horse, and that was when his confusion deepened. The horse was exceptional, not something a mere village girl would have. Its condition and coat reminded him of a war horse. War horses were extremely valuable. Even if one could actually raise the money to buy one, a normal person would not be able to acquire one easily. Leaving aside monstrous mounts like wyverns and griffins, war horses were the pinnacle of steeds. A normal person would need money and connections to obtain such a war horse, and a simple village girl would not have either. It was also possible that she had stolen the horse from its original owner, but anyone who stole such a valuable item would be hotly pursued and targeted for retribution. This was why bandits did not dare attack people mounted on war horses. In short, after considering all the visible evidence, the chances that she really was a simple village girl were very low. So who was this person posing as a village girl? The fact that she was traveling alone hinted at her true identity. In other words, she was very confident in her abilities, and those abilities were not limited by the fact that she chose to dress as a village girl, by her gear, or lack thereof. With that in mind, it was likely that she was a magic caster, since their equipment and power rarely matched their appearance. That was an answer he could accept. If pressed for the reason, it was because magic casters, or adventurers in general, were wealthy and connected, so obtaining a warhorse would be easy. Is that a magic caster? His partner beside him had gone through the same thought process. Might be, 
The soldier furrowed his brow and answered. Magic casters were very irritating people to inspect. To begin with, their primary weapon, magic, was an internal thing which was invisible to the naked eye. In other words, the guards could not tell what weapons magic casters were armed with. Secondly, they might be smuggling dangerous items with their magic and finding those was hard. Thirdly, they usually had a lot of specialist baggage, so checking them all was troublesome. Honestly speaking, he hated dealing with them. Because of that, they had a man on loan from the Magician's Guild, after paying a suitable fee, of course, to help them out. However, do we have to bring that guy out? I don't want to. It can't be helped. If we clear her through and anything happens, it'll be troublesome. It would be nice if she'd just dressed like a magic caster to begin with. Carrying a weird staff, wearing a weird robe? Yup. At least you'd know someone was a magic caster. Either that, or we force everyone in the magician's guild to carry some proof of membership, like adventurers. The two soldiers got up as one, laughing to each other. This was to welcome the girl who might be a magic caster. Under the watchful eyes of the soldiers, the wagon rolled up to the door and stopped. The girl disembarked. Her forehead was slick with sweat, but she seemed used to traveling under the sun. Her sleeves and slacks were long to ward off sunburn. Her clothes did not seem expensive or well tailored. No matter how you looked at her, she was a simple village girl. However, one could not judge a book by its cover. She could be hiding something. Their job was to find out what that was. The soldiers carefully approached the girl. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Could you come with us to the checkpoint? They spoke with gentle tones and expressions. They were trying to send the message that they were not wary of her, so she could lower her guard. Sure, I don't mind. The soldiers escorted the girl to the checkpoint. In order to protect against the use of, charm, spells and other forms of mental manipulation, two more soldiers followed at a distance of several meters. The others watched her carefully, wary of any suspicious movements. The girl tilted her head several times, as though sensing the tension in the air. What's wrong? A? Ah, no, nothing's wrong. Someone who could notice the minute changes in the air could not possibly be an ordinary person. The guards brought her into the checkpoint with that in mind. Then, could you sit down there? Yes. The girl sat in one of the chairs provided in the small blockhouse. Let's start with your name and place of birth. Yes. My name is Henry Emmett. I come from Kearney Village, near the Great Forest of Tob. The soldiers exchanged looks, and one of them stepped out of the blockhouse. He was going to check the register for any matching records. In order to manage its residents, the kingdom kept records of them in the form of registers. That being said, the registers were crude affairs, and the relevant details of birth and death were updated very slowly, if at all. Someone had once estimated that there were tens of thousands of mistakes in them. As a result, relying too heavily on the registers would be a bad idea, but even so, they had their uses. This register was muddled, but it had a lot of entries, so searching it would take a long time. The soldiers understood this, and decided to try and take care of something else in the meantime. Then, in place of the toll, could I see your permit? Normally speaking, everyone who entered a city had to pay a toll, something like a walking tax. However, charging residents this money would cause trade to grind to a halt, and as a result every village was issued travel permits with which they could enter the city free of charge. Of course, as there were different nobles in each region, there were different rules for each region too. Hmm, let me see. Here it is. The soldier stopped Henry from fishing through her bag. Ah, we'll do that. Could you give us your bag? Henry handed it over without protest. The soldiers carefully searched the insides, and found a parchment. They unrolled it on the table so everyone could see. Although the literacy rate amongst kingdom citizens was very low, it was a given that every soldier stationed at a checkpoint could read and write, or rather, they were here precisely because they were literate. I see. Well, it looks all right. 
This is definitely the permit issued to Kani village. I have confirmed this. The soldier rolled the parchment back up and returned it to the bag. Next, state the reason why you came to e rental Yes. Firstly, I'm here to sell the medicinal herbs that we've picked. The soldiers looked outside at the wagon, whose urns were currently being searched. Could you tell us the names and the amounts of the herbs you're selling? Four urns of new kuri, four urns of ajina and six urns of inkaishi. Six urns of inkaishi, you say? That's right. A look of pride spread over Enri's face. The soldier understood why. After all, when manning a checkpoint, one eventually picked up a working knowledge of medicinal herbs. Inkaishi was an herb that could only be gathered during a very short time frame, but it was a major ingredient in healing potions. The demand was very high, and thus the price was always good. If she had six urns like she said, that meant that she would have a lot of money when she sold them off. Then, where do you plan to sell them? I was planning to sell them at the former residence of Madame Bear. Bear? You mean the herbalist Lizzie Bear? Although she did not live there anymore, Lizzie had been the most important person in E. Rantel's pharmaceutical business until recently. If she had a business relationship with the Bears, that meant Lizzie trusted her very much. Then, there's no need to pry deeper, the soldiers thought. The truth was that although their job was to stop dangerous things from entering the city, investigating these things once they entered the city was no longer their problem. The soldier nodded with a grunt, then glanced at Henry's face. She had spoken quite normally until now, and they did not sense that she was lying. Once the cargo inspection was complete, their job would be over. At this moment, the soldier who had just returned nodded his head. That was to say, a girl called Henry was recorded in the register. However, that record simply said that there was a girl called Henry born in Kani village. Without any guarantee that the person in front of them was the real Henry, there was also no proof of the kind of life Henry had led. Perhaps during her travels, she had acquired some powerful magic, or she had died in her journey and some criminal was using her name. Because of that, they needed to perform one final check. Understood. Then, call him over. The soldier nodded, and left the blockhouse. After this, we will be examining your body. Is that all right? Eh? A surprised expression dawned on Henry's face. The soldier hurried to qualify his words. Oh, it's not because there were other problems. I'm sorry, but these are the rules. And we won't do anything weird to you, so don't worry. If that's how it is, then I understand. Seeing that Henry was okay with it, the soldier sighed with relief. He did not want to be the one to anger a possible magic caster. The soldier who left returned once more, this time with a man trailing behind him. This man was a magic caster. His nose protruded like an eagle's beak, while his thin face was sallow and pale. His body was wrapped in a black robe that looked very hot. His sweat flowed freely, and his claw-like hands tightly clutched his gnarled staff. Personally, the soldier felt that he should have shed the robe if it was so hot, but the magic caster liked that style, and stubbornly refused to change his clothes. Perhaps that was why the room's temperature seemed to rise by a few degrees when the magic caster entered. So it's this girl, then? The magic caster spoke calmly, which his soldier escort found strange, as usual. Although he seemed to be a man in his late twenties, his extremely hoarse voice made it impossible to determine how old he was by sound alone. Was it that his appearance was abnormally young, or that his voice was abnormally hoarse? Ah! Henry turned a surprised look at the magic caster who had replaced the soldier. In his heart, the soldier thought that her surprise could not be helped. After all, he too had been frightened the first time he saw the man. This is a magic caster from the Magician's Guild. He's going to perform a simple check, so please wait. The soldier gestured to Henry to remain seated, and then nodded to the magic caster. I'll leave this to you, then? Of course. The magic caster took a step toward Henry, and then he cast his spell. Detect magic. After that, the magic caster squinted his eyes. 
he looked like a beast sizing up its prey. Yet, Henry remained calm despite being subjected to a gaze that rattled even the soldiers, who were used to this sort of thing. As they saw this, all the soldiers could think was no wonder. Someone who could remain calm under such a mighty gaze could not be a simple village girl. At the very least, she must have had experience in life or death struggles against monsters or people who wanted to take her life. The sight before them only cemented the impression in the soldiers' hearts. You can't deceive my eyes. You're hiding a magic item. It's on your waist. Henry heard it, and looked to her waist in surprise. The soldiers immediately went on alert. They understood weapons like swords, but their knowledge did not cover magic items. You mean this? Henry produced a small horn from underneath her clothing, small enough that it could fit into both her palms. The soldiers might not have understood its significance even if they had seen it. Is that a magic item? That's right. You've been deceived by her appearance. That thing is imbued with powerful magic. The soldiers were speechless. If this was an item the magic caster considered powerful, then how mighty was it? As they began to think that the girl was dressed plainly for a reason, they felt as though a blade was piercing their chests. Ah, this is. No need to speak. My magic will see through it. In order to shut Henry up, he cast another spell. Appraisal magic item, ooh ooh. The magic caster's face went through several expressions in a few seconds. Initially it was shock, then fright, then terror, and then, confusion. What, what, what is this? Even the word powerful fails to do it justice. Impossible. What on earth is this? The magic caster's face was red, and flecks of spittle flew from the sides of his mouth. What the devil are you? Don't try to trick me. The magic caster's sudden change in attitude took the soldiers by surprise, and Henry was no exception as her eyes widened. No, I'm just, I'm just a normal person. A simple village girl. Really? A village girl? You, why, are you lying? Then, how could you have obtained a magic item like this? If you really are a simple village girl, how could you have gotten something like that? Eh? This, this is a gift from the one who saved our village, Ein's All Gown Summer. Lies again. A priest from the theocracy must have given it to you. Eh? What's that about the theocracy? Everyone. Fall in. There's something very wrong about this girl. Although the soldiers did not understand what was going on, up till today, they had never seen the magic caster react like this before, so if this were an emergency, they should drop whatever they were doing and respond to the summons. Fall in. Fall in. In response to the soldiers' shouts, several of their comrades stopped their cargo inspections and entered the room. You said someone else gave you this item? Nonsense. How did you get it? You can't possibly be a simple village girl. No, this really was given to me by Gown Summer. Please, you have to believe me. The soldiers looked between the two of them. The magic caster was a colleague of theirs, whom they had hired, and they wanted to believe him. However, given Henry's nervous reaction to the sudden change in the situation, they could not help but think she was a normal girl. What, what else is there? Tell me why you think she's suspicious. HNH. To begin with, this horn can summon a group of goblins, although I'm not sure how many it can call up, but it can do such a thing. The soldiers frowned. It would be troublesome if something like that was used on the streets. However, was that really a problem? Certain people, such as adventurers, possessed a plethora of magic items. It would not be strange for them to possess an item like this among their panoplies. And this so-called village girl's testimony is riddled with inconsistencies. That item is worth several thousand gold coins, why would anyone just give it to a mere village girl? Several thousand. Several thousand. This unbelievable sum drew cries of disbelief from the soldiers, and Henry herself. Several thousand gold coins was a sum no normal person could earn in their entire life. It was hard to believe such a simple-looking horn could be worth so much. That's right. Nobody would hand out such an item without a good reason, 
let alone to a mundane girl. I could accept it if she were a top-class adventurer or magic caster. But she says she's just a village girl. It's far too suspicious. That much the soldiers understood. Exceptional people would tend to gather exceptional items to themselves. In the past, both the great men of good and evil persuasions were known for their acquisition of powerful equipment. It was their destiny, and it was inevitable. No, really, I'm just a simple village girl. Besides, I've never heard of any Ein's all gown fellow. At least, he's not part of our guild, nor have I ever heard of an adventurer by that name. The warrior captain knows Gown Summer. The kingdom's warrior captain, Gazif Stranoff Dono. You must be uttering nonsense. How would a simple village girl know of such things? Because he came to our village. It's true. Go ask him and you'll know. It would be impossible to communicate with the warrior captain, who resided in the royal capital, from E. Rantel. More to the point, if she really was a simple village girl, it was unlikely that she would stay in the warrior captain's memory, so proving her identity would be hard. So what do we do? Detain her for now, then investigate her further, given that she didn't conceal that horn, and was planning to take it into the city openly, she might not be a spy or a terrorist, but that is no guarantee. Henry looked around in a panic. She looked just like a normal village girl. If this was an act, she must have been a very good actor. Suddenly, one of the soldiers watching the perimeter exclaimed in surprise. At the same moment, a familiar voice rang out. We wish to enter the city, but... What's going on? As they turned towards the voice, they saw a man wearing jet-black plate armor. You! The soldiers and magic caster all exclaimed in surprise. Everyone in E. Rantel knew the man who wore the armor. The adamantite plate which swayed over his chest was the conclusive proof of his identity. He was a living legend, a man who made the impossible possible, the ultimate warrior. He was Momen the Black. This, this is. Momen Summer. My sincerest apologies. Now, what's going on here? Hmm? This girl is. Yes. There was a suspicious girl, so checking her out took some time. We sincerely apologize for inconveniencing you, Moment Summer. Henry, is it? Henry Emmett? The air in the room seemed to freeze over. Why would a legendary adventurer know a village girl's name? Er, uh, ah, who are you? Er, uh, no, I am. Ah, you were the one who came with Nferia that time, right? I don't remember speaking to you. Momen put his hand on his chin, as though he was thinking. Afterward, he gestured to the magic caster and they exited the blockhouse. Although the soldiers wanted to follow, they could not leave Enri alone. Eventually, the magic caster returned alone to the room, having calmed down. Let her go. That great man, Momen the Black, has vouched for her with his status as an adamantite-ranked adventurer. In that case, Think there's no point in keeping her here. What do you think? That's an obvious decision. But, is it really all right? Is it really all right to doubt him, of all people? Oh, of course not. I get it. We'll grant her passage, Henry Emmett of Kearney Village, you are allowed to enter the city. You may go. Ah, yes. Thank you very much. After bowing quickly to them, Henry left the blockhouse. As her back receded into the distance, the soldier turned to the magic caster. What about Moment Summer? He left first. Then. What connection would that hero have with that village girl? Hell if I know. Moment Dono told me what I told you, he vouched for her and asked that we let her go. Then, another question. That Emmett girl. Do you really think she's just a village girl? Certainly not. There's no way she could be a simple village girl, otherwise why would a great hero like him help her? And it wasn't a coincidence she was carrying that item. Could it have something to do with the theocracy? That Ein's what's his face fellow. If he's from the theocracy, shouldn't we let the brass know? Frankly speaking, I don't know. After all, Momen Dono already vouched for her, 
If we let the people on top know that someone he vouched for was dangerous. Well, you'd be just doing your job, but do you really want to upset Momondono? The soldier's face twisted. The heroic exploits of Momon in the graveyards of E. Rantle were a common conversation topic when the soldiers gathered. The saga of how he hacked his way through a horde of tens of thousands of undead set the hearts of all who heard it ablaze. In addition, one could clearly see his heroic poise and actions even from afar. He had subdued a powerful magical beast with his incredible power, and his majestic riding style drove the soldiers mad for him. Just as women were attracted to strong men, many warriors admired Momon the Dark Hero, and it could be said that most of the armed forces of E. Rantle were his fans. This soldier was one of them. As a fan of Momon, just being patted on the shoulder by his idol was enough for him to boast about it to everyone he met. As such, he had no intention of upsetting the man he worshipped, there is that. Well, since Momon Summer vouched for her, I guess it'll be fine. I think so too. If we treat a friend of Momon Dono poorly, I don't think it'll turn out well. I guess all we can do is avoid rocking the boat. Anyway, let me know if anything else comes up. A yup. I'm heading back to my work too. Enri drove the wagon with her back to the gate of E. Rantle's city gate, wondering what on earth had just happened. It would seem that man in the jet black armor, she remembered that he was one of the adventurers who had come to Kani village with Nferia to pick herbs, had helped her out of a tight spot. By right, she should have immediately gone to thank him, but unfortunately she had lost sight of him once she entered the city. If I thank him the next time we meet, will he forgive me? Although she was thinking that she should immediately start searching for him once she had the time, there were reasons why she could not. Those reasons currently troubled her, the only thing that put her heart at ease was feeling something through the barrier of her clothes. The horn of the goblin something or other. This. This is worth several thousand gold coins? No way. Please tell me that's not true. She suddenly broke out in a cold sweat. She had not expected the horns she had been given so casually to be so valuable. No, Nfeya had said it was a high-end magic item. But the amount was beyond her imagination. Is it all right for me to use this item? Will it be okay? If she was asked to return the other one she had already used, what should she do? I'll need several thousand urns of herbs. I might not be able to afford it in a lifetime of picking herbs. In addition, she had another item worth thousands of gold coins. Is Gown Summer a man who can give out such items so easily? Or maybe, he didn't know its value. No way, there's no way someone like him wouldn't know. But, if he didn't know. Henry's stomach rumbled and ached, she looked around her surroundings in suspicion. There were not many people around, but it was still several times more than in Kani village. Distasteful thoughts like is anyone planning to steal this horn? Rose up in her mind. If only I hadn't brought it out. There's a lot of crime here, right? What if the horn got stolen? Hang on. If the horn was blown and goblins showed up to make trouble, wouldn't that make me the criminal? Just as the cold sweat was pooling around Enri, a person descended upon the seat next to hers. The way she landed like a feather in defiance of gravity must have been magic. Who? As the surprise of seeing the newcomer faded, an even bigger surprise was awaiting her. She was a raven-haired beauty whose face could launch a thousand ships. She was the one who had come with the black-armored adventurer to her village. Her ice-cold eyes resembled onyxes as they turned to Enri. Inferior creature, gadfly. Momon San wanted me to ask you a few questions. So pretty. Flattery will get. As pretty as Lupus Regina. As she saw the consternation in the eyes which were looking at her, Enri immediately regretted the stupid things she had said. She probably did not even know about Lupus Regina. However, there was nobody else who could even come close to the beautiful adventurer before her eyes. What should I do, I've upset her. Well, that much is clear, but... A.R. Lupus Regina is a very pretty person in my village. Thank you. A. Her eyes were hard, and so was her voice, 
and even her eyebrows were strained. But the thanks she had given was genuine. Ha! Moment, sir, N has some things to ask you, which is why I came. Answer me. Why are you here? Henry had no obligation to answer. However, this was the partner of someone who had helped her. If he wanted to know, then she should answer. Ah, well, before that, can I ask a favor of you? Moment San helped me earlier, and I'm very, very grateful. Please tell him that. I will do so. So why are you here? Ah, yes, I, I'm here, because there's a lot of things that need to be done, for instance, selling the herbs. The woman gestured with her chin, indicating that Henry should continue speaking. Then, I'll go to the temple, to see if there's anyone who wants to move to our village to live. And then I need to go to the Adventurer's Guild to talk about some things. And I need to buy some things we can't get in the village, like weapons. Something like that. I see. I understand what you've said. I will relay it to Moment San. With ethereally graceful movements which seemed independent of gravity, the woman alighted from the wagon, and left without looking back. Henry's impression of her was that of a frozen hurricane which tore people apart. She's an amazing woman. She feels dozens of times more powerful than Britta San. There were no girls in the village like her. Had she become an adventurer because her personality was like that, or had being an adventurer made her personality that way? She suddenly did not feel too keen about visiting the Adventurers Guild. Ah, oh no. Nabe was a powerful adventurer, but Henry had only noticed after she had vanished. In addition, she was the partner of the man who had subdued the wise king of the forest. She might have been able to tell Henry about what was going on in the forest. The giant of the east and the serpent of the west, and whatever that monument of destruction is. If only I had asked her about all of those. Ah, oh, I'm such a dummy, why didn't I think of that earlier? Henry drove her wagon through a gate while scolding herself for her carelessness. Erantel could be roughly divided into three zones, separated by the walls of the city. The middle zone was where people lived. It was also where the Adventurers Guild could be found. Ideally, it would have been safest to sell the herbs at the Herbalists' Guild. However, that would have involved a lot of troublesome paperwork, so she had chosen to go to the Adventurers' Guild instead to use them as a go-between. She had considered drawing on Lizzie's help for this, but Henry had decided that using her best friend's grandmother's name would be too shameless, and reconsidered. After taking Henry's wishes into consideration, Furia had suggested going to the Adventurers' Guild. If Nferia had come in person, they would not have needed to use the guild and he have sold everything directly. However, Henry was not confident about dealing with the sharks in the herbalist's guild, so she had decided not to begrudge the service charge and use the adventurer's guild as a go-between. Henry headed down the road Nferia and Britta had told her about. Although she had been travelling with the goblins on the way to the city, they were currently waiting outside the city for Henry to finish her business. She realized that this was the first time she was alone ever since she had set out from the village, and her hands gripped the reins even more tightly. The tension stiffened Henry's shoulders. Finally, unable to stand it any longer, she looked around in all directions and her destination was in front of her. I did it. Henry squeaked in joy. Now that she had gotten all the way here, she probably would not get lost. She handed the reins of her wagon to the sentry standing at the door of the Adventurer's Guild, and pushed open the door. Inside, warriors in full-plate armor, hunters with bows on their backs, and magic casters both arcane and divine were walking around. Some were enthusiastically swapping information about the monsters nearby, others were looking closely at the parchments on the nearby notice board, and a few were getting a feel for their newly purchased gear. The place was filled with a heat and activity that made Henry unsteady on her feet, a world of unrelenting scrutiny and tension. This was the world of adventurers. Henry's mouth dropped open as she beheld a sight she would never see in her village, then hurriedly shut it back up. It was true that she hailed from the boondocks, and it was hardly shameful for her to be startled by the mood of the big city. Still, a girl of her age staring dumbly with her mouth open was just embarrassing. 
Henry set out, her back ramrod straight, consciously checking her movement so that she did not move the arms and legs on the same side of her or do anything which would invite laughter. However, Henry started to have her doubts about whether it was all right for an obviously out-of-place village girl to be strolling so boldly among these muscular adventurers. At the counter, she was welcomed by the receptionist's smile. Welcome. Why yes, I've been welcomed. Henry locked eyes with the receptionist. Following which, the two of them smiled bitterly. Henry felt her shoulders relax, for what might have been the first time since she came to E. Rantle. Then, may I ask what business you have with the Adventurers Guild? Mm. Ah, first, I'd like to ask for some help with the sale of herbs. Understood. Where are the herbs now? Henry told her they were on the wagon outside, and the receptionist turned to speak to a woman beside her. The appraiser is going to check it now, please wait within the guild until he's done. Understood. Then, another thing. Although we won't be putting out a request right away, we might do so in the future. Henry explained the situation to the smiling receptionist. The other woman's smile became stiff as she heard Henry's story. Is that so? I'm just a receptionist, and I don't decide the difficulty of requests, but if it involves the wise king of the forest, it might be a task that only the adamantite-ranked moment San can handle. In that case, the fees would be very expensive. There seemed to have been a shift in the receptionist's mood. She seemed entirely unmotivated, as though she had decided it was pointless even after sitting through all that, what a pain. While living with the goblins, Henry had become adept at reading the emotions of others. Goblins were ugly and looked very different from humans, but she had worked hard to recognize and deduce the changes in their feelings. In this way, Henry had grown. She must be thinking the village doesn't have that much money, huh? Well, given my clothes, it's a reasonable conclusion to make. And she is pretty well dressed, after all. Henry briefly compared her clothes to those of the receptionist, and concluded that fashion-wise, she was completely outclassed. But clothes like those are wasted on working in the village, and they're far too cumbersome to work in besides. Thus, according to Henry the woman, this battle was a draw. Ah, I heard the city would provide a subsidy. That's correct. However, the subsidy is only a portion of the fee, and you'll have to pay the rest yourself. Adamantite-ranked adventurers are very expensive, and even after the subsidy they'll still cost a lot of money to hire. Of course, you could offer less money for a request, but the Adventurers Guild might not allow it. If you offer less money than the stipulated amount, your request will be a low priority, so there may be no takers. Please take that into consideration. She must have memorized the regulations, given the way she had fluently rattled all that off with her eyes glazed over. It would seem the receptionist was treating Henry like a customer who was not buying anything, that's only natural. A customer who doesn't spend money isn't a customer at all. Everything the receptionist had said was turning out like Han Feuer predicted, so she did not feel too upset. It was a reality that nobody would help the weak. That's why Ein's all gown summer is our savior. He even gave a simple village girl like me a valuable treasure like that. She wondered how the receptionist would react if she used this horn as payment. It would be great to see the look on her face, but Henry knew she could not do such a thing. This item had been given to her by that great magic caster with the instruction to use it to protect yourself. She could not sell it off, not even for the village's sake. She could not be that ungrateful. And so, Henry nodded. I understand. Then, please tell me how much the fees will be. That way I can go back to the village to discuss things. I see. Then how about this? Please come back after the inspection for the herb sales are done. We should have finished calculating the request fees by then. After thanking the receptionist, Henry left the counter and sat on a sofa in the lounge, staring at the ceiling to while away the time while the inspection dragged on. So tired. Every moment since she'd entered the city gates had been a grand adventure. Or rather, when she thought about it, ever since the day her parents had died, every day had set her eyes spinning. All I wanted was to lead a simple, unchanging life in the village. 
As she thought about the things she had lost, Henry sighed. She thought about what had happened after that, the goblins, her childhood friend, and then she shook her head. Can't they go any faster? If she had something to do, she would not have the free time to think about such depressing things. She would rather empty her mind and focus on work than think about things that made her sad. Emmett San, the appraisal is complete. Henry rose and headed for the sound of the merchant's voice, Thank, thank you very much. The fee is. At this moment, Henry heard the sound of someone striding, no, practically sprinting over to her. As she turned, she saw the receptionist from earlier in front of her. Ha, ha, Henry San of Kearney Village. No, I mean, Henry Summer. Could I have a bit to discuss the matter from just now with you? This was the same receptionist from just now, but her attitude was completely different. Even her eyes were bloodshot. Ah, I'm sorry, but I was just about to tell her about the results of the appraisal. You shut up, I'm talking here. The receptionist's reply made the merchant's face twitch. If it's all right with you, would you like to discuss this over a drink in the receiving room? She was smiling, but the smile did not reach her eyes. There was a strange, desperate look in them. Perhaps she had sensed something from the confused Henry. The receptionist's eyes were moist, and her hands were clasped together as though in prayer. Please, I'm begging you, you have to let me hear you out. If not, I'll be done for. After hearing that desperate, almost pathetic plea, Henry had no idea what was going on, but not to giving her a chance would be too cruel. She glanced back to the merchant, who seemed to pick up on her intentions, because he nodded slightly to her. Got, got it. Then, could you show me the way? In that moment, the receptionist's body visibly relaxed. Thank you very much. Really, thank you very much. Come, come, let me show you the way. Henry followed after her, bathed in the curious stares of everyone around. The receptionist was tightly gripping her right hand, as though she did not want Henry to escape. Was I too rash? She entered the waiting room, traces of unease in her heart. Henry silently looked around the inside of the room. There was nobody in there besides herself, and it was intricately decorated, to the point where she had doubts about even sitting on the sofa. Come, come, please, have a seat. The moment she sat down, a voice from the corner of her mind wondered if she would be imprisoned or meet some other, similar fate. However, nothing happened when she sat on the sofa. All she felt was the comfortable furniture taking her body weight. Would you like something to drink? We have some excellent liquor. How about food? Too early? Yes, kind of. How about fruits? No, sweets and desserts, maybe? Ah, there's no need to go to that extent. The dramatic change in the receptionist's attitude was starting to scare Henry. In the first place, she had not considered the receptionist's treatment of her to have been particularly cold. It had been a reasonable enough reaction, and not really negative. At the very least, it seemed much more normal than she did now. But why had this leopard changed its spots? Was it because of the horn again? No, no, what are you saying? Anything is possible for you. We can provide liquor, brandy, and the snacks to go with them too, no there's really no need. And besides, I'm running out of time. Can we start discussing the matter? Certainly. You're absolutely right. Then please, by all means, do continue. The receptionist whipped out a sheet of thin, white paper. All the paper she had seen before had been much thicker and had other colors mixed in. This must be some high-class stuff here. Was it really all right to use it? Henry began speaking. She had only given a brief outline just now, so she had to patiently explain the details this time round. Eventually, just as Henry's throat was starting to dry out, the conversation finally came to an end. Thank you for your help. There's some drinks here, please help yourself before you leave. It's fine to leave the cups here, but thank you for coming to us today. The receptionist suddenly stood up, and left the room as though she had been chased from it. Really. What happened? Of course, there was nobody here to answer her muttered question. 
In the end, Henry did not spend the night in E-Rantle, but headed back to Kearney village. She would be sleeping on the plains, but she did not feel uneasy. On the contrary, she had a very good night's sleep. That was because unlike her journey to the city, she had a group of passengers riding with her this time round. Ah, oh, I see it at last. Before her stood the wall of Kearney village. Although the neatly arranged logs looked impressive in their own right, Henry could not help but think they looked shabby compared to E. Rantel's fortifications. That's right. I need to report all this to the chief quickly. Henry was replying to one of the goblins in the bed of the wagon. Five goblins had escorted Henry to E. Rantel, including the goblin cleric, Kona, and there was a goblin rider, Chosyuk, maintaining a vigil some distance away from her wagon. Well, half the problems have been dealt with, but apparently the chief's request of you didn't go too well, did it, and San? Yes, about that. According to the priest San, almost nobody wants to move to the village, that's strange. I mean, there's already other immigrants from other villages here. Why aren't there more people? Was the priest lying? No, a priest would never lie, Henry smiled bitterly. To be honest, frontier villages are pretty dangerous, so they're keeping their distance. We were hoping for a bunch of third sons who'd come here for the promise of land. But not many people will come here if they aren't ordered to. And the people who moved here in the beginning had lived in frontier villages like us. Their situations are different. Is that so? That's how it is. But actually, that kind of relieves me. It would probably be very difficult for normal people to form a good relationship with goblins and live with them in the same village. Any immigrants from the city would probably blanch at the sight and do their best to stay away. And frankly speaking, if Henry were forced to choose between the city dwellers and the goblins, she would choose the goblins without hesitation. At this moment, the wagon shook, and the sound of something metallic hitting the wagon bed rang out from behind her. Ah, sorry. Are you all right? Henry turned her head to look behind. Although the goblins were seated on the floor of the wagon, there were some sacks there, one of which made the metallic noise when the wagon shook. Ah, we're fine, and San. No need to worry. Speaking of which, with this many arrows, we'll be able to hunt to our heart's content. The goblins looked so happy when they looked at the bag that Henry forgot to reply to them, simply smiling instead. They crossed the wheat fields, and entered a half-opened gate. After greeting everyone, Henry drove the wagon to their original meeting point, in order to unload the cargo. As she stopped the wagon at the meeting point, the goblins within, having heard the wagon, streamed out to greet her. Oh! Welcome back, Ansan. I'm glad nothing happened. Henry smiled. Their welcome was what made Henry feel that she had really returned to the village, because to her, the goblins were part of her family. I'm home. That's a lot of stuff. Are you bringing it inside? That's right, bro. Do me a favor and lend me a hand. Coming. The goblins moved as one, deftly unloading the cargo. No matter how Henry directed them, they tugged everything without making a mistake until everything was squared away. This was the proof of how much the goblins had integrated themselves into village life. Ah, and San, let us handle the rest. Why don't you go meet your sister and Arnie San? Although I don't know if Arnie San's still helping with the goose people. Thank you, but I still need to report to the chief first. Really? Got it. Then, just to be safe, I'll come with you. After all, there's still the matter of the ogres. Goku spoke to some of his comrades after leaving the meeting place, and then he hopped up onto the wagon beside Enri, who was driving. The other goblins who had been guarding Enri on the road to E. Rantel looked at him with jealousy in their eyes, but none of them actually voiced any opposition. It was probably because they agreed he was doing the right thing. Then, and San, let's go. Enri smiled faintly and said, I'm counting on you guys. And thank you very much. After thanking the goblins, she spurred her horse into motion. So, what happened in the village since I left? Nothing special. The big thing was that we built a place where the ogres could stay inside the village. Of course, 
The stone golems did most of the work, and it was pretty crudely made out of wood, but in the end, it ended up being a pretty nice place. However, we can't do anything about their smell. Even the towels we give them end up stinking. I see. Still, that was really fast. Like I said, the stone golems did most of the work. If you want to thank someone, thank the magic caster who gave them to us. And Lupus Regina San, right? Let's not talk about that Lupus Regina person for now. I don't want to thank her or anything. Something about her just pisses me off. Henry found it hard to believe her ears. This was the first time Goku had ever spoken ill of someone. How should I put it? She's very scary, like a monster watching us. I don't think An San sensed it yet. But she's the maid of the one who saved our village, Ein's Gown, so she can't be that bad. Ah, what a pain Sue. Enri and Goku's shoulders twitched. That was the voice of the woman they had just been discussing. Enri looked back frantically, and just like the day before, the maid was sitting on the wagon bed like she belonged there. Really, you're such a pain, En Chan. Ah, what do you mean? Maybe, maybe before that, you should tell us how you appear out of nowhere. Hmm. It's simple, Sue. I fell out of the sky, Sue. That's not going to fly. There's quite a few times you've come from above now, but we couldn't sense you. I can make myself invisible, Sue. I'm trying to be subtle, Sue. See how nice I am. Goku turned his face to the front once more. There was irritation written all over it. But, ah, uh, yes. It's kind of rare that we get to see you two days in a row, Lupus Regina-san. Did something happen? Lupus Regina glared at Enri. Enri could not help but think, a beautiful person is pretty even when she makes a face like that. Well, kind of. Boo at anyway, I was just wondering what was going on Sue. Speaking of which, what happened to that miniature gobo of yours? He's fine. I think he should be in the chief's house. Why the chief's house? Ah, because we rescued a few more goblins from his tribe. They're staying there while we build a place for the goblins to stay in the village. Ah, yeah, it kind of makes sense, Agu's the son of his tribe's chief. He must feel like he has a duty to protect them or something. Really, he's just a kid but he's so mature. Although Lupus Regina was just smiling lightly, anyone who saw her looks would be captivated by the charm radiating from her. Even Enri found herself looking at her in admiration despite the fact that they were both women. Oops, shouldn't you be watching your front instead? That, that's right. Enri hastily looked to her front once more, the tips of her ears bright red. After stopping in front of the chief's house, Enri and Goku got off the wagon. Then, I'll bring the horse back to the stable Sue. Don't feel like disturbing you guys. Let me know what you guys talked about afterward. I understand. Then, I'm sorry for imposing, but I'll leave this you. Enri bowed to Lupus Regina, who replied with a hoy hoy and a smile before driving the wagon off. Enri knocked on the door, announced herself loudly enough for everyone inside to hear, and opened the door. The chief and Agu were facing each other across a table. Oh, welcome back. Please, have a seat. How are things in the city? As the chief spoke, Enri sat herself beside Agu. For a moment Agu's body seemed to go stiff, but she must have just been imagining things. Ah, then, that's it for me. In that case, chief, please take care of us. Enri had no idea who those words were meant for. Since the only others present were Enri, Goku and the chief, it seemed obvious that they had been intended for the village chief. However, Agu had been looking at her, with a stiff back and pursed lips. Enri looked into Agu's eyes, and in his steadfast, unblinking gaze, she realized that he was not kidding or playing a trick. A, A? Why did it have to be her? Amidst Enri's confusion, Agu excused himself and left the chief's home. Hey! Wait! Then, Enri, can you tell me about it? A? No, that. This. Ah, yes. I get it. It weighed heavily on her mind, but she could clear up her doubts later. 
the report was more important for now. After deciding that, Henry clearly and concisely related the events that had occurred in the city. The most important part was that nobody wanted to move to Kani village. However, the chief seemed to have anticipated this, because there was no regret on his face, only calm acceptance, so that's how it is. Well, it can't be helped. We're a frontier village and monsters appear frequently around these parts, so it makes sense that hardly anyone would want to come here. The village chief said what Henry had been thinking. It might have well been what everyone in the village had already accepted. You've done a lot for us. Thank you. The chief lowered his head, and Henry said, It's all right, in return. It had been confusing at times, but it had also been a good experience. Then, the chief's line of sight flickered to Goku for a second. There is one thing I would like to entrust to you, Henry Emmett. Ah, oh, yes. What is it? You're being so serious, chief. I hope you will carry on in my position as village chief. The sheer variety of expressions that flashed across Henry's face was like a piece of performance art. Huh? What, what is this? Hey! Don't tell me Agu was saying those. Eh? You getting flustered won't help. Don't interrupt me when I'm flustered. Chief, are you retarded? Why are you saying this? Maybe retarded is a bit much, I understand you're excited and nervous about this, I know that much, but I'm hoping you can calm down and listen to me. Calm down, how can I calm down? I'm just a simple village girl, why do I have to deal with this village chief crap? Get a hold of yourself. The voice was full of power, but to Henry it was just a little loud. Even so, it helped her regain a bit of her composure. No, if she didn't listen to the chief, she'd never make sense of things, or at least that was what part of her was thinking. I understand that you're very confused. However, I hope you can sit down and consider things with a calmly. For starters, who is the heart of the village? Isn't that you, Chief San? That would be incorrect. I feel that you are the heart of the village. The goblins and the newly arrived ogres all acknowledge you as their leader, right? That's correct. Everything we do revolves around An San. Then, there's the goblins you helped, from what Agus told me, they also see you as the boss. Henry's mouth turned into the shape of a lambda dot it might be true that the goblins were that way, but what would the villagers think? They would never accept this. I can guess at what you're thinking. The villagers will object, is that it? I've already spoken with everyone and gotten their approval. Last night, we had a meeting of the villagers and got their opinions. And it was unanimous, they all wanted you to be the new chief. What? Why? That attack was a huge shock for all of us, Henry. Everybody is hoping for a strong leader. How am I strong? I'm just a simple village girl. Although there was some muscle on her arms, she was still a village girl who could barely use a weapon. If they wanted strength, surely they should have picked from among the members of the security force, no. Strength is not measured by one's courage alone. Don't you think being able to order the goblins around is a form of strength too? The bears both think you're suitable as village chief too, Infi. Henry sounded like a chicken being strangled to death. That, and I'm getting on in years. I need to find a successor soon. What do you mean, getting on in years? You aren't anywhere near old, chief. Is that why you've been talking like an old man? The chief was around his mid-forties, so it was still a bit early to be calling him old. After all, he was still at an age where he could work. Leaving aside the matter of talking like an old man, you should have noticed by now, but the forest around the village is undergoing a number of changes. Since the wise king of the forest is gone, there's a higher chance of monsters coming out of the forest to attack. All I can do is use my experiences of when the village was safe to lead us, but that won't do. Chief, this may be rude, but I need to ask. You're just trying to run away from this, aren't you? Let me be frank. I cannot say that you're wrong. What Henry saw was the eyes of a man who was honestly speaking his mind. I still remember that day even now. 
that horrible day when my friends in the village were killed. I knew the Emmets well. If we hadn't lived idly, if we had built a wall, if we had been on guard, maybe we wouldn't have suffered so much. Maybe we could have held out until Gan Summer came to help us. That would be tough, Henry thought. This village also had a lot of immigrants who were survivors from the other destroyed villages. Their villages had sturdy walls, though not as strong as Kani villages were now, but they had still been attacked and slaughtered. But those walls could have delayed the attackers by just a little bit and allowed more people to be saved. Henry agreed on that part. The old way of thinking I had isn't going to work anymore. We need to reorganize and protect the village's safety with our own hands. The only ones who can do this are the flexible and the young. And those people need strength as well. The chief had said his piece. He looked calmly at Henry. Henry listened to the chief's words and seriously considered them. At first, she wanted to refuse because the burden was too heavy. If they were attacked just like that time, she was not sure that she could bear responsibility for the lives of her fellow villagers. However, like she had told the chief just now, was that not just running away from the problem? I don't know if I can handle this big responsibility. That's a natural reaction. I can help with the administration of the village, and the goblins will support you on the security issues. Even so, making the final decision is still scary. What about a council formed from the villagers? To be frank, I'd thought of that myself. However, the bigger the problem, the more likely something will come up that will split up the group and leave them paralyzed by indecision. In the end, without one person calling the shots, we won't be able to solve problems effectively. What if we had two systems, one for dealing with things in normal situations and the other for emergencies? That won't work, it won't nurture our leaders. The people will follow their leaders in emergencies and work together because they know those leaders are also capable in peacetime. The chief's will was firm and he had explained his reasons. With a sour expression, Henry asked her final question. When do you need my answer? I won't rush you for it. Take your time and consider it. I understand. After Henry said that, she stood and left. As she left the chief's house, Goku followed behind Henry. Say, I want to think about this. Could you let me be alone for a bit? Got it, and San. Then, take your time and think about it. The rest of us will back you up, and San. If you need anything at all, just let us know. Yeah, I'll be counting on you then. After watching Goku leave, Enri returned to her own home. Can I be a good chief? Enri did not think so. Who knew, when the time came, she might have to give an order she did not like, sacrificing the few for the greater good. I can't do that at all. Everyone in the village thinks too highly of me. For starters, there's the goblins that everyone says are my strength. They aren't even allies I made with my own charisma and connections. In the end, they were merely summoned from the horn given to me by the great magic caster Ein's Ul Gaon. That item was the first bit of good fortune the village received. Strange, was I the first person he helped? I do remember Gan Summer in a mask. Hmm? Was he wearing a mask? The sequence of events suddenly seemed muddled up to her, but that was only to be expected given the chaos of the situation. Henry shook her head to clear out her doubts. In any case, if the horn had been given to anyone else, that person would have been the next chief, not herself. Which meant that the problem was not a matter of Henry's own competence, but simply that destiny had decided to drop this burden on her lap. I should talk to someone about this. The first person who came to Henry's mind was Inferia. He had lived in the big city before, seen a lot of people, and Henry felt that he would know if she could be the next chief. And he was widely read, so he would definitely be able to give her an answer. However, the chief had said that Inferia, or rather, the bears, had approved of her succession. That meant that even if she talked with Inferia, it was very likely that he would recommend she take the position. He won't do. And neither will any of the villagers. That leaves Agu and the ogres, but Agu already thinks of me as the chief, and the ogres are just plain dumb. 
At this moment, someone called out to the frowning Enri with a cheerful voice. You seems like you're done talking. Oyan Tilda? What's wrong Sue, you've got a strange look on your face? Problem, Enri? That voice made Enri jerk up, as though electricity were coursing through her skin. That's right. She was an outsider to the village, a neutral third party who could calmly and logically assess the situation. Enri ran toward Lupus Regina with all her strength. Lupus Regina San. She tightly clutched the surprised maid's shoulders. What 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 what's this? Oh no my heart's beating so fast. But please don't confess to me. I'm not a lesbian, I like the opposite sex. No let me go I'm going to be raped Sue. Wait. Please, wait a bit. Enri's hands left her shoulders, because she was planning to cover Lupus Regina's mouth. But Lupus Regina nimbly slipped out of Enri's grasp and smiled to her. Ah, sorry, sorry, but you seemed so excited, I thought I needed to cool you down a bit. It was just a joke Sue. It's a really bad joke. Enri sagged her shoulders. However, she immediately recovered again. Lupus Regina was a person who came and went as she pleased, and if she did not take this opportunity to pin her down she would vanish again. Please hear me out. I need an idea on what to do next. I don't know what you're talking about, but we can talk while we walk, right? I don't want the villagers to look at me strangely. Enri's face turned bright red. Lupus Regina had a point there. However. Then don't scream about being raped or anything. Tehe. Lupus Regina stuck her tongue out at Enri in an adorable way. Really, really, Lupus Regina San. Come, come, let's go, let's go. Without waiting for an answer, Lupus Regina set off, and Enri followed. Well, come lay your problems onto Lupus Regina one eason, I can teach you all sorts of things from etchy things to seducing men. Ah, is that right? Lupus Regina San, you must be really mature. To Enri, who knew nothing about such matters, she certainly seemed adult enough. There was no obvious change, but for some reason Lupus Regina seemed to look more mature now. He he, that's because I'm a Mimidoshima, for, after all Sue. Huh? What does Mimidoshima mean? As Enri pondered the strange term, Lupus Regina beckoned her over with a come-hither gesture, indicating that she should ask her questions. Enri began telling her about what had happened in the chief's house. So, what should I do? Hmm. Beats me. That was all. Hey, didn't you say I could lay my problems on you? I never said I'd answer them, did I? Hmm, well, we're Tevs. To begin with, if you're being pushed into this position and you know you're going to regret it, then you'd better not take it on to begin with. Think about what kind of things you can and can't handle. The usual carefree girl was gone, and in her place was a haunting, bewitching beauty. The usually wide-open eyes were narrowed, and her thin smile sent a chill down her spine. This is just my opinion anyways, I'm not telling you what to do or anything. You should sit down and think carefully on this. Let me be frank, it doesn't matter if you or someone else is the chief, whoever does it is going to mess up sooner or later. There's only 41 people I know who'll never make a mistake. So, there's no point worrying about what happens when you fail. But when you think about it calmly, nobody's better suited to the job than you. What do you mean? Ask the gobs. When the village is attacked by scary monsters and they know they can't win, what happens? Imagine the situation with yourself as the chief and yourself not being the chief. Lupus Regina's expression changed again, and she was back to her cheerful self. Ah, this is boring. Ha, huh, this doesn't suit my tastes at all. Ah, it would be more fun if you didn't become the chief and a great tragedy befell the village, Enchan Tilda. Eh? He he. Lupus Regina smirked as she patted Enri's shoulder. Personally, I think you'd make a great chief, Enchan also. Why don't you ask that boy over there? After taking her hand off Enri's shoulder, Lupus Regina twirled in place. It was a movement that seemed estranged from any concept of the word friction. See ya then. Lupus Regina strode off, her hands fluttering through the air. 
In front of her stood Nferia with Nemu's hand in his. Lupus Regina patted Nferia on the shoulder, and as though she had flipped a switch, the two came to life. You're home, only Chan. Nemu must have been very worried, because she tackle-hugged Enri while running at full speed. For a moment, Enri thought she might be knocked down, but her sturdy leg muscles absorbed the impact. Welcome home, Enri. You're earlier than expected. Didn't spend the night? I'm back, you too. And yes, I camped out last night. Is that so? I'm glad you weren't attacked by monsters. Still, I can't approve of that sort of thing. The goblins are strong. But there's still monsters who are stronger than them. Granted, I haven't seen any of those near the plains. Nasan, don't do dangerous things. Nemu said this while clinging tightly to Enri's clothes. Enri was the sole surviving family member her little sister had. Her life was no longer solely hers. It would seem she had forgotten that little detail. You're right. I'm sorry. Enri smiled and gently ruffled Nemu's hair. Hmm. I forgive you. Nemu looked up and smiled. Thank you. Speaking of which, have you been a good girl, Nemu? You didn't give Enfi trouble, did you? Really only Chan. I'm not a little girl anymore. Right, Enfi Kun? Aha uh ha. Well, I've been treating the Goose tribes people, so I didn't look too closely, but I trust Nemu behaved herself. Really, you too, Enfi Kun? Say, did you know, Nei Chan? Enfi Kun stinks. Nemu Chan. That's the smell of herbs. When you grind them up, didn't you say your hands stank as well? That colorful stuff is from herbs. No, it's different. That's from making alchemical items, so don't make it sound like I stink or anything. But you do stink, don't you, Enfi Kun? Faya's face froze. Hmm, it's all over your work clothes, Enfi. So maybe you should take them off when you're not working. Enri frantically tried to explain her little sister's actual meaning, and Nferia's face softened as he heard it. I don't have any other clothes, though. In e Rantel, I pretty much wore those all the time. Then, what if I made a set for you afterward? Eh? You can do that. Infi, who do you think I am? I can still make simple clothes on my own. Is that it? I bought all my clothes, so being able to make your own sounds awesome. Well, thanks for that. But everyone in the village can. Nemu, you'd better start learning. K. Then, Nemu, do you mind heading back first? I need to discuss something with Infi. Nemu covered her mouth with her hands, but the smile was already making her eyes sparkle. Hmm. Got it. Then, I'll be going first. Do your best, Infi Kun. Nemu waved to them, then headed back home with a spring in her step. Enri watched her back as she left, mumbling to herself. Why is she so obedient? Are you hiding anything from me? No, I don't think. There's more important things than that. Were you going to tell me something? Although I can roughly guess, since I was at the village meeting yesterday. That being the case, they could skip a lot of pointless exposition. Enri told Inferia what she and the chief had discussed. That was not all she also told him all about her uneasiness and her discussion with Lupus Regina. After she finished, Nferia looked Enri straight in the eye. And spoke. I think you should do what you think is right, Enri. No matter what your answer is, I'll always support you. Ugh, that line is so cheesy. I hope you'll become the new chief. Why? I'm just... No. You're not just a simple village girl. You're the leader of the goblins, Enri Emmett. You probably want to say that the goblins aren't your strength, right? But in the end, the goblins really are your strength. Lupus Regina asked you to ask the goblins, but I'll explain. If you're not the chief, and if the village is in danger, the goblins will evacuate you and only you if they still have the strength to fight. No way. They would never do such a thing they might say that in peacetime. However, during a crisis they'll do just that, I heard it from them myself. No way. Enri looked incredulously at Nferia. 
she felt he must be lying. Yet, she could not sense any falseness from around him. The most important thing to them isn't the village, it's you. But if you become the chief, then the village becomes your property, and the goblins will stay and fight for the village to the bitter end. It may not seem like a big difference, but it's enough of a difference. As an aside, they've told me that if an emergency like that happens, they're hoping I can take Nemu and flee behind you. Henry. If you want to check with them, it's fine. But I hope that if you do, you'll keep the fact that I told you about it a secret. I won't ask them. Nefaya lifted his hair up as he heard the straight, direct reply, revealing his wide eyes. Is that okay? I might be Lee. Impossible. You would never lie to me, Nefaya. I trust you. Still, they really do place a lot of important on their master, huh? Well, isn't that because you're their master, Henry? You bought weapons for the goblins, right? Don't you think they'd make you their top priority because of that? This may sound bad, but the goblins have never gotten anything from the villagers, who treat them as nothing more than your summoned monsters. One side doesn't treat them like individuals, while the other side does. Doesn't it make sense for them to favor the latter? Of course, none of the villagers would actually say that sort of thing out loud. However, it was true that she could not recall any of the villagers thanking them in any concrete way. But, the villagers occasionally make lunch for the goblins. That's a sign of their gratitude to you. It's like saying they'll pay food costs, or save you the trouble of preparing a meal. Have you ever seen anyone in the village call the goblins by name? She had not. At first she thought it was simply because they could not tell them apart, but perhaps they had never intended to tell them apart from the beginning. The thought of that filled Henry's heart with an indescribable loneliness. Is that so? Yet, in her voice was not simply dejection, but her eyes shone with the light of resolve. That's right, that's why I, personally, feel that you'll be a good chief. If nothing else, when you're chief, things will change for the goblins too. Everyone's going to help me, right? Of course. You might as well say nobody won't help you. I understand. Then, I'll head over to the chief's place. I'd better do it before I change my mind. Nefaya smiled as he heard Enri's declaration. His smile was gentle, yet stern. It was as though he understood that she was hoping for one last push in the back. All right. Good luck, Enri. She nodded in reply, and then without looking back, set foot on the path to becoming the new chief of Kani village. From the sky, Lupus Regina could see that almost everyone in the village was gathered in the village square. Enri walked to their head and addressed them, but she could not hear what Enri was saying. Enri appeared to have finished, and the villagers applauded. Ha! Huh. So it turned out like this after all. Ah, this is fun, I. What's so amusing? The voice from behind made Lupus Regina turn around to face it. Oya, if it isn't Yuri Ney. Are you flying because of a magic item? That's right. Ein Summer bestowed it upon me himself. This would be... Kani village, right. That would be why you were scolded. That's right Sue. Ah, now the real fun's about to begin. What do you mean? A new leader has just arisen within the village. To the villagers, they're about to turn to a new page in their history, to a new world of possibilities. However, I wonder what would happen if, right at this glorious moment, the village was attacked and everything was lost in a great blaze. I wonder what kind of faces those villagers would make. Her cheery and beautiful face cracked open, and something flowed out from within that could only be described as evil, and I thought you got along with these people. Is this coming from the bottom of your heart? That's right, Yuri Ney I mean every word of it. I gives me a thrill every time I think of the people I get along with being brutally trampled like bugs. You're a complete sadist. You're as bad as solution. Why are my little sisters like this? My only salvation is Shizu, honestly. Although I suppose Entema isn't a bad girl. Lupus Regina laughed as her older sister grumbled and knit her brows. Ah will the village be destroyed after all? 4. Ah, I'm so tired. 
Henry dumped the small slate she was holding on the table and flopped down, devoid of energy. She heard quiet laughter, and when she turned to look at its source, she saw her teacher, Furrier, there with a smile on his face. You've worked hard, Henry. It's so hard I'm not good at using my head. You need to learn how to read and write, you know. Henry's reply was a mournful whine, she needed a basic level of education as the village chief, which was why Inferia was personally instructing her, but Henry's head felt like it was splitting apart. These stupid words, they were made up just to give me trouble. Don't say that. You've already learned how to write your own name, haven't you? And Nemu Chan's as well. Hmm. Well, that is a good thing. Can't I get by with just that much? Alas. These are merely the basics. Look at it this way, you've only started learning for five days, we haven't even reached the important parts yet. A look which said are you kidding me appeared on Enri's face. Ah, don't make a face like that. Once you learn the basics, all that's left is applying them. That's why they're so important. Ooh. You look really tired. Then, we'll stop here for today. Henry sprang up from her seat as though she had been waiting for him to say just that. That's wonderful. Let's end early tomorrow too. Thank you, Infi. Nfeya smiled thinly before wiping the chicken scratch like letters off the slate. Then you'd best get a good rest. Tomorrow we'll start again at the same time. I'm really happy that you're using your experiment time to teach me all this. But I don't feel grateful at all. Hmm. Well, that's how it is. They say it's better for a teacher to be hated by their students than to be thanked by them. That's a lie. It's a total lie. Ah ha ha ha. Ah, I'm out of time. Good night, Henry. Hmm. Good night. Don't work too hard when you get back and sleep early. Dufaya smiled to show he understood, and then he left through the front door. After watching the floating moat of his magical light recede into the distance, Henry returned to her house. In the darkness, it felt especially lonely. Ah, I'm so tired. Henry lazily stripped off her clothing and burrowed under the covers. She had been so noisy when learning just now, but now all she could hear were the cute sounds of her little sister sleeping. Henry quietly closed her eyes, having worked her brain so hard earlier, Henry was certain she would fall asleep right away. Just as she expected, she passed out within seconds of closing her eyes. She did not know how long she had slept, but a distant sound woke her from her slumber. Three knocks. A pause, and then three more knocks. Henry realized what that rhythm meant, and so she forced her eyes open in the darkness. Her mind woke with abnormal speed and realized she was still at home, and so she practically leapt out of bed. In the same moment, her sister bolted awake too. Are you all right? Hmm. Her voice had an undertone of fear in it, but it sounded like she could still move. Get ready now. Hmm. Lighting a lamp would waste too much time, so Henry prepared herself to flee in the dark. As the sound of the bells carried over the wind, Henry and Nemo readied themselves swiftly. Theirs was a speed born not just of repeated evacuation drills, but of the old terror that remained from when their village had been attacked in the past, and after hearing Agu's words, she had an idea of what was coming. Nemu. Get to the rendezvous point. I'll take care of my end. Without waiting for her sister's answer, Enri grabbed Nemu's hand and ran out the door. The bell was still ringing loudly, which meant there was an emergency situation. In addition, it signaled that they were definitely under attack. A corner of her heart still hoped that this was just one of many training exercises, but the chill in the air denied that. It was the same chill she had felt when the soldiers attacked the village. As they neared the rendezvous point, Henry pushed Nemu forward. All right, go. Nemu nodded very slightly in reply, and then dashed toward the meeting place without looking back. After doing that, Henry was briefly filled with the impulse to follow her, to make sure she at least got into the shelter before leaving. However, as a day's old village chief, Henry had to consider how she would move the whole village. If I hadn't been appointed, 
or if I'd been appointed for a long time. Those feelings now flowed out uncontrollably from her heart, it's as though some evil god wants to see us suffer. Without thinking, Henry let the words slip out of her mouth. This was the worst possible timing for something like this to happen. And San. A goblin ran up to Henry. What happened? What's going on? We found monsters in the forest. High chance they'll be attacking us. Understood, now let's go. With the goblin leading the way, Henry soon came to the main gate. She saw that the nighttime barricades were set up and the goblins had gathered here. They looked like seasoned veterans in the weapons and armor Henry had bought for them. As she drew close she could scent a stink in the air, which clued Henry into the fact that there were ogres present. The ogres clutched their new clubs, which looked spiky and menacing. Henry and the goblin reached the main gate at the same time as a panting furrier and the members of the self-defense force led by Britta. In addition a goo and some of his fellow goblins, the ones whose minds recovered enough from their ordeal to fight, stood with them as well. Is that everyone? How about Lizzie San? Did something keep her? Nferia's grandmother Lizzie was a skill magic caster in her own right. By rights, she should have taken part in defending the main gate. No, Abarchan's not coming here. She's at the rendezvous point. That place is important too. The villagers nodded as they heard Nferia's words. Since their family members had fled to the rendezvous point, they had to keep it secure too. We've sent our guys who aren't good with bows over there. Since you guys are strong, can you spare someone to go over and keep their spirits up? We can't do that. Jugum flatly refused Britta's request. Jugum and the others had not done this out of malice toward the villagers whom he had lived and worked with. As the surging tension made Henry gulp, Jugum explained his position. There's a lot of monsters. And there are many other species in addition to ogres. Splitting up would be very dangerous. Do you have a clear picture of their numbers? Britta San, the enemy was lurking in the forest, there's no way to accurately judge their numbers. However, we did manage to get an estimate. Seven ogres, several giant snakes, several wags, several bargast-like shapes and something huge following behind them. Wags traveling giant snakes and ogres? Is there a druid behind them? Wags were magical beasts that looked like wolves, but bigger. They were smarter than wolves and bad news if you encountered them in the forest. It's very likely. Things will be really bad if they have a magic caster on their side. We can probably assume that they also have ranged attackers. So it would be better to marshal all our fighting power here, right? Should I call a Barchan over? That. Is hard to say, Arnie San. The rendezvous point is one of the most solid buildings in the village. If anything happens, it'll be the final defensive line or in other words, the villagers keep. We can't let anyone protecting that place leave. So we'll be falling back as we fight, then? Where should I be fighting? Britta San, you'll be directing the defense force, I hope you can clearly relay my orders to them, and do as the situation requires. So we'll use anti-invader strategy number two, then? After filling them with arrows, we'll use barricades to keep them at bay while we stab them through the gaps with spears. They won't need to aim at people, just keep stabbing. That's right, I'll leave that to you, then. However, wags and bar guests are very agile. If allowed to roam freely, they'll cause a lot of damage. Target them first. Also, when their druid shows up, would you mind falling back? I'm not opposed to that, but will you have enough people on the front if the defense force retreats? If we're lucky, we'll be enough. I see. As I thought, I'd better tell everyone here to be ready to die. At least, if we're in the back we won't be attacked, so we can concentrate ranged fire on the druid. You know, I've been an adventurer, but this is the first time I've seen such brave villagers. At least, I thought that much when I watched them train with bows, that's because the village was attacked in the past. And we hated how powerless we were. Henry, who had been silent up till now, chimed in with the sentiments of every member of the defense forces. The truth was, despite their pale faces, nobody here wanted to flee. 
they had to stand and fight, had to protect their village. After all, their friends and loved ones were behind them. Speaking of which, such a large force must have been gathered by a powerful being. Does this mean they've been sent by the giant of the east or the serpent of the west? That's not impossible. Jugum softly confirmed Britta's suspicions. If that was the case, it would mean Agu had drawn the monsters here. That was why Jugum had lowered his voice, so the defense force would not pick up on it and direct their aggression at Agu. They had already told the villagers about the giant of the east and the serpent of the west, as well as the fact that their power rivaled that of the wise king of the forest. Although the beast had been tamed by the dark hero, the mighty monster's form and presence had been etched indelibly on the villagers' hearts. Fear was the appropriate response to the thought of fighting something on the same level as that, foes which they had no chance of beating. So the serpent of the west uses weird magic? Damn, what a pain! Nferia nodded at Britta's mumbling. Usually, monsters with racial spells won't have more than ten of them, but if they're the type which can practice and learn magic, they'll have access to many more, which makes them troublesome. If they know magic that allows them to cross the walls. I'm glad that Enfi and the goblins can use it, but letting the enemy use magic is cheating. Enri said so in an unhappy tone, which drew grim smiles from the villagers. But don't tell Gaon Summer I said that, okay? That follow-up made the villagers smile. That should lighten things up a little, Henry thought. Although it would be bad if they were too relaxed, being too tense would also keep them from fighting effectively, the mood now seemed just right. Jugum looked gratefully at Henry. It would seem he understood that point as well. Defense force, don't worry. Just stay far away and shoot. Will handle the front line. The goblins had trained the defense force for precisely this role, so this was the best way to deploy them. Gathering enough swords and armor to equip everyone in the defense force was very difficult in a small village. And in the end, they were still villagers. They might have strong arms from using hoes and shovels, but that did not translate into sword skills. Only a genius could train himself into a warrior of a level that could defeat monsters in his free time between chores. With those points in mind, the goblins realized that they could not train the defense force to a level where they could handle frontliner duty. Instead, they decided to teach them archery to let them fight from the back line. Although their technique had improved and they could hit their targets, they could not pull the strong bows which had good penetrating power, making it difficult to inflict damage on thick-skinned monsters. However, if they were lucky and fired in unison, there was a chance they might hit a vulnerable spot. All right, just like we trained, line up and take aim at the other side of the door. Agu, you come in after the main door gets broken down. Stand with the defense force and stab the enemy with spears. Treat Britta San's commands as though they came from An San and listen to her. Oh, leave it to me. That's the spirit. Now, listen up. I forbid you to run. Fight like mad until you die. Of course. I'll definitely repay the kindness you showed by saving me. In fact, why not put me at the front line with the ogres? You stupid kid. If I let you do that, you just end up dying in a few seconds. You can say that once you get stronger. After being scolded by the leader, Agu's face was filled with regret and some of the defense force members went to comfort him. Enri sighed in relief as she saw this. For one, it meant that the villagers did not see him as the reason for bringing the monsters in. For another, it was proof that Agu was accepted by the villagers. They were the last outsiders to arrive in the village. Although they had not been shunned or treated badly, there was still a distance between them. However, from the look of things, that gap would vanish if they won today. It was ironic that the battlefield was the best place to build the bonds of camaraderie. And it was because he felt the divide that Agu fought so fiercely. His objective was to contribute to the village and raise the standing of himself and his people. It was the same in human society, which respected those who shed blood for them. Considering his people's status depended heavily on how Agu and his two friends performed, it was only natural that he was so passionate about it. Infi, I have something to ask of you. Enri stood beside Inferia, 
and whispered into his ear. Oh, no, further a little, ah. Mm. Got it. Then, Agu, I have something to entrust to you and your friends, is that all right? I'm going to give you my alchemical items, so I hope you'll use them well. Feria opened his satchel. Inside were many bottles and paper sachets. Use these and throw them at the enemy. You'll miss if you're too far away, so try to use them at medium range. Are you ready for this? Leave it to me. I'll accomplish this task perfectly. Agu accepted the satchel, and as they were waiting, one of the goblins shouted down to them. They're on the move. No doubt about it, they're heading this way. If one were to listen, they could hear the sounds of many monsters rending the night. All right, defense force to your positions. An San, watch out. Ani San, you too. Yes. I got it. Don't any of you die, please. Leave it to us. Now then, let's go, Enri. Feria ran up to Enri as her escort. Their job was to inspect each house to see if anyone had not noticed the emergency. As they watched Enri leave, the goblins went to battle stations. Self-defense force, to your places. Wait for the enemy to enter the target area. There was no direct line of fire to the monsters outside the wall. They would need to shoot in an arc to do so, but amateurs could not do that, and they did not have the time to train them to that level. Therefore, the goblins responsible for training the defense force decided to specialize them in one task. They trained the defense force to land arrows on the other side of the wall. That meant learning how much force to use, and practicing the right angle to shoot at in order to accurately hit a specific area. It was training that was completely useless outside of very specific circumstances. However, since the enemy's aim was to break down the gate and they were massed in front of it to single-mindedly attack the gate, the training was very effective. The monster's cries drew closer, and the main gate shuddered under a series of impacts which could be felt in the nearby walls as well. Very good. Enemies are at the target area. Suppressive fire, begin. Here we go. In response to Jugum's shout, the goblin archers on the watchtowers, Shuringan and Gurindai, began shooting. As long as their target was within their line of fire, the marksmen of the goblins could not miss. Screams of agony rose up from the other side of the door. The awful din of the battlefield filled the air, making the members of the defense force tremble in fear and nervousness. Amidst all this, Jugum shouted once more. Defense force, hold. Do not raise your bows until ordered. They were told not to shoot when the enemy had reached the place they had spent countless hours learning to shoot. However, in the next instant, everyone who looked at the towers understood the reason for that. Rocks hurtled over from the other side of the wall. Each one was about the size of a human head. Although many went astray, even a lucky hit on the watchtowers made them shake visibly. Rock throwers confirmed. Enemy rock throwers have multiple rocks remaining. Each one has about three rocks, and roughly twenty-one rocks in total, whoa. Another thrown rock struck a watchtower and the wood splintered. If they began shooting, the defense force would become targets too. It was true that the defense force was out of sight of the enemy, and their accuracy would be low. However, if they were unlucky, a single hit could kill people. Even a weakly thrown rock could severely injure someone. One could say that Jugum had ordered them not to attack for safety's sake. It also showed that Jugum did not want anyone to die before the extended battle could commence. Don't think we can't hit you just because you're throwing rocks at us. Gurindai shouted angrily, and began shooting again while weaving through the hail of flung rocks. The defense force could not tear their eyes away from him, watching the way he fearlessly returned fire, knowing that he would be severely hurt if he was hit. However, Jugum was not watching him. He quickly surveyed the battlefield and found new enemies in an instant. Kume. Climbing snakes on the left flank. Can you handle the, by yourself? No problems, leader. Leave it to me. Kume, who had been standing by in the rear, spurred his wolf forward. Ahead of him were the giant snakes climbing the wall. Fifteen, sixteen. You two hang on a bit more.
there was no need for Juggam's words. Not a hint of fear could be seen in the shooting stances of the two archers atop the listing watchtower. Though the tower would collapse under them even without further attacks, they continued targeting the monsters and baiting rock attacks. On the left flank, Kume seemed to be doing well against the snakes. Finally, the watchtower bent and broke under the barrage of thrown rocks. Shuringan and Gurindai jumped down to the ground, rolling several times to disperse the impact of their fall. Defense Force Archers Ready In response to the call, the archers prepared their bows. Breathe deep. In, out. In, pull. This voice was just like their training, and for a moment, the Defense Force archers forgot they were on the battlefield. They ignored the sound of the timbers creaking and performed the same movements like they had learned during practice, loose. Fourteen arrows traced beautiful arcs through the sky and vanished behind the wall, drawing more screams of pain from the monsters. Amazing, Agu muttered to himself, but Jugam did not have the time to bother with him. Second wave ready, don't panic, breathe deep. In, out. In, pull. By this time, Shuringan and Gurindai had been healed and took their places by the defense force. Loose. Once again, Fourteen arrows flew forth, followed slightly later by two more. The door creaked louder as the cries from the enemy intensified. The arrows must have gotten them mad, and made them hit harder. Back up. Change weapons. The defense force moved as a group behind the barricades positioned behind the main gate. Anyone charging in would be stuck on the sturdy bars and spikes of the obstacle. The arrangement was in an L shape leading the attackers to where Jugam and the ogres were waiting for them. For the intruders, breaking through the gate would be like jumping from the frying pan into the fire. If you see any magic casters, get out of their line of fire. Leader. What's the matter, Agu? Arnie-san gave me some alchemical items and there's glue in there, where do you want it? Will it be absorbed by the mud? Yes, but he said it would only shorten its effective duration. If so, then wait for a good opportunity and jam up the entrance. After showing they understood, Agu and his tribesmen moved off as one. Kume returned after defeating the snakes and immediately headed off to the goblin cleric to receive healing. There was the sound of wood splintering, and one side of the main gate was down. Enemy ogres surged through the breach. Cuckoo, a bunch of brainless fools. Jugam mocked the incoming enemies they had made a fatal mistake. The monsters had only broken down one side of the doors. Once that side was down, they gave up on breaking down the other side and forced their way in, especially since they were afraid of being hit by arrows if they remained outside. However, with only one side of the door down, they could only come in one at a time, which meant a lot of enemies were stuck squeezing through the entrance. In addition, they were caught in the angle of an L-shaped ambush, where all the defenders could focus their attacks on a small number of attackers at a time. Welcome to the kill zone. Time to die. The armed ogres on the village's side had an advantage in a slugging match against their wild counterparts, and the defense force had their spears to assist. Any ogres who tried to break down the barricades would be taken down by the goblin archers, the goblin sorcerer and a goose alchemical items. The goblins would handle any beasts who broke through amidst the chaos. The situation was overwhelmingly favorable to them and there were still the goblin riders standing by in reserve. If the enemy had no magic casters, their victory would be assured. However. What's that? Panic crept into Jugam's voice. Is that a troll out there? It looked different from an ogre, but it was about the same size. It lurched stiffly toward the defenders, emitting an oppressive presence as it came. In its hand, it held a great sword with an unnatural air about it. A moist substance flowed from the middle of the blade to its edges. That must be some form of magic. The boss took the field? Could that be? The giant of the east? It certainly looked that way. Its strong body looked like it had been trained until it was as hard as steel and it was completely unlike any of the trolls that Juggan knew. At a glance, he could see how it could be on par with the beast of the south. Just one troll would require all of the goblins to handle. 
It was an enemy that was tougher than any they had ever faced. If that's the case, Jugam thought about what to do. It seemed hopeless. The best way would be to cover Enri's escape. If she did not want to, then even if they had to force her. No, that's not the best way. That's the worst way, and our last resort. Having given up on that course of action, Jugam spoke to his goblin troops, Oi, you lot. Afterwards, every single one of us is going to die. Don't even think about childish things like falling back. Make sure you brand your heroic forms into everyone's eyes. The goblins answered with a roar full of fighting spirit. In an instant, enemies and allies alike seemed to freeze. Here we go, lads. Let's show them the power of Anne Sans boys. After a circuit of the village and confirming that nobody had been left behind, Henry breathed a sigh of relief. Just then, the sound of something breaking came from the front. It was followed by battle cries from both sides, and the thunderous bass sounds churned her guts. That was probably the sound of the gate breaking and the goblins joining battle. She swallowed the bile that had flowed up her throat from stress. The bitter taste remained in her mouth, but she ignored it to look at Nferia. Infi. We should be heading to the gate. Understood. But you need to go to the rendezvous point and reassure everyone, okay? Infi's words had the subtext of don't get in everyone else's way. Enri had also been trained in the use of a bow, but now that the gate had been broken, the battle would have moved into close quarters with a spear. To be honest, even if Enri went there now, there was little she could do. I can't do that. I chose to lead the goblins and the villagers, and as long as I'm able, I need to do that. Although falling back is the correct thing to do, I can't do it. She had to stand on the front lines and see how the battle was fought. After seeing the conviction in Henry's eyes, Verya swept his hair aside to reveal his hardened features. That's true. I understand. I'll protect you. The serious expression on her childhood friend's usually placid face made Enri's heart beat in strange and wondrous ways. Mm. What's wrong, Enri? I know, I'm not as cool as Gaon San, but I won't let you die. Don't say die. Ah, I'm sorry. That. That. As she saw her childhood friend struggle for the words to use, like he always did, Enri smiled. Let's go, Infi. Ah, uh, yes. That's right, we don't have time to waste on talking. The two of them ran to the front gate. Because they had started running from the rear gate, which was furthest away, it would take them a while to get there even if they ran at top speed. And if they got there gasping for breath, they would only get in the way if the fighting was underway. In order not to let haste make waste, they proceeded at a moderate speed. However, they only ran for a few seconds. The two of them heard a stomach-churning sound and halted in their tracks. Looking back, they saw something revealing itself from behind the wall. It was massive and bizarre. It was much bigger than its human equivalent, and for a moment they could not figure out what it was. In truth, it was a finger. Something clutched the top of the back gate, which was four meters tall, with its hand. That, what's that? A giant? I don't know. Ah. Faya's words cut off halfway, and his mouth hung open. Henry frantically turned to look at what had stunned him and ended up making the same expression. Something was slowly climbing the wall. Something which could not possibly be a human being. Could that be a troll? As she heard Nferia breathing those words, Henry stared at the emerging monster. What's that? Although it's the first time I've seen one, it's exactly like how I've heard it would be. If that's really a troll, we'll be in trouble. Trolls are opponents that even gold-ranked adventurers would have trouble beating. Honestly speaking, even Jugam and the others would probably have a hard time. Henry felt the blood drain downwards as she heard about something that was stronger than the mightiest being in the village. The troll that was revealing its massive silhouette snorted, and it slowly looked around its surroundings. Nferia grabbed Enri by the hand dragged her into the shadows of a nearby house. He covered her mouth and then whispered into her ear, Enri, trolls have very sensitive noses. It's okay for now since we're downwind, but it's too soon to rest easy. 
you need to get out of here. Then meet up with the goblins. Enri drew closer to Nferia and whispered back into his ear. I can't, Enfi. If we let that guy go to the main gate, everyone will die in the pincer attack. That might be the case, but right now, we can't. We're the only ones here. That means it's up to us to stop it. Between the gap in his hair, Nferia's eyes looked at Enri like she had gone mad. Granted, Enri did realize she had just asked for the two of them to do the impossible, but there was no other way. We don't need to win or defeat it. We just need to delay it. Infi, please lend me your strength. How are we going to delay it? Lure that guy away from here. I suppose I could fight it directly. But I doubt I could take even a single hit from him. Nferia's quiet words revealed a calm determination inside him. In response, Enri laid out her plan. I've got a plan. For starters, let's make some ogres. The troll stared briefly at a wooden, human-made house and began to move. All the houses smelled of soft, delicious humans, but it knew that was just leftover scent. After verifying there were no other scents in the area, it began striding toward the direction where the sound of battle was coming from. The sound of humans fighting its brethren made it drool, and it imagined the humans that would be there. A soft, lovely feast of human flesh. As a gourmet among trolls, it loved the meaty limbs and disliked the bitter innards. Therefore, it was rare that it could eat its fill, but now it looked like it would get the chance to do just that. Its strides grew longer as it drooled in anticipation. However, the troll halted and looked carefully around its surroundings. Or rather, it looked into the shadows of a nearby house. There were ogres. The smell of ogres was wafting out from there, it frowned. Although ogres were its allies, there was a slight difference in the scent it was picking up. It was one of which he had no prior memory. And now it was coming from behind the house, surrounding him. Of course it had not come to this conclusion because its nose was as sensitive as a bloodhound's, but because it had remembered the unique odor of its ogre allies. As such, it did not know how many ogres there were. And that brought up a question. There was a mysterious smell here as well, like the smell of crushed grass, but far stronger. Had those ogres smeared themselves with the juices of shredded grass? It pondered this question and was confused. The strong herbal odor stung its nose, and its tears were about to flow. If the ogres could endure this stench, it must have been because they had a bad sense of smell. It could take them on face to face. As a troll, it was much stronger than any ogre. However, that did not mean it could escape unscathed, and it would take time to deal with them, because trolls had the racial ability of regeneration, their wounds would recover over time. However, regenerating its injuries would still take a while, which was troublesome. Who knew, its fellow ogres might have eaten all the humans by the time it got there. Since the opposition had dispersed, they must be planning to attack all at once when it moved to attack. It felt a glimmer of pride at seeing through its opponent's plan and slowly began moving again, intending to circle around the house. Its aim was to destroy them all quickly. Thus, the fact that its opponents had split up was a golden opportunity. All it needed to do was slay the ogres one by one, starting with the one at the edge of the group. It moved slowly, taking care not to make noise, but suddenly, a small shadow dashed out of a nearby house. It was not a goblin, but one of its favorite prey, humans. In contrast to the troll who had been surprised into inaction, the caped human splashed something upon it. You go ah. The troll screamed from the overpowering stench, the green stuff emitted a powerful stink which burrowed into its nose and sinuses. This reek was several times stronger than that of the grass-stained ogres. Even though it could regenerate, this was not a wound it could heal. It simply could not endure the smell. Its eyes watered and it took a step toward the human, but it had already run back into the house. The reason why the human had managed to get so close despite the troll's keen sense of smell was because the human scent had been masked by the scent of the crushed grass. Angered by the loss of its target, the troll returned to its earlier target, the ogres. 
First, it would kill the ogres and then find that tantalizing food, humans, the troll thought. The troll circled the house angrily, but did not find any signs of the ogres. It was as though they had vanished into thin air. Guyu, where? It looked around. Ogres were large, despite being smaller than itself, but it could not find any ogres. Once they moved their massive bodies, the troll should have spotted them eventually. Could those puny ogres go invisible, like their master? The troll was confused by another situation it could not figure out, and snorted. However, the strong stink of herbs rising from its own body interfered with its sense of smell, and it could not follow the ogre's scent trail. Buyu Oyu. The moaning troll scraped experimentally at the fluid on its body. This time, its fingers stank. Glancing around, the troll found a fallen piece of cloth on the ground. The troll considered that it might be good to wipe itself off with the cloth and picked it up with a curious expression on its face. It brought the cloth to its nose and sniffed. Its nose might have been disabled, but it could still pick up a bit of scent. The troll smelled ogre on the cloth, and suddenly, it understood. It had mistaken this cloth that reeked of ogre stink for an ogre itself. This was not a coincidence. Hi you mans. Roaring angrily, the troll started looking around its surroundings. No humans, then they should still be in their homes. The troll's fist pounded angrily at a nearby house and after hammering at it several times, it reached up to tear the roof off, intent on destroying the interior. A human rushed out in a panic as it was demolishing the house. Eager to tear the human apart as well, it gave chase. The target, the troll, was chasing her. That meant the plan was working. Though she was grateful for that, her heart was on the verge of seizing up and she wanted to cry. A gigantic, man-eating monster was pressing in from behind, and this high-stakes game of tag, if she lost, she would disappear down that monster's throat, was something which would drive an ordinary village girl to tears. The fact that she did not know how long she would have to play this game made her want to cry that much more. If she knew when it would be over, she might have been able to will herself to keep fleeing until the very end. However, she did not know when the battle at the gate would end or if anyone had noticed this deadly game of cat and mouse, and whenever she thought about these discomforting things, she felt her strength ebb away. Henry regretted not sending someone over to the main gate to make a report, but the preparations had taken too long. She ran with all her strength, rushing into the house where Nfeya was waiting. In turn, Nfeya rushed out of the back door, wearing the same hooded cape that she was. Henry held her breath, gulping and hoping that the enemy had not seen through their scheme. The troll continued chasing Nfeya, not having noticed the switch. Henry calmed her ragged breathing and clasped her hands in delight. Trolls were far superior to humans in stamina, stride length and physical ability, therefore a single person running away would definitely be caught. In order to recover stamina and move for extended periods, they decided to switch with each other without letting the enemy notice. This was intended to both buy time and to keep it from going to the rendezvous point where the people were. The question, then, was how to deceive it. How could trolls tell humans apart? Maybe if they lived together long enough they would have a few ways, but this was not nearly long enough. Practically speaking, it would be by appearance, especially clothing. As such, Feria and Henry had worn the same rain capes and ponchos. Next, they had to keep it from differentiating between the two of them via its sense of smell, and the herbal juice was meant to take care of its keen nose. Henry had prepared two traps based on scent, one was to use the ogre stink to halt it in its tracks, and the other was using the stench of the herbs to disorient it. After she got her breathing under control, Henry began stealthily moving to the next house. She crept into the darkened interior of the house, peeking at the situation outside. With a dong sound, Feuer ran inside at top speed. At this moment, Henry ran out again from the back door by which she had entered. But then Henry realized that the troll was not following her, even though she had run out of the house. The troll snorted, then looked between Henry and the house. Its ugly face contorted even further. She guessed that the look on its face might be surprise. Cold sweat beaded on Henry's throat. 
she touched herself unconsciously, and her hand came away, cool and wet. Its nose is used to it. The troll had gotten used to the smell of the herbs, and now it was suspicious of the smell of her sweat. It seemed to have realized that there were two humans. The troll raised its hand and brought it down onto the house. Nfeya ran out again. However, his footsteps stopped, and he did not look like he was going to flee. Henry. Run away. I'll buy you some time. Idiot. Run with me. It'll definitely catch up with us. Even if we use the houses as shields. Henry's eyes went wide, and Tfeya smiled to her. I'm stronger, so there's a higher chance I'll survive if you use me as a distraction. Tfeya cast a spell, and his body was enveloped in a bubble of soft, gentle light. What he said made a lot of sense, and she could not refute him. Seeing this, Tfeya smiled again. And besides, I want to protect the woman I love. Tfeya turned toward the ferocious monster, raising his fist and pointing his thumb to himself. Come on, big guy, I'll play with you. Come have a go if you're hard enough. Acid arrow. As Nferia taunted the troll in a decidedly out-of-character way, he fired a green arrow of acid at it. As it hit, steam rose with the sound of hissing and bubbling, making the troll scream in agony, twice as loud as he had. The troll fixed its rage-maddened eyes on Nferia. It paid no more attention to Henry. Go. Go and get help. It would be foolish to waste time here. You'd better stay safe. Saying that, Henry ran off. The troll did not look like it wanted to follow. Frankly speaking, his chances of survival were zero. There was an overwhelming difference in their respective physical capabilities, and there was no way he could triumph over a foe that needed gold-ranked adventurers to beat. It was a battle so hopeless that being able to hold on for even a minute was worthy of praise. Yup, I'm going to die. Nfeya smiled bitterly as he watched the troll, who was approaching him warily. It could not regenerate damage caused by acid and fire. Because of this, the troll was especially careful around Nfeya, who could defeat its greatest ability. It could have won straight away if it had just charged over, and under the circumstances, Nfeya could not help but laugh. Well, that works for me. Hypnotism. The troll's hostility seemed unchanged. It seemed to have resisted the spell. Realizing that it had been targeted by a spell, the troll charged. The gigantic body approaching him was like a scene out of a nightmare. If it worked, I could have held on a bit longer. No such luck. Ah, what a shame. Nfeya seemed to have given up. This was because it was a completely unwinnable battle, which had crossed the line from bravery to recklessness. But even so, he had to buy time for Henry. That thought was what drove Nferia to move. Making note of the troll's upraised left arm, he ran forward and to the left, seeking life and death, he plunged headfirst into danger to reach the safety beyond it. The troll's fist followed him, and the wind of its passing ruffled his hair. And in front of Nferia, a mighty foot kicked out at him like a moving wall. Nferia's vision spun wildly as he flew through the air, his body making cracking sounds like shattered tree branches. He hit the ground hard and rolled several times, like a piece of discarded rubbish. Pain coursed through Nferia's body, which was still rolling over the ground. This was the most pain he had experienced in his life. But, but I somehow managed to survive. That's amazing. I'm amazing. He had hung on to life was because of the effects of his defensive spell and the fact that the troll's footing had been poor when it had kicked him. Ignoring the pain that shot through him with every breath he took, Nferia stood, and loosed another spell. Acid Arrow The pursuing troll stopped in its tracks, wary of the pool of scorching acid at its feet. Mm, just as planned. Nferia's aim was to buy time. If the enemy stopped attacking and went on guard, he hoped it would continue to stay that way. Damn, this hurts. I don't want to die. Nferia gave voice to his despair. In the end, this was all his life had amounted to. There were times when one did not want to face the facts, 
but the situation forced one to do so. This was such a situation. He would die here. There was no doubt that he would die. He wanted to run. Maybe if he ran with all his strength, he might be able to escape. But if that happened, what manner of tragedies would occur? The Faya thought of Henry. He was able to fight because Henry was there. Well, I've already told Henry. No. I don't want to die before I hear her answer. The ever-approaching troll could not understand the heart of a young man in love. He could not delay it any longer. He did not know how he had done it, but Nfaya managed to read his opponent's thoughts through its ugly face, it was determined to kill him, even if it got hurt. If that was the case. Dash acid arrow. All Nfaya could do was wound the troll, in order to make things easier for his allies who would face the troll after him. The troll raised its fist, face twisted from the pain of being burnt by the acid. Nfaya, who was racked with pain, for whom even standing up took everything he had, had no way of resisting the next hit. Please hurry. Led by Henry, the three goblins ran to save Nferia. The reason they had met up was not because Henry had reached the main gate, but because Henry and Nferia had not returned, and the howls coming from the rear had worried Jugum enough that he had sent three goblins out to investigate. If only they could have held on, the goblins would have saved her and Nferia. As Henry thought that, her heart was shredded by guilt. This was really a stroke of bad luck. If it hadn't been like this. There. Henry pointed to Nferia, in front of them, and towering over him, the troll was raising its fist. They could not reach him to help. The distance was just too far. The troll's hand fell like a thunderbolt. It could destroy a house in a single blow. Nferia was dead beyond all reasonable doubt. Henry closed her eyes, and in the darkness she heard the goblins gulp in surprise. Their out-of-place response led Henry to fearfully open her eyes. Wow your HP's in the red you okay? And she saw a beautiful woman holding a gigantic weapon. Lupus Regina was carrying a huge weapon that looked like some sort of oversized religious symbol, holding it lengthwise and using it like a shield to block the troll's fist. The weapon's size and the maid's slender arm seemed completely mismatched to the point of surreality, but this was no dream or illusion. Then, I'll take care of this guy, oh wait, you're hurt, in Fichan. Heal. The troll stepped back from the incomprehensible scene before it. The blow which it had put its full strength into had been blocked by a human, so its reaction was only to be expected. No, perhaps it thought there was some kind of magic at work here. Nferia had a stunned look on his face as he turned his back on the troll and limped away. It was a thoroughly unguarded posture, but the troll did not press the attack. No, it could not just ignore the newcomer who had stepped in to take Nferia's place before it. Enfi. Henry hugged Nferia tightly. Ah, it's you, Henry. His weak reply, as though he were dreaming told Henry that he was at his limit. Although he was out of danger, he had still suffered great mental damage. I'm glad you're all right. Why you too? Henry felt the warmth return to her heart replacing the cold that had filled her in the moment when she thought Nferia had died. I'm really glad you're fine. Henry hugged Nferia tightly, with all her strength. So am I. Nferia reached out his arms to hug Henry in return. Although they were embracing each other tightly, it felt very comfortable. Henry's tears welled up and spilled out, streaming down her face. What's wrong? Idiot. Are uh, sorry to interrupt you too while you're making out. Lupus Regina San. Henry let the strength flow from her arms, and at the same time Nferia loosened his grip. Feeling slightly disappointed, they both turned to Lupus Regina. The troll. Shifting her line of sight, Henry saw something which was hard to describe. Ah, oh, this Sue? Kinda looks like an uncooked hamburger patty, doesn't it? All it needs is a good char broiling. A ball of blood spattered meat shifted and twitched under the bloodied head of Lupus Crozier. There was nothing about the pile of broken flesh that suggested that it had once been a troll. However, what made it disgusting was the fact that it was slowly regenerating, 
and still breathing. Ah well it's good that the two of you are fine Sue. Then I guess I can clean things up on my end Sue. Henry heard the voices of the goblins approaching. It seemed like the battle for the main gate had been won, there you go. It looked as though fire had descended from the heavens as a pillar of red flame engulfed the troll, producing the stench of cooked meat. That takes care of the troll. Since my job's done, I'll be taking off. Ah, Infi Chan, Ein Summer wants to reward you for developing the purple potion, so he invited you to his house. Hope your affairs are in order Sue. Or should I say, any last words? After saying so, Lupus Regina walked off towards the rear gate. Thank you very much. Lupus Regina did not stop or turn back in response to Enri's shouted gratitude, only waved her hand. And San, Ani San, will take over the task of guiding the others. You two should go have some rest over there. The goblins walked off without waiting for a reply. Shouldn't they have left someone with us? Enri thought, but her concern for Nferia overruled that, so she lent him her shoulder to lean on. After leaving the corpse of the troll behind, the two of them sat down, ha! The two of them sighed as one. Then, the two of them looked up almost simultaneously to the night sky. You were saved. Mm. It was just good luck. Mm. Don't do that again. Mm. Silence flowed between the two of them. Enri suddenly spoke the words in her heart. I don't know whether or not this is love, but I don't want you to go anywhere, Infi. Hmm, hmm. Is this love? I don't know. But if it is, I'd be very happy. Enri and Nferia said no more, leaning shoulder to shoulder and watching the stars until the goblins arrived. Epilogue. An San, looks like you're ready, Jugum commented on Enri's appearance as he entered her home. Yes, that's right. Is it odd? As she asked Jugum her question, Enri looked down at the dress she was wearing, one of the best she had, which she usually reserved for the harvest festival. Not at all, don't you think, Arnie san mm, you're very pretty, Enri. Really? With a red face, Enri looked at Jugum and Nemo as they smiled. Or rather, Nemo's grin was not just mischievous, it was downright evil. Ever since Enri and Nferia's relationship had taken a step forward, they had been looking at them like that more and more often. However, she realized that saying anything about it would only embarrass her further, so she had wisely chosen to keep her mouth shut. However, leaving it alone was dangerous too. Especially for Nemo. Sometimes, her little sister would ask questions that she could not answer. It just feels like she's suddenly matured mentally over the past few days. Maybe I should ask Infi for help about this. Seeing the plea in Enri's eyes, her lover, Nferia, spoke. Um, ahem. Speaking of which, Jugam-san, can you use that magic sword well? I heard it's not like normal swords, and using it is tiring. The great sword which Jugam was holding had been obtained in the raid several days ago. I've gotten used to the sword's weight and center of gravity, so I can use it as well as my old sword. Its sharpness and so on are much better than the other one, but that's a magic weapon for you. However, the poison in here, it weakens the people it cuts, but it's a bit strange. It is? Is it a powerful effect? Well, it's not a particularly strong poison. Someone on my level can resist it easily. However, against weaker opponents. Jugum's face took on a dark expression. What's wrong? Ah, Jugum said as he looked to the ceiling, speaking in an irritated voice. I was thinking about the troll I got this sword from. There was something weird about it. The corpse doesn't seem any different from a normal troll. Maybe it was a mutant troll. No, no, I didn't mean that, Arnie Sam. From its movements, its lack of regeneration, the way it felt when I cut into it. It felt weird. That's right, like a body that was already dead, something bizarre and foreboding like that. A moving corpse? Like a zombie? I don't know. There might be a species of troll like that. Thanks for waiting. The door opened in time with that fresh and bright proclamation. 
With the sun at her back, Lupus Regina strolled boldly into Enri's house. As Enri and the others watched in stunned silence, a spang sound came from the top of Lupus Regina's head. Owie! You idiot! How could you be so rude? Everyone, I apologize on her behalf. After pulling Lupus Regina back, the woman in the back bowed to them. I am Ein Summer's maid, Yuri Alpha. I am here to receive Inferia Summer, Enri Summer and Nemu Summer. I apologize for the intrusion. Ah, yes. Please come in, Lupus Regina too. The woman who had entered with Lupus Regina had an otherworldly beauty, just like Lupus Regina. Then, once you're ready, we can begin the teleportation straight away. Tay teleportation? You can teleport? Nferia was practically shouting, although Enri did not know why Nferia was so surprised, she could guess that it was a big deal. Was teleporting the warrior chief and the others a big deal too? Ah, no. This is not my power, but that of a magic item Ein Summer gave me. The horn, the potions too. He's amazing. He's so amazing I have no idea what's going on. Nferia's shoulders sagged. Sensing an opportunity, Henry decided to ask a question. Then, is it really all right for me to go? And my little sister too. Today was the day that the village's saviour, Einzul Gaun, had invited Nferia to his home. However, she felt uneasy when she heard that even a mere village girl like herself could accompany him. Their host was a powerful magic caster, and they were people who lived in completely different worlds. The idea that she might accidentally do something rude made her stomach hurt. It's all right, Sue. Since we're celebrating Enfi Chan's new invention, his girlfriend En Chan can come along, no problem. Ein Summer said so too, Yano. Formality's not such a big deal. Lupus, mind your tone. Yuri Ne, what's wrong with that? We're friends, right? En Chan. Eh? Ah, yes. Yes. That's right. Hmm. Yuri sighed with a ha, then walked to the front of a nearby wall. A gigantic wooden closet suddenly appeared, as though from thin air. It was big enough for people to pass through with ease, and its exterior was intricately carved, so it looked like a decorative closet. Is that, pocket space? No, this is too big, it should be a higher tiered spell. Now then, please, enter. Lupus, can I trust the safety of this place to you? Understood Sue. The wooden cabinet should have been backed up against a wall, but when one looked inside, its interior seemed to stretch into another world. Yuri took the first step and walked through to the other side of the closet. She was followed by Nferia, and a little bit later, by Enri, holding tightly to Nemu's hand. There was no resistance as they passed through the wall ahead of them, and they found themselves inside a vast, grand pathway, flanked by statues on both sides that were so lifelike it seemed like they might even move. You were. Nema exclaimed softly as she looked up to the ceiling, her mouth as wide as her eyes. Enri held her to keep her from falling, and she looked up as well. Amazing. It was a dignified-looking passage whose floor was made of polished rock, upon which a colorful carpet had been laid to show the way forward. Enri was struck dumb with admiration, she imagined that this must be what palaces looked like. Please, walk this way. Yuri's voice snapped her out of her daze, and she thought of running a little to catch up with the two people ahead of them. But since that would be entirely unbefitting of a place like this, Enri merely quickened her footsteps to advance swiftly. After walking for a short distance, a wall appeared with a closet door upon it, similar to the one they had used to enter. However, there were two key differences. The first was that this door was several times larger than the first, big enough for several people to enter at the same time. The second was because they could not see what was inside it, only a thin, sparkling multicolored film. Then, please enter like you did previously. Henry and Nferia looked at each other. In that case, we'll go in together. Henry and Nferia linked their hands. From left to right were Nemu, Enri, and Nferia, and together they walked into the door. In an instant, amidst a shower of pink petals, there was a vision of a woman in clothes which were red on top and white below. Welcome. 
a harmonious chorus of voices greeted them. Looking around, they had arrived in an even more luxurious hallway, with two rows of astoundingly beautiful maids flanking them on both sides. At the end of a passage stood a man in a black robe that seemed to suck in all light from around him, wearing a bizarre mask. He was the saviour of the village, Ein's all gown. Henry froze in place, her mouth open. The chandeliers on the ceiling sparkled, and the white marble floor was spotless. A magnificent passage and pretty maids all in two rows. It was like walking into a fantasy world. Lost in this ephemeral, dreamlike world, Henry accidentally lost her grip on Nemu's hand. The part of her mind that was not completely overwhelmed by her surrounding realized this, and in the next moment, Henry snapped back to reality. Nemu ran ahead. Amazing. It's so amazing. Nemu shouted at the top of her voice as she ran. She ran down the two lines of maids, and towards Ein's. Faced with a world that overwhelmed her emotional capacity, she could no longer control herself and let herself run wild. It's super duper amazing. Nemu. Come back. Henry started running a fraction of a second later. She broke out in a sweat from Nemu's disgraceful behavior. However, this was a divine realm, where she was flanked by beautiful maids. The sound of her village girl's footsteps made her hesitate. Henry's self-contradictory footsteps betrayed how she felt, and in the end she limped along like a dying frog. While Henry was still limping along, Nemu had already reached the side of the village's savior. Is it really that impressive? Yup. It's really amazing. Is that so? Amazing. No, perhaps that's true. Eins reached out a hand, and quietly patted Nemo on the head. Is the place where I live truly that wonderful? Yeah, it's really wonderful. Did you make this, gown summer? Ha 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 ha, yes, that's right. My friends and I did. That's amazing. Gown summer and gown summer's friends are all amazing. Ha! Ha 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 ha! Clear and bright laughter reverberated through the hallway. By this time, Nferia and Enri had nervously reached the two of them. Enri tightly gripped Nemu's hand, determined never to let go. We thank you for your kind invitation from the bottom of our hearts. There is no need for such formality. We are here to celebrate the production of your new potion, Be at Ease. Gown Summer, I am truly sorry. My sister Nemu has been rude to you. Really, think nothing of it. She was moved by the sight of my residence, was she not? Then that is no insult to me, Eins replied in a cheerful mood. Now then. While I had intended to speak to Nferia Khan after this. Nemu, how about it? Do you want to see the home that I, know that we created together? Yes. I wanna see. I want to see the amazing house gown Summer and his friends made. Nemu spoke before Enri could refuse. Ha ha ha. Very well, very well. I have such sights to show you. Enri was unable to speak once she saw the good mood Eins was in. She settled down onto a recliner, remembering that she had been asked to wait in the receiving room while Nemu was shown around. Rather than say she was invited here, it would be more accurate to say that she was like a small animal that had been taken from its nest. She sat uneasily, and looked around herself. Beside her, despite the size of this place, the two of them stuck closely to each other, her love and Furia was also unable to keep still, much like a small animal himself. Enri could understand that her village's saviour, the magic caster known as Ein's Ulgaun, was a mighty being, but what she had seen today went beyond her wildest imaginings. It was as though she had stepped into a shining dreamscape, or a story where princesses and other great figures took center stage. The fireplace was decorated with glass birds that had been carved to lifelike perfection. If she broke one, she could work her entire life and still be unable to pay for it. The sofa which she sat upon was exquisite, and Henry wondered if she was dirtying it with her clothes. The chandelier, the first she had seen in her short life, was not lit by torches, lanterns, or candles, but by magic instead. She had seen magic lights before in E. Rantel's Adventurer's Guild, but they could not compare in brightness or style. 
The furniture was tasteful and luxurious. Of particular interest was the weightiness of the ebony table before her. Even though Henry had no idea how valuable these kinds of things were, she was still able to tell that this was a very valuable piece. A lifelike portrait of a beautiful woman hung on the wall, painted in intricate detail. Even the carpet on the floor made Henry hesitate to step on it with her shoes. It was so soft that as she sat on the sofa, she wondered if she ought to raise her feet so they would not touch the floor. Henry was so nervous that she was about to faint. I knew we should have gone with her. Although she could not refuse Eines, the idea of Nemu going by herself made her stomach boil in anxiety. I just hope she doesn't trouble Gown Summer. It'll be fine, don't worry. Gown Summer is very generous. I think he'll overlook any minor rudeness from a young girl. Mm, but, you see, if you anger a noble, you'll be executed. I've heard that too, but to be honest, I've never seen it before. E. Rantle and its surrounding territory are administered by the king himself, so I don't think the nobles would dare to make a fuss. Is Gown Summer a noble? Isn't he? Anyone with such a luxurious manner and so many pretty maids would have to be a powerful noble, right? There's no way they could gather all these things otherwise. Mm. Is that so? To be honest, I don't think even a noble could assemble beautiful maids like these. Henry's eyebrows shot up at a dangerous angle. She had been the first to say that the maids were pretty, but when Furia said it, it made her feel unhappy. Just as she was about to glare at the Furia, there was a knocking on the door. A. E. Henry's shoulders twitched violently, and because the two of them were pressed against each other, the twitch was transmitted to Furia, who shuddered as well. The knocking came again. Henry frantically thought about what the knocking meant and in the meantime Furia opened his mouth. Ah, uh, er, uh, please come in. My apologies. The Wayne Furia had given the right answer with such calm mystified Henry, and what entered was a maid pushing a silver serving cart. She was a beautiful woman, dressed in sparkling clean and spotless clothes which even an amateur could recognize as a high-class maid outfit. A gentle, warm smile adorned her face, however, Henry was worried that at any moment it would twist into an angry expression as she exclaimed, What are you two doing? The beverages are ready. N no thanks. The maid's face displayed stunned confusion for a moment as she passed Henry's lightning fast answer. Then she turned her gaze to Nferia, and then back to Henry. Ah, is that so? Ah, yes. Perhaps she sensed how Henry was so tense that her body had frozen up, on Furia's innate nervousness, but the maid smiled, genuine and gently. She said a simple my apologies, and sat herself down beside Henry. Then she gently placed a hand on the petrified Henry's shoulder. Emmet Summer, please do not be so tense. Both Emmet Summer and Bear Summer are guests here, so all you need to do is be at ease and relax. But, but... W what if we break something in here? Please be at ease. Ein Summer will not be bothered even if the objects in here are damaged. But, but how? All the things in here are. Even thinking about the cost of the things she could see in a quick glance around the room made her head hurt, and to think, these items were not a big deal? Yes, Ein Summer is extremely wealthy. Tha that I know. After all, he was the kind of man who could freely give out valuable and potent items such as those horns. Which is why I would like you to be at ease. Deliberate damage aside, Ein Summer will smile and forgive you for any accidents. And even if anything is damaged, it can be repaired with magic. Even if you say that, that. I understand. Then, please have a drink. That way, you'll be able to relax. But. Henry glanced at the tea service on the silver pushcart. They were exquisitely made of porcelain, edged in gold, and the reverse side was a vibrant deep blue, patterned with intricate designs. They looked delicate enough that Henry was worried that they would break the moment she touched them. Henry, have a drink. It would be rude to refuse further. Ah, then, ah, thank you. Understood. Hmm, I see. The fragrance and taste of herbal tea is an acquired taste, 
would you rather have traditional black tea instead? Yes, please, thank you. The smiling maid prepared the tea for them with flowing, elegant movements. After rinsing the cups with hot water, she served the tea. In addition, she placed two more small containers before them. Please add the desired amounts of milk and sugar to taste. Henry opened the sugar pot. What she saw were white solids that resembled nothing so much as powdered snow. The village girl mechanically deposited several sugar cubes into her cup, stirring them until they dissolved. After that, she added milk. Then, Henry took a sip, and felt like her face was going to melt. S. Sweet. Mmm, I guess adding the sugar would do that. It's not often that you get to taste sweet things in the village, and you don't raise bees. If I'm not wrong, you only have something like syrup. I remember there was spice making magic but that's something else entirely. Henry forgot where she was, and exclaimed loudly, try your hardest to recall it. After hearing him go ah, um, yes and other noises, Henry took another mouthful of the red tea, and the sweet taste let her heart calm down. Really, it's sweet and delicious. Just then, several knocks came from the door. The maid moved quietly over and opened it. I'm Summer and your little sister have returned. As the door opened, Nemu rushed in, all smiles. Ainz followed behind her. Nay san It's amazing. It's shiny and pretty and really amazing. As Nemu hugged her sister around the waist, Henry rose to bow to Ainz, all the while taking care to not let her little sister's feet dirty the sofa. Gown Summer I apologize for any rudeness my little sister has showed you. Certainly not. Rather, I should apologize for keeping her for so long. There's no such thing. We're very grateful. Eines waved his hand to indicate that it wasn't a problem. Then before I discuss matters with Nferia Kun, let us eat, eh? We're imposing too much. Facing the panicking Nferia, Eines replied with a calming gesture. This is to ensure my deal with Nferia Kun later will be favorable to me. What do you mean by deal? I'll explain before we eat. Ein sat on the other side of the sofa. To begin with, I have no intention to openly market the potion you make. Or rather, without the ingredients I provide, you can't manufacture the purple potion. Do you agree? That's right. It's been difficult to get this far even when we're using the material provided by Gown Summer. There's still a lot of unknown factors, like how potent it is and what other effects it has. Therefore, offering it publicly would only cause problems. Although simply asking about the ingredients should be fine. We can't be sure that people won't try to take it by force, no. And from what Lupus Reginus told me, your village has suffered a monster attack. There is the possibility that these monsters— seeking the protection of strong walls, attacked your village in search of safety. Do you know why they did this, and did you take any prisoners? There were none, Henry answered in her heart. When they heard the monstrous roar from behind, made by the troll Henry and Nferia had encountered, the goblins simply did not have the time or the ability to take anyone captive, and just finishing the fight had taken enough from them that there were no enemy survivors and that guy with the magic sword was very strong. Is that so? Well, that's a shame. I considered the reasons why your village might have been attacked, which was what I just told you. As the village's defenses become stronger, it will in turn create more problems. When an object is more valuable, it will be desired by more people, right? Similarly, if news of the potion leaked out, we should keep it a secret. I'm glad you understand, Furia Kun. If we could make the red potion using just the ingredients from around the village, there would be no reason to keep it a secret. That is to say, everything we discuss after dinner will need to be kept strictly confidential, it concerns the duty to keep a secret. Then, preparations for the meal should be finished soon. Shall we? Ah, no, there's no need for food, how could we possibly partake of such amazing? Henry hurriedly shook her head. Well, although I won't force you. You do know that we prepared dragon steak for a main course, don't you? Dragon? Dragons. In all the stories Henry had heard, 
They were mankind's enemy, but some of them were friends of justice. However, no matter what stories they appeared in, they were always powerful beings. Could such beings become food? Impossible. He must just have been teasing them. If Irons had not been the one saying it, she would have thought so. However, since it was the great magic caster in front of her telling her this, that meant there was a high chance it was true. We also have desserts. Have you ever had ice cream? Although E. Rantle had some. Don't think I've tried them before. They're ice cold, and sweet. And they melt in your mouth, something like sweet ice or snow. Henry and Nemu could not help gulping. That's a high-class luxury. Just one of those would cost more than a day's worth of food. It seems you have tried something like that before, Furya Kun. Then I shall produce more delicious ice cream for you than you can possibly imagine. Following that, where's the menu? In response, the maid recited a long string of words. For today's lunch menu, we will be serving two hors d'oeuvres. The first will be a dish of piercing lobster, which is a form of Noatun seafood, in a velouté sauce. The second will be a dish of poires foie gras of Vithapnir. The soup will be an Alfheim-style cream of sweet potato and chestnut soup. We have selected meat for the main course, which would be the marbled steak made from Jotunheim's ancient frost dragons that Ein Summer mentioned earlier. After that comes dessert, which would be golden apple compote, served in white wine and topped with yogurt. In addition, we have black tea-flavored ice cream coated in gold leaf. For the after-meal beverages, we have considered that coffee may not suit everyone's taste, so we also have fresh peach juice. That is all. If any part of the menu requires amendment, please inform us and we will do so immediately. Is this a spell incantation? Henry, who had no clue about what had just been recited, was sure of that. Doesn't everyone like foie gras? I think children will. Please add it to the menu for me. How about something light? Yes. Then, we shall add scallop salad and star plum confit as hors d'oeuvres. Hmm, there is that. Is this menu better than the previous one? Eh? You're asking me? Henry, who had been suddenly put on the spot, answered frantically. It would be very bad if she had to keep talking about this stuff she knew nothing about. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. No. Ah. Uh. I'll leave it to you. It had taken all her effort to get a single sentence out. Ainz instructed the maid to prepare the meal as suggested. Nemu looked at Ainz with worshipful eyes, muttering so amazing to herself. Henry felt the same way. This was too far removed from the world she usually lived in. Wealthy people could spend money on luxuries. And being able to eat, not just to fill one's stomach, but for nothing more than pleasure, was part of that. Wealth, knowledge, and power. A magic caster who had all of these. He was a being that Henry as a simple farmer had no hope of reaching, a person better referred to as a king who stood above the tops of the clouds. This masked magic caster was such a formidable individual. Then, let's go. Although, I don't intend to join you. The three of you, that's right, this family of yours should enjoy the meal with no reservations. After that, we will discuss business. Ah, I need to tell Lupus Regina that I'm adding one more person to the list. Eh? What's that, Gown Summer? No, it's nothing, Nemu. Ainz stood up, and the sparkly-eyed Nemu stood up too. Enri's face had turned slightly hot from being referred to as a family, but she noticed something odd about Nferia, who was rising slowly. His mouth was flattened into a straight line, with no intention of opening it. However, Henry knew the secret to loosening him up. That was to stare at him. Through the gap in his hair, Nferia's eyes flickered back and forth, until at last, as though giving up, he sighed. I was thinking that I can't beat him. No, I know I can't beat him. He's far better than me as a man. But you do know that I like you the way you are now, don't you, Enfi? Was the difference in their levels as men such an important thing? As a woman, she could not understand how significant it was. Dferia's face turned bright red, then he took Henry's hand. Let's go. 
there was no longer any darkness in those words. Although she did not know why her lover's feelings had changed, cheering up should mean that he was happy. Hand in hand, Henry and Feuer chased after Eins and Nemu. Side Story 2, A Day in Nazarick. Nazarick Time, 5.14. A droplet of water gathered at the end of the golden faucet, and it slowly swelled, until at last it was pulled down by gravity and splashed onto the floor of the bathroom. There were several bathing facilities within the great underground tomb of Nazarick, and this was one of them. Someone soaked within a stone bathtub that was large enough to accommodate several people at once. Blue water dripped off a slippery white body. This blue color was not a literary illusion, but an actual blue color, as though it had been produced through a deliberate application of dye. A blue-colored liquid licked at the porcelain-like body, starting from its feet. Its slippery body defied the force of gravity and crawled upwards, unlike the water which flowed in all directions. Few are. The bathroom was very echo-friendly, and the thus words which had unconsciously slipped out were unexpectedly loud within its confines. Perhaps it was ashamed by its own voice, but a slender hand suddenly emerged from the blue liquid, the expected sound of water droplets and ripples in the water's surface were nowhere to be found. That was because this liquid was abnormally viscous. The upraised hand caressed a face which many had praised for its beauty. Ha! The person in question sighed softly, then let itself fall backwards into the liquid. However, that person's body did not sink into the water. Rather, the blue liquid slowly caught that person's slender frame. The softness resembled a waterbed. The liquid was clearly sapient. That point was promptly proven in the next moment. The blue liquid began to writhe, extruding several tentacles that were the thickness of one or two fingers each. These tentacles began to move, as though to embrace that person. Naturally, the same thing was happening within the blue liquid as well. It touched the face, the chest, the belly, the arms, the legs as well as the loins. After seizing its prey, the liquid began squirming, as though satisfied. In truth, it was a sapphire slime, a high-level slime variant. The sapphire slime began moving the long, thin tentacles which wrapped the body. The tentacles infiltrated the tiny crevices of the groin. Ah! The cry rang out once more. While it was louder than before, that person did not think about lowering their voice this time, simply focused on the sensations of the slime working around and writhing within their body. The sound of someone talking to themselves echoed through the bathroom. Ah, this feels great. It's too good for words. The person within the bathtub irons muttered to himself as he took a slime bath. He scooped up a handful of slime and poured it onto his head. The slime which had been hard at work cleaning out the crevices of his pelvis seemed to sense where its master wanted it to clean next. Eins felt the slime crawling around on his head. Who, this is paradise. Eins's undead body was composed entirely of bones. He had no metabolism, so his body would not stink or become dirty from bodily wastes. However, this did not mean he did not need to bathe. After all, dust and soot still accumulated on him, and sometimes he would be splashed by his enemy's blood. In the end, he would still get dirty. Besides, as a Japanese person, he felt very uncomfortable about not bathing. I could only take steam baths over there, in my original world. So once I knew I could bathe here, I wanted to soak my entire body into the tub. Perhaps bathing is a deeply ingrained practice for Japanese people. He went through the motions of exhaling while he sank further into the slime. The slippery sensation received and accepted his body. It would not feel strange if he treated it as a viscous liquid. Normal bathing is very troublesome. Eins lowered his head to look at the most troublesome part of his body. The rows of his ribs came into view. Cleaning each rib one by one was very troublesome. Eins recalled his struggle from when he had done it before, and sighed despite the fact that he did not need to breathe. That was not the only troublesome thing. His spine was the same way. The protrusion snagged his towel, and he could not clean them off easily in one quick go. He had to slowly clean each individual vertebra. At the beginning, 
Eins had taken great care in bathing himself. However, Eins soon began to find it tiresome, despite his supposed mental resilience. It took at least half an hour to bathe, and he could not help but think are you kidding me? After that, he decided to soak into soapy water and turn around inside it like a washing machine. That was a pretty good idea. The problem was that he did not feel clean. If he did not scrub himself, it did not feel like he had gotten all the dirt off him. Following that, he used a handled brush to scrub himself. That was quite effective. Granted, the soap and foam went everywhere, but it was not as though Eins was the one cleaning it anyway. Cleaning was the maid's job, and they were delighted at the chance to show their stuff. It was truly a win-win situation, however, even this good idea was flawed. That flaw was not knowing if he had really scrubbed himself clean. It was just like getting a cavity despite carefully brushing one's teeth, though he thought he had scrubbed himself from head to toe, he was still worried that he had missed scrubbing some part of himself. In the end, Eins hit on this solution, which was to let a slime engulf him. This technique. As I thought, it's truly revolutionary and unique, a perfect technique that can't be faulted, he muttered to himself as he looked at the blue slime crawling all over himself. Eins nodded happily, satisfied by the method he had invented for easy bathing. For all he knew, this might have been the best thing he had thought up since he came to this world. Well done, me. As Eins praised himself once more, he looked to the slime which industriously oozed all over him. How cute! Monsters like these were extremely vicious, they could dissolve their enemies with acid and they were strong enough to bend iron bars with ease, yet to Eins, they were his bathhouse attendants, who helped get him clean. To some extent, they felt like pets. Still, while slime baths are good, I'd like to take a regular bath sometime. There were all sorts of facilities on the ninth floor of Nazarick. One of them was a large bath. It was a complex of various bathing sub-facilities themed after a spa resort. Maybe I'll go bathe there and see what it's like. That said, bathing by himself was too boring. That being the case. All right. I'll get the guardians to go with me. It'd be good if there's a time when everyone's free. Ein smiled at his good idea. Nazarick time, 7.14. There were two types of maids in Nazarick. One group was the combat maids, as represented by Yuri Alpha, and the other was the regular maids who had no combat abilities. The latter were homunculi, with a combined racial and class level of one, and they were responsible for various jobs in the ninth and tenth floors of Nazarick. In particular, cleaning the various supreme beings' rooms was a task of utmost importance to them. One of these regular maids, known as Sixth, moved rapidly along the corridor, for she was in a rush. This was a simple maid technique not a special skill or anything and it carried her to the cafeteria. There was only one reason to go to the cafeteria at this time. When she arrived, almost all her colleagues had already gathered for breakfast and started eating. The cafeteria was predominantly white in color, with sparse decoration. The echo of the girl's cheerful chatter echoed off the walls like ripples in water. It would not have been much of a problem if there was only one person, but since there were many people speaking, their voices blended into one incomprehensible noise. On top of that, the sound of clinking tableware added to the din. The maids in the cafeteria could be separated into four main groups. The first three groups were sorted according to their creators. There were forty-one regular maids in total, but it was not because each supreme being had created their own maid. Rather, the regular maids were created by the triumvirate of Whitebrim, Hero Hero, and Coup de Grasse. Strictly speaking, the last group was not a proper group by itself. It was composed of those maids who had detached themselves from the first three groups in order to eat in silence, to eat while reading or to talk to maids who had been made by other supreme beings. Sixth, who had arrived late at the cafeteria, belonged to the last group. She waved to the maids made by the same supreme being as herself they were her sisters, in a sense, and then headed to her usual place. Good morning. Have you eaten? Good morning. And yes, we've already eaten. Breakfast was so good so creamy and fluffy and tasty. 
The person delivering that deadpan reply was called Fiore. She was bad at lying, but lied anyway. She had short hair and her maid skirt was similarly shortened to match her energetic appearance. Contrasting her was Lumiere, who had a neat look about her. There was a mysterious gleam in her blonde hair, which sparkled like there were stars in it. Good morning. Fiore, since you shouldn't need seconds, you can wait here for us. I haven't had breakfast yet, so I'm going to get some. Come, sixth, let's go. Lumiere stood, trailed closely by Fiore, who was frantically saying, I was just kidding, really. After concluding their usual dialogue, the three of them went over to the self-service buffet counter. Naturally, they had the maid called Increment, who was quietly reading a book beside them, watch over their seats. The first thing Sixth took at the buffet bar was a serving of crispy bacon. As a member of the faction which believed that soft bacon is the devil, she always went for that first. Next, she helped herself to some soup. Of the three flavors today soup of the day, corn, and onion, she selected the last. After that were sausages, French fries and danishes. Her other plate was piled high with onion salad, almost to the point of spilling. Finally, Sixth placed an order with a masked manservant. Um, I'll have triple cheese, double onions, and extra mushrooms. The manservant nodded, and began making the omelette. Sixth returned to her seat to put down her dishes, and then poured herself a glass of milk before returning to where the manservant was waiting with her freshly prepared omelette. Thank you very much. The flawless omelette was perfectly prepared, without a single singe mark on it, and she returned to her place just as her friends did. Then, let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. The three of them had their breakfast in silence. Slowly but steadily, they transferred the mountains of food, far in excess of what a normal girl would consume, from their plates into their bellies. It was because they all possessed increased appetites, as a racial penalty. Because of that, even though they were among friends, they never talked while eating. Fiore chewed while her cheeks were bulging with food, Lumiere ate elegantly, but her fork moved at a ferocious speed, and Sixth ate at a rate in between the two. Soon, their plates had emptied with startling swiftness, and the three of them downed their glasses after that. How you? The three of them exhaled, the scent of milk heavy on their breath, and then looked at each other. Seconds. Sounds good, but let's take a break first. I approve feeling kinda stuffed now, anyway. Say, Sixth, isn't it your turn to serve Ein Summer today? You seem more determined than usual today. Fiore smiled mischievously, and so did Sixth. Lucky you, how much longer will it be until it's my turn? Lumiere counted off the days on her fingers. The rooms of Nazarick's supreme rulers were massive in scale, so much so that one person would need half a day or more to clean one of them carefully. While the maids had the raw numbers to clean them all on a daily basis, even with Albedo's spare room factored in, that would require a lot of people to work all day without any rest. However, this was not a problem to the maids. They had been created by the rulers of the great underground tomb of Nazarick, the Guild Ein's all gown, it was only fitting that they should work their fingers to the bone for them, because it was an act of venerating their gods. And then, these fanatical workers had been told to stop by the godlike being, Ein's all gown. Eins knew the hardships of working under unethical companies, and he could not bear to let these girls, who were like his friend's daughters, suffer like that. He had told them, don't clean the unused rooms so frequently, and then you will work and rest in shifts. Thus, the regular maids of Nazarick were organized into two shifts, the day shift and the night shift. The former had thirty people and the latter had ten, while the one remaining person got the day off. After calculating the working days for the maids, the announcement that they would have a break every forty-one days was met with complaints. It was not that there were too few days off, but the opposite, they requested that the day off be cancelled. Ultimately, working for the supreme beings was the reason for their existence. Telling them that they did not have to work damaged their sense of self-worth and made them feel like they were no longer needed. As such, the maids decided to discuss the matter with Eins. They said, 
please don't take our jobs, we want to do it all day and night, and so on. Eins shot the suggestion down on the spot. The concept of fatigue existed in Yggdrasil and while it could be easily remedied with magic, there was no guarantee that fatigue would be healed as easily in this world. Even with magic, he was worried that it would steadily degrade their ability to function, like a cogwheel losing its teeth. Yet, the maids adamantly refused to back down. Faced with their tears, Eins gave in and proposed a new type of work for them. They would have to personally serve Eins. That task entailed staying by Eins's side to attend to his every need and whim, and the maids would take turns filling that role. This offer was as tempting as sugar sprinkled with honey to the maids, whose greatest joy in life was to serve the supreme beings. They accepted the suggestion without a second thought, along with the order that you need to take care of yourselves and rest well the day before, so you can serve with all your strength when it's your turn. We need our nutrients so we can work hard, you know. Plus, depending on the circumstances, you might need to skip a meal too. Of course, when you serve iron summer, your brain needs all the nutrients it can get. I want something sweet. The three girls nodded in unison. Incidentally, all the maids carried several meals worth of candy and other such treats on them. They would snack on them whenever they had free time while serving Eins. However, be it fortunate or not, they simply could not find that free time. As such, the morning meal was very important to them. Have you heard? They say they're going to cook using ingredients from the outside world and have a food tasting, the other two gasped at sixth statement. I expected as much, sixth thought. Few of the maids thought well of the outside world, the world that lay beyond Nazarick. Some of them felt that the outside world was inferior to Nazarick, but most of them were afraid of it, because the floor right above their home, the eighth floor, had once been invaded by people from the outside. Will all the maids be attending the tasting? Or will only a few of us be allowed to go? Just as Six was about to answer Fiore's question, the atmosphere in the cafeteria changed. The air itself seemed to heat up. As the newcomer came into the maid's sight, they squealed in delight. Shizu Chan. It's Shizu Chan. The person who had just entered the cafeteria was one of the Pleiades, CZ. The battle maids were like idols to the regular maids, and CZ was the most popular of them all. There were frequent struggles to sit next to her. Ah, the penguins here too. CZ held a penguin under her arm, and a worried-looking manservant was trailing behind her. It was the assistant butler, Eclair. He flapped his wings with all his strength, but there was no way he could escape with the strength of a level one birdman. His desperate struggles quickly lost their vigor as the maids looked on. In the end, the penguin ran out of strength and went limp, like a real stuffed doll. Shizu Chan. Over here, over here. Come eat with us. No, come over here. Shizu Chan. Just throw that butler away. Over there would be fine. Send that useless bird to the head chef, at least he'll contribute to Nazarick that way. There was a marked difference in the reception that the assistant butler and CZ received from the maids, but that could not be helped. He was disliked because he loudly proclaimed that he wanted to take over Nazarick, despite being a mere assistant butler. Even if he had been created that way by the supreme beings, his frequent announcements of those wild words made him quite unbearable. CZ peered through the commotion around her, as though she was searching for someone the adorable way in which she did so, like she was a child who did not know where to sit, made many of the maids' hearts beat faster. Even that bird looks cute when Shizu Chan holds him, how strange. I want a Shizu Chan hug pillow. Albedo Summer seems to know how to make those, I wonder if she'll teach me. Albedo Summer is very kind, I'm sure she'll agree. Why don't you try asking her next time? The sound of a book closing with an audible thud came from the next table over, and when Sixth turned to look, her eyes met increments. This place is getting noisy, so I'm going back. Since you're attending to Ein Summer today, you should probably finish breakfast quickly and head over to him. Any mistakes you make will reflect on all of us. Having said her piece, Increment turned and left without waiting for a reply. 
As she watched her fellow maid leave, Sixth took out her pocket watch. Fortunately, she still had some time. After freshening up, she should be just in time. All right, I'll go grab some more stuff to eat while everyone's focused on Shizu Chan. Fiore and Lumiere nodded at Sixth's idea. Oh, that's a nice idea, Sue. The sudden answer from the side made the three maids gasp. Lu Lupus Regina San. With hands clasped over her lurching heart, Sixth turned to face the source of the voice. There had been nobody there just a moment ago, but Lupus Regina had appeared out of nowhere while everyone was distracted by Shizu and looking away. She sat sideways on a chair with her legs up on the table and even had a share of her own food. Please don't scare us like that, honestly. Fiore was still clinging tightly to Lumiere, her eyebrows pressed into a shape. My heart almost jumped out of my mouth. Lumiere barely paid any attention to Fiore, who was clinging to her. She spoke quietly, like she had been scared out of her wits. The three of them directed reproachful voices at Lupus Regina, yet they were actually just a little happy inside. That was because Lupus Regina was the only one of the battle maids who treated them like friends, although her actions were hard to predict. She spent her time moving between the different maid groups, so being approached by her was a sign of good fortune. The best proof was how some of the others were looking at Sixth and her group with envious eyes. Nishishi, seems my experiments in the village didn't go to waste, you three gave me some pretty amusing reactions. The way Lucas Regina supported her face with her arm on the table, while having an evil grin on her face, made her look a little like a cat out of the storybooks. Although her smile was nothing but mischievous, it was still surprisingly charming. Sixth watched the battle maid smile for a while, utterly fascinated by her. The other two seemed to feel the same way, but the first to recover was Fiore. The village? Fiore tilted her head which made her short bob hair brush against Lumiere's face. Lumiere resisted the urge to sneeze and shoved Fiore away, and then she rearranged herself so she was looking Lupus Regina straight in the face. Lupus Regina San, you work outside, right? Yup, in the human village Sue. Humans, huh? It must be tough. Lumiere looked at Lupus Regina with sympathetic eyes. Nah, it's nothing like that. Since Ein Summer ordered it, it's worth doing, although, I have to say, it's kind of boring. How should I put this? It would be so much more fun to squish them beneath my feet. Sixth had no particular opinion about that statement. Humans and their villages and whatnot were unimportant to her. Whether they prospered or were destroyed, the only thing that mattered was if they were useful to Nazarick. Come to think of it, Ein Summer said that village was very valuable, but I don't see it Sue. Given Ein Summer's personality, he must have said so because he pitied the miserable little humans there. No, no, Ein Summer's like a hurricane of death. I'm sure he's just waiting for the right moment to kill them all, right? What are you saying? Don't you know Ein Summer is a genius? All this must be part of his plan. Ara, I can't pretend I didn't hear that. Isn't Ein Summer's power the best part of him Sue? The four beautiful girls stared at each other, none of them willing to back down. Ein Summer is a beautiful, compassionate person. Ein Summer is death, come for this world. Ein Summer is an incomparable hero. Oh, looks like everyone has a different impression of Ein Summer. Then, let's have a competition. We'll see who can pick out the most suitable title for Ein Summer. In an instant, everyone went silent. Lupus Regina was wearing her usual smile, but she had a certain understanding of her liege's qualities and was unwilling to admit defeat. However, Sixth and her two friends felt the same way. The regular maids were weak beings, but their respect and adoration of their master was no less than that of anyone else's. Then, the three of you may start off Sue. In that case. Lumiere was the first to speak. Then, as I said earlier, I wish to praise Ein Summer's beauty, so how about a figure of beautiful porcelain, shining and flawless, the gentle lord of mercy? Next was Fiore. Well, if we're going to praise Ein Summer, then we should praise his awesome power, right? As a ruler of death, 
What could be more fitting than memento mori? 5. The third was sixth. Ein Summer was the one who coordinated the supreme beings, so his management skills would be excellent. So he is a wise king. Although everyone's names fitted their master well, in the end they all thought that their own choice was the best. Lupus Regina coughed gently as sixth, Fiore and Lumiere looked at her. With a proud look on her face, she said. In the end, we should call him the absolutely strongest and most. There you are. The source of the calm voice was seized. The assistant butler Eclair she had been holding under her arm had vanished to parts unknown. Stop using, invisibility, all the time. So's it's a habit too. And you started eating, a sun-hot anger burned under Cz's emotionless face. Sixth had the feeling that she should not be here any longer. Ah, I have to go to Iron Summer. Then, I'll go too. I'll send you along. Sixth and the others quietly vacated their seats, though they did feel a little bad ignoring Lupus Regina's pleading looks toward them. In the end, they did not manage to get seconds. It was a bit of a shame, but she had to pull herself together now. Sixth paid no heed to the danger in the air behind them. Instead, she lightly slapped her cheeks to focus herself. Her face had the stern, brave expression of a soldier heading off to a war, but her footsteps were light and fast. Nazarick Time, 9.20 This was the sixth floor of the great underground tomb of Nazarick. The undead which roamed the tomb were nowhere in sight, but magical beasts such as the controlled by Aura defended this location in place of pop monsters. This area known as the most expansive in the great underground tomb of Nazarick was largely covered by dense forest, to the point where it could be described as a sea of trees. That said, the past members of the Guild Iron's All Gown were very meticulous about details they certainly would not paint this area green and be done with it. There was a coliseum here, a giant tree, traces of a village which had been swallowed up by the jungle, a lake, a venomous cave, a twisted grove, a mangrove forest and a bottomless swamp, all of which added variety to the sea of trees. Recently, they had even built a small village to receive new residents. In the center of this sea of trees was a big lake that said, it was still smaller than the underground lake area on the fourth floor which was surrounded not by forest, but by grassland. While the grassland and lake were fairly small when compared to the entirety of the sixth floor, it was still large enough for their purposes. There the first of them was the floor guardian Aura. She rode easily atop a gigantic wolf with jet black fur, and just a glance was enough to tell that she was an old hand at this. However, that was only to be expected. After all, when she patrolled this large area, she preferred to do so while riding the magical beasts under her dominion, although running would have been easy enough, given her preternatural physical abilities. There were two other people. One of them was the guardian overseer, Albedo. She was not wearing her usual, beautiful white dress, but the black full-plate armor which she donned for combat. However, she was not carrying her weapon or shield. The other was Shultir. She looked the same as always, and her eyes had a strange look which was less of interest than enjoyment. Then, let's begin come, my mount. The skill Albedo used was called, Summon Mount. A magical beast slowly emerged out of nowhere, as black as the armor she wore. This beast had a white mane and tail, and it resembled a horse. It was clad in a suit of full plate barding, and it was fitted with reins and a saddle. It was slightly smaller than a horse, however, its presence was far more oppressive than that of an ordinary horse. The most defining difference could be found on its head. There, one would find two horns that protruded straight outwards. The first response to the magical beast which had suddenly appeared came from Aura, who knew the most about such creatures. Oh! It's not like an ordinary bicorn. Its horns are strong and it looks really beefy too. Fufu, Albedo laughed. That's right. This bicorn has been strengthened by my abilities into a war bicorn lord. Well, it's actually a level 100 bicorn. Can it fly? No, it can't. It's fundamentally the same as a regular bicorn, 
It doesn't have any special abilities, just improved stamina, strength and dexterity. Looks like you can't really strengthen your mount without rider-type skills in that case, since its special abilities are too weak, it might get in the way if it took part in our level 100 battles. Indeed. However, I can make up for that by using my skills to protect this boy, so it can fight for longer periods, but doesn't that mean you'll be wasting your resources on it? It'll be a big hassle in combat, right? Why not power it up by changing its gear? I hear mount-type monsters can be equipped with barding and horseshoes and so on. Indeed. You can change the equipment of mounts summoned through skills. It's related to the question asked just now, Aura, for instance, I could equip it with horseshoes that grant flight, and it would be able to fly. However, I've already given it magic items to boost its speed. It really is a tough decision. Albedo lightly patted the flank of the magical beast. Perhaps she had used too much force, but the bicorn shuddered. There was no way a magical beast she had summoned would be thrown off balance by just that much. Just as Albedo frowned while wondering if it was making a fool of her, Aura asked a question. Say, does it have a name? It's a bicorn, right? Didn't you just say so yourself? No, I don't mean the name of its species, I mean its name as an individual. Does it need one? She looked to Shultir for her reaction. The vampire said nothing, simply shrugged. Surely it needs one, right? Isn't it your pet, Albedo? Well, it's not really a pet. Besides, do I really summon the same one each time? As she heard Albedo's question, Shultir came up with a great idea, which she decided to share. How about asking Q Hyuku? He excels at summoning his comrades, so he ought to know a lot about this sort of thing. Give me a break. He's a fellow member of Nazarick, and I shouldn't hate him, but... Ah, indeed. They don't mean ill, but they crawl into your clothes all the same. However, Entima seems to visit him from time to time. That's gross stop talking about things that make me feel all itchy. That place really is a house of horrors. I might be in charge of that floor, but I honestly do not wish to go in there. Shultir, did you know? Entima calls that place the snack room, UGE. Seriously? Seriously? You are I don't want to go near Entima ever again. Albedo felt the same way. She did not wish to approach anyone who could call that sort of thing a snack. Just as the mood started to turn queer, Aura decided to raise her voice and clear the air. Anyway, why don't you name it? Indeed. If you think naming it is better, then I shall. Albedo muttered to herself as she fell into contemplation. Since she was going to name her mount, then obviously she had to give it a name that would not embarrass her. She thought of various words and phrases, and then a flash of inspiration struck her as a song played in her head. What are you mumbling about? Ah, my apologies, Albedo said, as though she had just woken from a dream. Well, if I'm summer permits, I would like to give it a name that represents how I feel, top of the world. Hmm, that's a good name. By top of the world, you mean I'm summer, right? Albedo smiled but did not answer, Shultir's eyebrows quirked up at a dangerous angle. As the tension built in the air, it was Aura who had to break them up, as usual. Well, it's not like anything will happen. Anyway, since you've called out your bicorn, let's perform the next experiment. Hmm, I understand. Having been treated as a child throwing a tantrum, Shultir narrowed her eyes and glared at Albedo as she turned to the bicorn and put a grieved foot on the stirrups. Albedo mounted up on it with a grace that did not seem like it had come from someone wearing armor. The moment she touched the saddle, she could feel the bicorn's body quivering through the point of contact. What's wrong? Albedo could not help exclaiming. She could not think of any reason why this level 100 bicorn would be unsteady on its feet. She suddenly recalled what had happened when she had patted the bicorn. Could it be that some problem had occurred then? If that were the case, then what was the cause? Aura. She'll tear. Something strange is going on with my bicorn, could you help me take a look? Just then, the bicorn began to wobble. 
It looked like it could no longer stand up. The two of them looked at it and realized that there was something abnormal going on here. In. In any case, you should get off first, Albedo. Al. All right. After hearing Aura say so, Albedo finally responded by jumping off the creature. The wobbling bicorn promptly collapsed. It was panting heavily and its coat was covered in a fine sheen of sweat. Albedo, did you get fat? Shultia was not saying that to make fun of her. Any observer would have thought the same thing. How rude. I'm always watching my weight because I've got more muscle than most. Then, could it be that its muscles wasted away because you haven't been riding it regularly? By the way, I raise all my kids free range, and I often take them patrolling around the sixth floor. Eh? How could that be? Speaking of which, summon mount, isn't it just like a normal summoned monster? There's no way it could get weaker, would you like me to ride it? I'm sorry, but it won't work. This is my mount, and nobody else can ride it. If anyone tries, it'll automatically unsummon itself. Then how about asking the mount itself? Hey, Bicorn, what's wrong? Aura asked it a question. It was not that Aura could speak with horses, but magical beasts like Bicorns ought to have pretty high intelligence, so Aura hoped that it would understand human speech. Of course, the Bicorn could not speak, so all it could do was neigh like a horse. It can't speak. Don't tell me it can't write either. The Bicorn whinnied affirmatively. The three of them looked at each other. Aura, can you use your skills to do something amazing? I can't. Besides, what do you mean by amazing? Didn't you ask me what abilities I had when we had our one-on-one -on -one chat a long time ago? Don't tell me you forgot that too, Guardian Overseer Dono. Aura. How do you usually communicate with Fenrir, then? I just tell him to do this and that, so you speak to him, right? So if you try, you should be able to communicate with this bicorn, am I correct? Just because I can communicate with the beasts I control doesn't mean I can speak to all beasts. And besides, I already tried. The lizardmen have a pet called Rororo, right? I don't know why, but I just can't get through to him. The three of them looked at each other once more. If we're stuck, the only one we can turn to is Demiurge, after all. Unfortunately, Demiurge is now working abroad on Iron Summer's orders. He hasn't spent much time in Nazarick recently. I can contact him, but frankly speaking, I don't really want to consult to him if it's not related to work. A look of jealousy appeared in Shultir and Aura's eyes. Demiurge who ran around working for their master was the object of the Guardian's envy. Ah, I really do envy him. I know that the defense of Nazarick is an important job, but if nobody invades, then we won't have a chance to show our stuff, and it makes me wonder if I'm actually useful. I want to go outside and accomplish something so I can work hard for Iron Summer. All I've done recently is make mistakes. Don't worry, Shiltir. I think that you'll have the chance to work for Iron Summer soon No, I'm sure you'll have the chance to do so. But you need to be a bit smarter, otherwise that might be a bit tricky. Don't you think that's... a little harsh? Ah, the fact is, you did mess up. You need to produce results worthy of a guardian. Shaltia grit her teeth, and then suddenly her face brightened up, as though a light bulb had just switched itself on above her head. Coo, 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 now why are you all talking bad about me? What I wanted to say was that if Demiurge wasn't around and we couldn't ask him, then I would lend you a helping hand instead. Well, since it can't be helped, I'll look it up for you. Shiltia took out a book. It appeared thick and heavy, like it had a thousand pages at the very least. However, to Shiltia who looked like a girl on the outside but who was anything but on the inside its weight was nothing much, oh. Don't tell me, don't tell me that's. HNNNG, a treasure bestowed upon you by Ein Summer. It was not just Aura, even Albedo looked upon Shiltia with jealousy in her eyes. Indeed. This is the Encyclopedia Perorincino Summer. It's my reward for completing Iron Summer's orders. While this was more of a consolation prize come appreciation award, 
to Shiltia it was instead the best form of praise, and she smiled in satisfaction. No, that was only natural. An item from her creator was more valuable than any form of encouragement. This book was called the Encyclopedia. It was an item every player received after starting the game, and it could not be stolen or lost unless its owner chose to dispose of it. In addition, it was unique. Yggdrasil was a game of enjoying the unknown, and this item could be said to be a physical expression of the developer's desire for players to transform the unknown into the known. This was because the encyclopedia recorded the visual data of all the monsters a player had ever encountered. However, it did not display statistics the monster's ability scores but only its typical appearance and name. If it was a monster from mythology, it would also display the relevant contents from the myth in question and other relevant information. In order to make effective use of this book-shaped item, one would need to personally enter the information which one had gathered into the book. Such information included a monster's special abilities or its weaknesses and so on. The encyclopedia that Shiltia possessed had once belonged to the man called Perorincino, and he was the one who entered the data within that book. Eines remembered that he had left this item in the treasury when he had quit the game, and so he handed it to Shiltia. However, a lot of the content which Perorincino added had been erased. It was as though Perorincino were afraid of leaving it behind and deleted it. As a result, the item was not very useful, but Shiltia did not mind. This was an item that her creator had once used, that was the important thing. Be by Bicon, Shiltia muttered as she flipped through the pages. Aura and Albedo leaned in to take a look, but Shiltia used her body to cover up the book and then backed up, before fixing the two of them in place with a sharp glare. Humph that's fine. I too have a bracelet gifted to me by Ein Summer. Aura gently caressed her silver wristband. Similarly, Albedo stroked the ring on her left index finger. However, she had not been the only one to receive that ring. I want a special reward for me and me alone. I want a special item from Ein Summer. Just as Albedo began caressing her abdomen, Shiltia exclaimed. It would seem she had found the page she was looking for. By corn. Got it, let me see. Shiltia suddenly froze and looked up in shock, then stared at Albedo. WH what is it? Is something wrong? Albedo nervously questioned Shiltia as she looked at the book again and read the entry. A mutant species of unicorn, just as unicorns are supposed to be associated with purity, bicorns are associated with impurity. Unicorns will only allow pure maidens to ride them, but conversely, bicorns will never allow pure maidens to ride them. Ha! Huh? As Shiltia read that part, Aura's eyes went so wide it seemed as though they would fall out of their sockets. No way. Don't tell me albedos, eh? What do you mean no way? What do you take me for? Eh, but aren't you a succubus, albedo? S. Sue sucks succubus. Shiltia seemed to be confused and she began searching for the succubus entry. That's right, I'm a succubus. But I don't have any experience with men, sorry about that. But what can I do about it? I'm the guardian overseer, so I'm always stuck in the throne room. I hardly ever get to meet anyone else. Besides, Ein Summer has never called me to his bed. And I don't want to do anything like that with men who aren't Ein Summer. Albedo hung her head, and then she suddenly jerked it up again, since you put it that way. Albedo glanced at Aura, then shook her head. If Aura was not like that, there would be a huge problem. How about you, Shiltia? I don't have any experience with men. Now, women are a different matter. Aura did not understand for a moment and tilted her head. Then, she seemed to get it, because she wrinkled her brow and went you were as her face seized up and wordlessly said no, thank you. Ah. It's because there aren't any good men around. I like the dead, but rotting corpses are just. Right? Right? Don't look to me for approval, Shiltia. Your fetishes are just too weird and I can't understand them. The three of them looked at each other, then simultaneously averted their eyes. They had silently agreed to end this topic here. All right, 
so at least we know why I can't ride a bike or now. I can't believe that was the reason. Albedo's face twisted in unhappiness. The bicorn thought it had been scolded and curled up into a ball, whom this is like sealing off part of Albedo's strength. Still, it's not like you're really good at mounted combat anyway. It's just one ability you can't use, right? If you can't ride your bicorn, then how about one of Aura's beasts? Maybe a unicorn might be good. Hmm, I don't have a unicorn. Though I want one. Isn't there a better way? It'll be fine if Ein Summer helps me ride the bicorn, right? Albedo's smile seemed to tell the other two that there was no better way than that. That's sly. Humph. Albedo humphed at Shiltir. How rude, Shiltir. This is necessary in order for me to make full use of my powers as guardian overseer of Nazarick for Ein Summer. Fufufu. Humph. So you can't get Ein Summer's love without using your official duties as an excuse. That's just too sad for a woman. It means you can't win it with your charm alone. Ha! Huh? Both of them glared at each other. Aura could not bear them any more and said. I say, you two seem to have wandered off into a weird topic, would you mind leaving it at that? Stop talking about these pointless things, besides, it's not like it's going to cause a problem right away. Can't you summon other mounts? I have a magic item which can summon me a steed. Then isn't that enough? There's no problem at all. Using a magic item to summon a mount needs me to change my gear or take out the item, so it's more effort than just summoning a mount with a skill. And this bicorn has much better fighting power. Then have the bicorn take your enemy's attacks and use the opening to summon a mount. That's a basic tactic for a beast tamer. It seems that's the only way it can be used. That would mean you've become weaker, albedo. Could you not speak like you're laughing in at others' misfortune? Don't you delight in my suffering too, albedo? Do not. Do too. Both sides went back and forth. Honestly, I've had it with the two of you. A. Stop glaring at each other already. How about going elsewhere? Ein's summer granted us time off, after all, that's right. Albedo went with that, and Shiltir who had been arguing with her nodded as well. However. He asked us to take time off, but what should we do? We were made to protect the great underground too of Nazarick and work for the various supreme beings. Working is our life. Even so, when Ein Summer wants us to rest, we have to rest. The three of them had gathered here because their master had told them, you all work hard every day. Since free time like this is hard to come by, you female guardians should arrange to go out and have fun together. We've had fun, so does this mean we're going to disperse? Does this really count as fun? I have my doubts about that. Granted, we had some fun, but I still have my doubts. That's right, what do you usually do? I patrol between the first to the third floor. Then I collect feedback from the area guardians, or I check on the readiness of the entire floor. If I have time, I take a bath, or get a facial? I'm surprised that you're so hard-working, what do you mean by surprised? Bathing. How about you, Aura? Hmm, when Mare stays in the Colosseum, I patrol the forest. A bunch of newcomers arrived recently, after all. Then I go home and sleep. That's all, I guess. That's it. Aura and Shiltia's faces were filled with surprise. That's it, that's it. The newcomers you mentioned ought to be the residents of the village which was just built on this floor, right? I haven't been there yet. Let's go together. Eh? Really? Shiltia, you've been there before, right? I have. Really? As she saw the puzzled look on Albedo's face, Aura explained. Actually, the other guardians have all been here too. First was Kokaitis, for the lizardman. Demiurge came round too, to check on the situation. The others also drop by from time to time. Hmm then let's go take a look. Besides, it's not all that far away. Nazarick Time, 9.38 the village built in the sixth floor of Nazarick was little more than a row of ten-odd log houses, 
it barely qualified as a settlement. There was a crop field on the right side of the village, and on the left was an orchard that was several times larger than the crop field. Naturally, it was surrounded by forest, and when one looked down from above, it might resemble a hole in the forest, or a green hole. The trees here had been felled and then dug up by the roots, so by right the ground ought to have been uneven. However, the ground in the village was unnaturally level. That was the effect of mare's magic. Many people could be seen working hard in the orchard. The first person they saw was a human-looking female, whose skin was as lustrous as tree bark. Beside her was a creature which could only be described as a walking tree. The former was a dryad, while the latter was a monster known as a trent. The trent placed the dryad on its branch-like hands and raised her to the upper reaches of a fruit tree. There's also ten or so lizardmen living here. Sometimes they go to the north to the lake where we just visited to have fun. It's not like they live in the water anyway. How strange. The village is bigger than the last time I came. There seem to be more residents too. That's right. That's because we found a few species who were allowed to enter Nazarick after we conquered the great forest of Tob. Species who were allowed to enter Nazarick. I recall the conditions were, they have to be heteromorphs, they must not need food, and they have to be good-natured, right? Mm, that's what Ein Summer told us. Although, the must-not-need-food condition is more of must-be-self-sufficient. The dryads and treants absorb nutrients from the earth so they don't need to eat in particular. Although, it'll be bad if the earth's nutrients run out, or if it doesn't rain. Oh does mare make rain with magic? Or is it an item? That's basically mare's job. Same with restoring the earth's nutrients. Some spells allow for big harvests, and I heard those spells can fully restore the earth's nutrients. The dryads and treants all say it's so delicious that they'll get fat. But I don't know about the taste. As Shaltir chatted with Aura, Albedo slowly surveyed the village with a cold, clinical gaze reserved for examining experimental test subjects. Then, a hint of emotion crept into her eyes for the first time. Aura? That ought to be sous chef in the fields, right? What's he doing? They looked along her line of sight, and there, within a patch of fenced-off land seemingly hiding behind a large stalk with red fruits growing all over it was a mushroom-like monster squirming around. At a closer look, he was wearing clothes which he did not mind getting dirty as he picked the red fruits. It's just like what you saw. They sometimes come here to gather ingredients, and they grow their own plants. Let's go take a look. Albedo and Shiltir looked at each other. After verifying that neither of them were against it, and that it would be fine as long as they did not interfere with their colleagues' work, they went over to take a look. Hi working up a sweat as always, I see. As he heard Aura's cheerful voice, Sous-Chef raised its head to look at the three of them. Well, my body doesn't really sweat. Sous-Chef grunted like an old man as he stood up and straightened his back. Although he was hunched over in a posture of working the fields, the fact that he had no waist his body was the same thickness from top to bottom, so there was no part of him that was quickly identifiable as a waist meant that they could not tell if his back really ached or if he had done so to change his mood. After that, Sue Chef rotated his neck, like someone with shoulder aches. His head was like a toadstool's cap, coated with some kind of purplish-red liquid which looked like it might drip off at any time, but the fact was that it was as solid and mysteriously stretchy as dried glue, so there was no way it would drip off or splash around. Say, are those tomatoes? Albedo seemed interested in what Sue Chef was holding, and so she asked him. He brought the fruits before his eyes, then wiggled his head in bafflement. Indeed, they are tomatoes. They are tomatoes as everyone knows them. They are not the type which explode after absorbing sunlight, attack people, or radiate golden light when you cut them open, they are ordinary tomatoes. In other words, they're edible, commonly available and ordinary tomatoes, right? Indeed. I do not have the special skills needed to grow vegetables that can produce special effects. Given your interest in these tomatoes, does that mean you are interested in tomato dishes? Unfortunately, I can only make drinks. No, I was simply asking out of curiosity. 
I believe she'll tears the one who wants to eat tomato dishes. Why does everyone think vampires like tomato juice? Even if the undead eat something, they won't gain any buffs from it. A lot of people in Nazarick don't need to eat. Thanks to certain items, most of the NPCs no longer needed to eat or drink, there's nothing to be done about it. Food and drink only add to the expenses of sustaining Nazarick. We'd have to spend a lot of money if everyone ate as much as your magical beasts. Ah, wouldn't it be better for me to go outside to make some money? There's no need for that. That's because Ein Summer and the other supreme beings made careful calculations when building this tomb in order to balance income and spending. Oh, so that's why he decreed that only self-sufficient species could enter here. That way, no matter how many came in, the income balance would remain intact. Indeed. A, hey, didn't you know about this? Albedo looked at each of the three others present. How vexing. Not understanding the very place you protect is a very big problem. I'll make some time in future and explain everything to you in detail. Albedo sighed, then casually regarded the fields. It was then that she noticed that she had seen the leaves of a row of certain plants before. Those are carrots. No, are they magic carrots? No, they are not. Have you not heard of them before, Overseer Dono? What do you mean? Sue Chef's eyes turned to Aura. Ah, she did not. I see, she did not tell you about them. Then, what shall we do, Aura Summer? Will you call them, Aura Summer? Surely you must have trained them by now? I already filed a report on it Aura smiled wickedly. Then, she took a deep breath, then bellowed long live Ein's all gown. The row of leaves suddenly reacted to her words and began moving. They wiggled vigorously from side to side, then pulled themselves out of the earth, and their carrot-like roots popped up onto the surface. They resembled Asian ginsengs, but they were distinctly different from those. They had four discrete limbs, and they moved deliberately and not through reflex. The uppermost parts of the roots near the stem bore cavities and shadows which resembled eyes and mouths. Shultia's eyes went wide and she spoke the name of these monsters. Could those be mandrakes? We shouldn't have anything like that in Nazarick. Ah. That's it. I saw the report, but this is the first time I've personally seen one. The mandrakes chorused Long Live Ein's All Gown, Long Live Ein's All Gown. As they formed up into ranks. They aren't too smart really. Their relatives such as the Galgen Manlin, all runners and all runs ought to be smarter. But I didn't find any of those when I did a quick search of that forest. However, the forest is big, so maybe I just haven't found them yet. Also, there's a huge underground cave that leads into the mountains. There seems to be a myconid settlement there, but I haven't made a move on them yet. Still, teaching them to speak like that must have been difficult. I'm very impressed, Sue Chef explained as he picked up one of the mandrakes who were lined up in a row. The mandrake struggled, apparently having its stem grabbed was painful. Long live Ein's all gown. Long live Ein's all gown. The mandrakes broke their ranks to encircle Sue Chef, as though to protest the mistreatment of their friend. During this time, they said the same thing as before. Forgive my rudeness. Aura Summer, can you ask them to return? Okay Tilda Wright. Go back. Sue Chef gently placed the mandrake back on the ground, and the others followed it as they crawled back into the holes they had occupied just now. In just a few seconds, the mandrakes were back underground, as though they were hibernating for winter. I see it's like an animal's call. You could say that. They simply cry it out like a parrot imitating speech, they don't really know what they're saying. Apparently, there's a minimum level of intelligence, below which you can't understand speech. However, that's still under investigation. Although, all that is from Demiurge Summer, I am simply repeating what I have heard, Sue Chef said. Hmm that's right, Albedo, can I ask you a question? As the guardian overseer, isn't it bad that you don't know about the newcomers? What if a spy came in with them? Before Albedo could answer, somebody else voiced an objection. Ah ha ha ha, that's funny, Shiltia. It's true that the sixth floor is very large, 
so it's only natural that you might think that capturing and slaughtering intruders would be difficult. Certainly, it would be troublesome if they managed to escape from the Colosseum and ran around like little spiders. Her laughter was hollow, and her eyes were as cold as ice. But don't you think you're looking down on me? This place is my hunting ground. Even if they dispersed, I could swiftly hunt down and kill every last one of them. Honestly, even if those people somehow managed to escape the sixth floor and tried to harm Ein Summer, they would have to pass through the blazing world of the seventh floor, and then there's the inviolable eighth floor to worry about. Even if they wanted to escape, they would have to pass through the frozen hell of the fifth floor, the dark waters of the fourth floor, and then your levels. Do you think that's possible? Shiltia shook her head, not at all. And that's how it is. Therefore, there's no need to worry no matter how many newcomers there are on this floor. Aura took the words out of my mouth. <clears throat> In any case, there's a plan going on now to gather all kinds of creatures here. Huh? Isn't it just plant-type monsters? As she heard Aura's surprised question, Albedo smiled and answered. That was the plan in the beginning, but after some observation, we found that no problems came up thanks to Aura and Mare's hard work, so the plan was amended and expanded. That said, this is only at a draft stage, and there's no guarantee that it'll be put into practice. Therefore, even a floor guardian like yourself has not been informed yet. Albedo told them to keep it a secret, and then she described the plan. The name of the plan is Project Utopia. It is a large-scale project beginning with the secret base that Aura built, and its end stage is to gather monsters who can get along with humanity and have them live here. Why is getting along with humanity in particular a condition? Albedo smiled, as though implying I knew you'd say. That smile looked terribly evil. That is the key to the entire plan, the focus of Project Utopia. Permit me to be blunt, but I find it hard to understand. This Nazarick is a haven for the supreme beings, and we labor for its sake. Why has it been named that way? This is in order to let the outside world believe that we can coexist with other races. I see. So that was the aim. No way, Shultia actually understood it. Shultia's face filled with an expression that could shatter a million-year-old love, and she glared angrily at Aura. Do you take me for a retard? Wait. Hang on, Shultia. Might I trouble you to reflect on what you usually say and do before asking me that? Please, just think about it for just a bit. And indeed, for just a moment, Shultia thought back on everything she had said and done until now, and her pupils widened like that of a dead creature. After that, her eyes roved all over, like they were being tossed in stormy waves. After seeing her utterly pathetic state, Albedo graciously steered the conversation back on track. Ah, uh, in any case, Ein Summer came up with this plan. When we discussed the sixth floor, Ein Summer once mentioned that he would like to collect various monsters. Surely someone with a limited understanding of the world would never have been able to come up with an idea like that. In the past, I discussed Ein Summer's wisdom with Demiurge, and the conclusion we reached was that Ein Summer is a true genius. Anyone would know that Ein Summer is a genius, though I hear great men tend to speak little. Did Demiurge say that? Honestly. Ein Summer never simply states his thoughts, and sometimes he does mysterious things. Still, as the saying goes, true courage seems cowardly, while great wisdom appears foolish. That's the sort of person Ein Summer is. Albedo's eyes were moist, and she shook her head. I did not even expect Ein Summer to create the persona of the adventurer Momen. Truly, he is an awesome man. I did not expect everything that took place until now to be in the palm of Ein Summer's hand. Momen is Ein Summer posing as an adventurer, right? What's it for? Soon you will understand. The Momen persona will become the bedrock of Ein Summer's rule. Ein Summer is far too amazing. Perhaps it was his hidden hand at work behind Demiurge's suggestion. What are you mumbling about over there? It's kind of scary. Shultia's voice called Albedo back to her senses, and after coughing lightly, she regarded the faces of the other three. Uh, where was I? Right, right, right. 
everything Ayn Summer says and does contains great meaning. Therefore, even if you can't reach his level, you need to try your best to find Summer's true intentions from his words. That'll be hard. Ein Summer's just too smart ah, it's a spear needle. Two balls of white fluff, each over two meters tall, appeared from inside the village and slowly made their way to Aura's side. They were magical beasts who looked like Angora rabbits. They're cute. Shaltia stroked one of the fur balls standing beside Aura. They're so soft, I want to raise one. They feel comfortable, don't they? However, when they encounter enemies, they become as sharp as needles, you know. Spear needles were level 67 monsters. Once they entered combat mode, they would become a ball of extremely dense spines. If the spear needles were killed in this state, their fur would not return to their original soft state. Therefore, when hunting them, one would have to take them unawares and instantly kill them. That was why the players who hunted them were often much higher level than they were. Eh? Really? That's scary. Shaltia might have said that, but she was still caressing them non-stop. However, if I don't give the order, they won't go into a combat state. Now, if there were enemies nearby it would be a different matter, but no hostile invaders would be able to make it all the way in here, at the very least, the other floors would send a report. That's true. It's only to be expected. The top three floors are filled with vassals that have excellent detection abilities. It would be very difficult for someone to sneak in here without being noticed by them. Just then, Aura froze, and she turned to the Colosseum. What's wrong, Aura-san? The teleport gate to the seventh floor just activated. From below? Demiurge ought to be outside now, so... Could it be one of your subordinates? Is it all right to not take a look? Hmm, Mare's around, so there's no need to worry. If anything happens, he'll contact me. Aura tapped the earring around her neck. Besides, it's hardly a rare thing. You need to take teleport gates at specific locations and go up level by level if you want to go from a lower floor to an upper floor. Oh yeah, didn't somebody use magic because they didn't want to run? Ahem. Nazarick is an impregnable fortress, indeed. Not even that super tear spell, Sword of Damocles, or my world-class item could destroy an entire floor at once. That's why we must not let the ring which allows for at will teleportation to be taken. All eyes went to the ring on Albedo's left ring finger. Mare apparently hands the ring to someone else for safekeeping when he heads out. From that, you can tell how important the rings are, Mare contacted me. Aura moved away from the others and grabbed at her earring, and then she began a conversation with the absent Mare. The three of them looked at Aura, whose face was slowly turning serious, and by the time they had finished talking, she looked very unhappy. I'm sorry. Mare apparently needs to head out for something, so just in case, I'll be going back. I see. Then... Why don't we head back ourselves, Shultia? I don't mind. I'd like to do something in the fields first before I go. Also, I'd like to chat with the Dryads and the Treants, then we'll each go our own ways. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thanks to you, I know how to spend my vacation time. If we're free some other day. Yes, next time, we should all bathe together. Nazarick Time, 9.28 Mare looked up from the book he was reading, slowly shifting his eyes to peek at the teleport gate which led to the seventh floor. Sensing a faint wave of power, he put his bookmark between the open pages and quietly laid it on the chair beside him. He then picked up the staff beside him, the divine class item known as Shadow of Yggdrasil. Mare brought his empty hand to the magical item dangling before his chest, but then it stopped halfway. There was no need to contact his sister. He had not received any reports of an intrusion, so the person who came must have been a friend. He moved his legs and jogged over to the teleport gate directly below him. His big sister enjoyed jumping down directly from the spectator seats, but Mare did not like to do that. He felt that since there were stairs installed in the arena, he ought to take them on the way down. That was how one showed their faithfulness to the supreme beings. The stairs were meant to be used, after all. 
but I don't dare tell Oni Chan that. She'll look at me in a scary way. Mayor decided that at the very least, he would not waste the Supreme Being's efforts, and so he ran down the steps, and then he ran past the resting area. It was then that he saw someone standing before a huge round mirror that flashed with all the colors of the rainbow. 4. Forgive me for keeping you waiting. Oh. If it isn't the floor guardian, Mayor Summer. Thank you for coming all the way here. I am utterly delighted. The clown before him was dressed in pure white and wore a mask that resembled a crow's beak. He bowed, and Mayor nodded in response. Hello, Pulcinella. What happened today? Oh yes, as you know, Mayor Summer, I am currently working under Demiurge Summer, and today I have come as an envoy from Demiurge Summer. Please, take this. The clown swiftly handed over the folder he was carrying. If Demiurge San wants me to have this, does this mean it's a circular? Precisely. Ah, I'm so glad it was you who came, Mayor Summer. How fortunate. If Aura Summer had come, I would have to ask her to fetch you. Why? Is. Is that so? The circular notice system had been invented by the ruler of the great underground tomb of Nazarick, Ein's Ul Gaum. While it was little more than writing down non-urgent news and other miscellaneous matters on a piece of paper and letting the various floor guardians circulate and read it among themselves, something like this had never been practically used before. Therefore, Mayor stared in bafflement at the folder he had just received, muttering so this is. To himself. H. Huh? Why can't you give it to Oni Chan? Aura and Mayor were both floor guardians, so there was no reason not to give it to her. In addition, she was actually quite careful about these things, and she would not simply toss the circular away. I am unclear about that myself. All I know is that Demiurge Summer instructed me to hand it directly to you, Mayor Summer, and not to Aura Summer. Is that so? Ah. Then, how about Demiurge San? It was a somewhat vague question, but Pulcinella seemed to understand what he was asking. Well, I do not quite understand his intentions. But I feel the answer or reason may lie within that folder. I see. Ah, uh, then, yes, that's right, Demiurge San, what? What is he doing now? Conducting breeding experiments. Humanoids can breed among themselves, but demi humans cannot breed with humanoids, what a tragic state of affairs. A loving couple is denied the chance to bear the fruition of their love just because of the differences in their race. Demiurge Summer is working hard in order to save these poor souls. He will create possibilities between humanoids and demi humans. The clown practically sang his reply, spreading his arms and looking up to the sky. Pulcinella's sudden change in mood made Mare roll his eyes. Ah, how rude of me. I could not help but be excited by Demiurge Summer's kindness as he works to make people smile. Please forgive me. Uh, okay, I don't mind. Demiurge Summer has even said that he would allow himself and the others the demons to be sacrifices so as not to make others hate themselves. What a noble spirit of self-sacrifice. I, Pulcinella, am moved to tears by it. Pulcinella rubbed at his eyes through its mask. Of course, he was not crying. Even his voice sounded the same as always. He did not sound sad at all. Why do people hate him? I do not understand either. Why would the kind Demiurge Summer incur the hatred of others? But Demiurge Summer said so himself. Yes, yes, please listen to this, of how kind Demiurge Summer really is. Last time, Demiurge Summer said that it would be a shame to let the livestock starve, and so he roasted up the children of both sides whole, and served them up to each other. Surely a cruel and merciless person would not have swapped them first, but served them up directly, no? Ah really? But of course, and in order to allow the parents of both sides to bid their children farewell, Demiurge Summer even invited them to the dinner table. Demiurge Summer specially allowed them to say goodbye with a smile. I am sure that nobody other than the supreme beings could be as compassionate a person as he is. As he watched Pulcinella prattle on, Mare went oh in an uninterested tone. Those people were not entities of Nazarick, so it did not matter what happened to them. 
his feelings about Demiurge's livestock vanished from his heart after a couple of seconds. And when one is hungry, the gut may be unable to digest food even when the brain desires it. Demiurge Summer even considered that point as he warned them to eat well. His kindness is truly beyond compare. Mare felt that this was go on forever, and so he hurriedly cut in. Ah, then, how? How about Guren San? I thought he would be the one sending it, but what's he doing now? Is it him, or perhaps her? I believe Guren Summer has no gender, but when I saw him a couple of days ago, he was waiting in ambush near the seventh floor's teleport gate while Demiurge Summer was gone. Aye, I see. Mare thought of Guren's appearance. Guren an area guardian who hid his massive body within flowing lava and dragged careless foes into a battlefield where he had the advantage and fought them. Though he was only level 90, he was optimized for combat, and so by sheer fighting prowess alone, he was among the top few combatants of Nazarick, and could even hold his own against some of the floor guardians. Thus, there was no better guardian for the seventh floor in Demiurge's absence. Ah, I seem to have spoken too much. Now that I have delivered the circular to your hands, Mayor Summer, I must now go spread more smiles to others. Thank. Thank you. Mayor bowed, and Pulcinella gently replied. There is no need for thanks. I am satisfied by being able to see your smile, Mayor Summer. The clown shrugged in a joking manner. Well then, till we meet again. He waved, and then vanished into the teleport gate which led to the seventh floor. After Mare watched him leave, he opened the circular. The fact that it was meant for his eyes and not those of his sister filled him with a mix of emotion superiority and guilt and after he quickly scanned the contents, he blinked a few times. This isn't so much a circular as a message Ein Summer wanted to send to the Guardians. It read, to all male Guardians and contained appreciation and praise for their daily work. In summary, this was an invitation to bathe together and relieve fatigue. There was a list of participants, reading Ein's, Demiurge, Mare and Kokaitis from top to bottom, each with a going slash not going option beside them. The top two entries already had going circled. Sebas' name should have been in there too, but he was currently under orders to gather information with solution in a human city. Er, uh, the date is. The circular stated that the date was not fixed, and that it would be held when it was most convenient for the participants, which was why he could circle going without any hesitation. While the circular stated that he could refuse, there was no way Mayor could refuse the invitation of his generous and compassionate master. No, nobody in Nazarick would do so. He picked up the pencil in the folder and circled the going beside his name. Eh hey, he giggled as he looked at the circled going. However, before long, clouds shrouded his heart. Ah, but. How am I going to get this to Kokaitis? The circular repeatedly emphasized not to inform the female guardians about this, so it was clear that his master wanted to keep this a secret between men. In that case, the best way was to bring it over himself. It's not good to keep things from Oni Chan. Right? Because while I'm receiving his. Er, uh, should I call it affection, I'll need Oni Chan to guard the floor by herself. It was one thing to leave when under orders, but when they had to visit the other guardians for fun or do other things, Mare and Aura would always tell each other where they were headed. That was because Aura and Mare were assigned to guard this floor by order of the supreme beings, so doing that much was only to be expected. Mare grabbed the magic item hanging around his neck. Oh Wanichan? Can you hear me? He received an immediate reply. I can hear you. What's up, Mare? Ah, uh, that's great. Uh, um, it's like this. Ah, uh, I need to visit Kokaitis for a while. I'll be back soon. Visit Kokaitis? Um, mm, I need to get there in a hurry. What happened? Mare's shoulders quivered in fright. He almost squeaked instead of speaking, and he barely managed to squeeze out a normal voice. And nothing? It's nothing, just. I feel I have to go there. Oh. Aura clearly sounded suspicious, and Mare's palms grew clammy with sweat as he heard it. But, um, it can't be helped. Ein Summer ordered it. 
Other than the words of Aura and Mare's creator Book of Akushagama, Ainz's words were the most highly placed of all the supreme beings. It was only natural to place what he said as his topmost priority. Well, I guess that's fine. Go, then. However, the fifth floor is very cold, so don't forget to protect yourself against the cold. Oh yeah, you should be fine there, Mare. Mm, um. I can handle it with magic. Don't worry. I'll go there and come right back. If he continued talking, he might end up saying something strange. Therefore, Mare hurriedly released the magic item. It would seem his sister wanted to say something else right at the end, but whether it was good or ill fortune, he did not hear it. All. All right. I need to move quickly. Mare activated the power of the ring which his master had given him. After teleporting, chunks of a white substance flew right at Mare and stuck to his face. This was snow, carried by the wind. The cloud of white breath that Mare exhaled instantly flowed behind him. That was because of the supercooled wind shear. The snow driven by the blizzard went in all directions, obscuring all vision and covering up footprints. This was to waylay any intruders, but under normal circumstances the weather on the fifth floor was not so bad. The clouds which covered the sky would only dispense scattered snowflakes, and while the mood was gloomy, visibility was excellent. Hmm. Mare looked around. Since he had teleported via the ring of Ein's all gown, he must be close to his destination. Once he found the place where he had to go, Mare advanced with light steps. He left no footprints on the snow where he had trod. His feet did not sink into the snow, as though he were walking on solid ground. In this lonely world of white, the sound of falling snow seemed to carry directly into Mare's ears. Of course, Mare's always on extrasensory perception spell let him know that this place was not truly deserted. The ambushers knew he was the sixth floor's guardian, and so they did not show themselves. Mare arrived at his destination in silence. Before him was a large white sphere, which looked like an inverted hornet's nest. Six gigantic crystals surrounded the white sphere, their sharp tips pointing to the heavens. The crystals were transparent, and there were people visible inside. Mare took a step, and a distasteful sound which made him uneasy issued from beneath his feet. Looking down, he saw that the ground below was different from the snowdrift just now, it was a shiny layer of ice. It looked thick enough, but there was nothing but inky blackness beneath the ice layer. It was clearly a big hole. Mare stepped onto the ice. He walked without any hesitation, as though he was certain that the ice below him would not crack. He trod on the ice, which made a trembling, creaking noise, and arrived at the vicinity of the white sphere. Ah! Um, is Kokaita san in? Mare was not addressing the huge white sphere, but the crystals around it. Monsters which resembled human females emerged from the crystals in response to his voice. There were as many monsters as there were crystals, and they were dressed all in white. Their skin was pale, and their long hair was black. They were Frost Virgin's level 82 ice-type monsters, responsible for defending Snowball Earth, which was Kokaita's home. They were something like a bodyguard team. Welcome, Mayor Summer. We are pleased that you came to visit in person. Ah. Um, where is Kokaita San? Kokaita Summer is currently outside the great underground tomb of Nazarick. He is visiting the Lizard Man village. Is. Is that so? The Frost Virgin bowed her head as an affirmative. May I take a message for you? Mare hesitated. Since he had come all this way, he could probably leave the circular in Kokaita's room and then let the Frost Virgins inform him. However, after thinking about the contents of the circular, handing it directly to him might be the best way to carry out his master's intentions. But how could he go outside to find Kokaitis? There was no rule preventing them from leaving Nazarick. However, there was a requirement that had to be met in order to step outside. This was because their master had strictly forbidden anyone from moving around alone outside Nazarick. After analyzing the data they had collected so far, the level 100 guardians of Nazarick were unimaginably powerful compared to the outside world, comparable to walking disasters. Thus, 
as one of those walking disasters, Mare would not be in danger when moving around alone outside. On the other hand, it was the world that ought to be afraid of him. However, anyone with such a reckless mindset must surely have forgotten something. That was the fact that Shiltier had been brainwashed by an enemy who in all likelihood possessed a world-class item. And there were also traces of players' existence throughout the world. They did not know how powerful and how broad in reach these people were, so they had to be extra careful. Uh. Hmm what should I do? Anyone going outside had to be escorted by five vassals of level 75 and above, as a bare minimum. Mare had two dragons who were directly assigned to him as vassals, but bringing them around with him would be too conspicuous. The fastest way would be to ask his sister, but when he thought about what had happened when he came here, he could not muster up the courage to do so. Just then, a revelation flashed across his mind. Their numbers and levels were just right. Ah, could I ask you to come and look for him with me? I, I am very sorry. Kokaitis Summer has ordered us to defend this place. Unless Ein Summer himself orders it, we cannot disobey Kokaitis Summer's orders. We beg your forgiveness. Ah, no, not at all. It's fine. That could not be helped, or rather, he would have realized it if he had thought of it. After that, he hit on a second good idea, which was to borrow the evil lords from the seventh floor. However, if he simply asked them normally, his request would probably be denied like this. Still, he could only count on Demiurge for aid. That was because he wanted to do his best to avoid asking guardians whose names were not written on the circular for help. In addition, most of the vassals who were above level 80 were the direct subordinates of a guardian, and very few were independent. Due to these two reasons, he would need to contact Demiurge in order to borrow his evil lords. But how will I contact him? In order to reach Demiurge, who was outside, he would need to dispatch a vassal or use magic. Then, their apostrophe s. Mare thought of the book he had just read. He has subordinates of level 75 and above too, right? But he's not a guardian. Hmm well, he's male, so it should be all right. I'll just have to swear him to secrecy. Ah. Ah, thank you all. Er, uh, I think I'll figure something out myself. Really? Understood. Mare activated the power of the ring. His destination was the massive library on the tenth floor of Nazarek Ashurbanipal. Nazarek Time, 9.54. After teleporting, the scenery before Mare's eyes changed from a snowfield to an expansive room. The basic color of the room's furnishings was an ebony brown, and it appeared quite dignified as it was illuminated by warm lighting. The ceiling was a gentle dome and there were a pair of double doors opposite him. These massive doors were big enough to rival the ones which opened to the throne room, and they were flanked by a pair of golems which were each almost three meters tall. Both golems resembled warriors and had been built from rare metals by a supreme being, so they were more powerful than regular golems. Ah, please help me open the door. In response to Mare's words, the golem on each side placed their hands on the door and slowly pushed it open. There was a weighty sound as the doors opened to the point where several people could walk through them side by side, and Mare stepped through them. The scene which unfolded before him did not resemble a library so much as a view from a similar institute yes, it looked like an art gallery. The floor and bookshelves were elaborately decorated, and the neat rows of books on them looked like ornaments as well. The shining, spotless floor was an intricately patterned parquet mosaic. Above was a towering ceiling, and there was a mezzanine balcony on the second floor. Beyond that there was a room girdled by countless bookshelves. Every inch of the hemispherical ceiling was covered in magnificent frescoes. There were glass showcases scattered throughout the room, each displaying several books. While there were countless light sources, they did not produce strong illumination. A human being would surely frown in resentment at the dimness of the room. One could not take the entire room in with a single look. The bookshelves blocked one's view. The doors slowly closed behind Mare amidst this library-appropriate silence. Without the light from the outside, the room's interior seemed even darker. That, combined with the profound silence, filled the room with a creepy atmosphere. 
Of course, Mare could see in the dark like it was broad daylight, and so he did not feel creeped out at all. Mare walked inside, somewhat quickening his pace. He was currently in the Hall of Reason. This library was divided into the Hall of Knowledge, the Hall of Reason, the Hall of Magic, and various other smaller rooms with their own specific purposes such as the individual rooms for each of the staff. With that in mind, his destination seemed quite a ways off. Countless books filled the neat rows of bookshelves which lined the passage on either side. There were roughly five kinds of books in Yggdrasil. The first kind was monster data, which could be used to summon mercenary monsters. There were three types of monsters in Nazarick, the first were the NPCs, who were made just like the players were, the second were the automatically spawning monsters of level 30 and below, and the last ones were the summoned monsters who could serve as mercenaries. These mercenary monsters had to be summoned via a ritual which used a book and then expending an appropriate amount of currency according to their level. Therefore, one could not summon them without a book. The second kind were magic items. Certain data crystals could only be imbued into book-type items. For the most part, book-type items were one-use magic items. The difference between them and scrolls were that one needed to be of a spellcasting job class to use a scroll, while book-type items could be used by anybody. The third kind were event items. It was not uncommon for the items required for changing to a specific job class to take the form of books. When Irons had gone from a skeleton mage to an elder lich, he had needed the item known as the Book of the Dead. There were also things like the martial arts monograph and the tales of the four great elementals. Apart from these job change items, there were also items which allowed one to learn new spells when used. The fourth kind was visual data. In other words, they were books which contained visual data for swords, shields, armor and the like. Anyone with specific blacksmith skills could use these books with the required raw materials to produce an item skin. The fifth kind were novels distributed in book form. The most commonly seen examples were pieces of classic literature whose copyright had expired, followed by background material from the development team, and then original stories created by Yggdrasil's players. There were also a few secondary creations set in Yggdrasil's universe, or diary-style walkthroughs for the game. Within the great underground tomb of Nazarick, the vast majority of the books within its library belonged to the first kind books gathered in order to summon mercenary monsters. Of course, there was no need to collect that many books. In truth, even if one dumped the guild's coffers into the task, one could not summon even a tenth of the monsters from the books which filled this place. Then why did they have so many books? That was because the summoning books were not particularly expensive, so the guild members decided to mess around and made a huge stack of copies. This also served the purpose of hiding important items. Mayor looked at the books on either side as he walked. A ghostly form suddenly appeared from between the bookshelves, as though to block his path. The ghost wore a black robe, and it seemed to meld into the darkness of the library. There was a jeweled wand on its waist, and several jewels tied to its belt. There was a waxy, corpse-like face beneath the robe's hood, its hands were skin and bones. Every time it moved, the faint darkness surrounding it shifted as well. It was an especially famous monster among the undead magic casters known as Elder Liches. In Yggdrasil, they were nicknamed White Counterfeiters. Monsters like these were level 30 and were ranked second among the Elder Lich family. There were other, palette-swapped monsters like these in Yggdrasil, colloquially known as the Red Counterfeiters and the Black Counterfeiters. However, he differed from the average Elder Lich in that he had an armband on his left arm. The armband read Librarian J. Welcome, Mayor Summer. The Elder Lich spoke in a hoarse, garbled voice, then bowed in deference, slowly but deeply, with one hand clasped to its chest in a prim and proper movement. Ah! Ah! I came to look for the head librarian. Er, uh, is he in? The elder lich struck a thinker's pose, and then replied. The head librarian is currently making scrolls, so he is in the workroom, thank you. Allow me to show you the way. Please, follow me. How could I impose on you like that? I can't keep you from your work. 
think nothing of it. Aiding users of the library is my duty. Since he had already said as much, continuing to refuse would be rude. I understand, then I'll have to trouble you. A smile appeared on the elder leech's ghastly face, and then it led the way forward. As Mare followed him, he glanced at the other elder liches and caster type undead they passed along the way. Oh yes, would you like me to put that book back for you? Ah, please do. The elder lich took the book from Mare and looked at the title. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, hmm. Did you enjoy it? Hmm, it was very interesting. I'm thinking about what I should read next. Then allow me to recommend you a book. This one is very funny, it concerns a murder ah, we have arrived. Thank you very much. Mare opened the door which the elder lich had guided him to. What was supposed to have been a spacious room felt oppressive and cramped, thanks to the large shelves on all sides. The shelves were filled with countless reagents ores, precious metals, element-imbued rocks, various powders, organs from several animals all arranged in neat rows. There were also several stacks of parchment some were rolled up, while some were simply laid there. All these were the materials needed to make scrolls. Of course these were not all the resources which the great underground tomb of Nazarick possessed. There were several hundred times this amount stored within the treasury. Only those supplies which would be promptly used were stored in this room. There was an extra-large drawing table in the center of the room, with a piece of parchment opened upon it. Before the table stood a skeleton which looked like a fusion of human and animal bones. It was not very tall. It was around 150 centimeters in height. Two demonic-looking horns protruded from its head, and it had four-fingered hands. Below its ankles were cloven feet. This bizarre creature was wrapped in a saffron himation. Six, apart from that, a hood of similar material lightly shrouded its head without being pierced by the horns, and there was another piece of cloth around its waist. In addition, it wore a silver bracelet with a multicolored jewel set into it, while there was a golden anchor round its neck, and it had several complex-looking and strange rings on its bony fingers, which looked like they were twined around the digits. There were jewels attached to the himation which took the place of a sash. Each of them was a fairly potent magic item. It wore several scrolls at its belt, like they were swords. While it had a unique outfit, it was actually a skeleton mage. It was one of the basic undead species, and the stage before the Elder Lich. However, this skeleton mage was the head librarian of this massive library Titus Anaius Sundus. This being had not been created by the supreme beings to focus on combat power, but production ability. In fact, its total level was higher than that of the Elder Lich just now. You have come just in time, Guardian Mare. I bid you welcome. Ah, nice to meet you, Titus San. I came to ask a favor of you. I see. Then tell me what business you have here. Ah. Yes. Um. I'd like to borrow your vassals here who are above level 75. I understand. You intend an excursion, I believe? Eh? Why yes, that's right. How did you know? I have never forgotten the words of my ruler, Ein Summer. After that, I considered your situation and I guessed it immediately very well. He spent only a moment in contemplation. I shall lend you the overlords within this library Coxaeus, Ulpius, Ilius, Fulvius, and Aurelius. 7. A. Eh? Really? But of course. In all honesty, their battle potential is somewhat excessive for the library. Rather than have them do dusting all day, far better to have them be your escorts. I am sure it would make them very happy. Ah. Ah. Er, uh, thank you very much. That said, some recompense is due. I would have you assist me with a task, the creation of scrolls. Ah, certainly. What should I do? Fret not. Once I say now, kindly cast a fourth-tier spell upon this scroll. That is all. What? What sort of spell should I cast? The choice is yours. Mare looked puzzled. Being told to decide for himself was quite difficult. He did not know if he should just use an ordinary spell. 
there was a small desk beside the drawing table with the parchment. Titus reached a bony hand out at the desk and touched a pile of glittering gold Yggdrasil gold coins. Suddenly, the gold Yggdrasil coins melted below his bony palm, and they flowed along the parchment like they were sentient. The golden serpent crawled along the parchment, and then dispersed, as though it had already decided where to go. In the time between breaths, a golden magic circle covered the parchment. The mystic tracery was both complex and delicate, now. Mare who was nervously awaiting his cue cast his spell like he had been startled. Mare felt his spell being sucked up by the magic circle. Normally, that would have completed the scroll. That was what Mare had thought. Until that moment. There was a bright red blaze. Something impossible happened upon the drawing table. Mare looked in shock as the parchment burned like it had been soaked in alcohol, but within a couple of moments, the fire had gone out. The events just now felt like an illusion. There was no trace of a fire within the room. Not even the smell of burning lingered. However, there was evidence on the table which proved what had just happened was no illusion. That was the remains of the parchment its ashes. Titus seemed to have anticipated this, and he calmly picked up the ashes to examine them. So you can't imbue them with fourth-tier spells. I seem to have confirmed that it has nothing to do with the caster's power. Titus muttered, ten years old was a failure and made notes. Er, uh, what? What just happened? What did I do wrong? Pay it no heed. I attempted to use the materials of this world to make scrolls in order to save on parchment costs, but their quality is simply atrocious. The tier of a spell limited the materials that could be used to make a scroll which contained it. For example, scrolls made from average parchment could hold a second-tier spell at the very most, but not spells of a higher tier. If one used the highest grade of parchment that made of dragon hide one could scribe a tenth-tier spell into it. Naturally, dragon hide was a special material, which required one to slay a dragon. For that reason, the Guild Ein's All Gowns members had banded together to farm dragons, but that was from the Yggdrasil days. Until they could verify that this world contained dragons as well as other beasts Ein's had sensibly imposed a restriction on the use of dragon hide. He could not do something foolish like expend a non-renewable resource. After all, there was no telling when he might need to use it. You can't use my dragons. But of course. I will not do such a thing. Beginning with your dragons, all these specially summoned beings are the will of the supreme beings made manifest. Harming them is strictly forbidden. Mare breathed a sigh of relief. Titus looked at him with interest in his eyes, then swept the ashes into a bin. Ah, uh, then, does that mean this world's parchment isn't suitable for making scrolls? Mare's eyes looked toward the remains. That is quite possible. No, I do not know yet. It might be that my manufacturing methods are unorthodox in this world. For instance, they seem to produce potions in a markedly different way. But, is that really so? If it's just one failure, couldn't it be the parchment's fault? Just one, you say? I have already used the parchment from the outside for various experiments, but whenever I attempt to imbue a spell above the third tier into them, I receive the same result each time destruction. It is quite likely that the parchment burns because the magical power cannot be infused into it. But the magic casters in this world all use that sort of parchment, right? No, what I just disposed of is probably not a typical piece of parchment used by the magic casters of this world. Of course, after considering that there are various nations in this world, I cannot guarantee that nobody has used a parchment like this one. When I used the parchments of the nations near Nazarick, Titus produced a stack of parchment which seemed different from the piece just now. The experimental results were even worse, they were limited to first-tier spells. So that means the humans know how to make good use of poorer materials? No. I believe it might be a technological difference. While it pains me to admit it, their technique is, to some extent, more refined than ours. I would love to acquire this new technology and improve my skills. That's amazing. Mare felt nothing but respect for the head librarian's spirit of self-improvement. 
All this is for the Supreme One's sake. Then, guardian mayor, as we agreed, I shall lend you the overlords. Come with me. Nazarick time, 1028. He handed his ring to someone else along the way and then reached the surface. There, Mayor and company performed a mass teleport and arrived in the middle of a room within a stone structure in the Lizardman village. This building was constructed of sturdy, heavy stone. It could only be built in a place with sufficiently firm ground, thus requiring construction techniques the Lizardman did not possess. Needless to say, the people who had built this place were a third party at group from the great underground tomb of Nazarick. The reason to have people come all the way from Nazarick to build this structure stood behind Mare's back. The object which stood within the depths of this building explained everything. Mare bowed deeply to the object in question. The overlords travelling with him bowed as well. A stone statue made in the image of Ein's Ul Gaon, ruler of the great underground tomb of Nazarick, stood upon an elevated platform. It was so lifelike that it seemed as though the original had been turned to stone. The way it raised its staff radiated the dignity and gravitas of a ruler. All manner of offerings adorned the altar before the statue. Naturally, those offerings were worthless in Mare's eyes, meager tributes of flowers and fish and the like. However, Mare was not displeased. That was because the ones who had made those offerings were filled with genuine respect and reverence. For instance, fresh flowers did not grow in the swampland, but in the forests which were very dangerous to the lizardmen they must have risked their lives to pick them. The fish were the lizardmen's staple diet, but the offerings were much bigger than the average fish. Mare understood that they had only chosen the most impressive specimens to offer up. Mm? Mare nodded in satisfaction. Seeing common riffraff express their respect for his great master made him very happy. Well done. He spoke to reassure the lizardmen who were peeking fearfully at him. They were the personnel responsible for cleaning this sanctuary. They possessed druidic abilities, which were rare among the lizardmen, and they wore badges with the guild emblem of Ein's all gown around their neck. There was a vast difference between their stations and that of Mare, between that of the conquered and their conquerors, so there was no need to thank them for their hard work. However, for the reasons mentioned earlier, Mare had been so satisfied with their labours that he had decided to thank them for it. Mare left the lizardman bowing non-stop behind him, and led the five overlords out of the sanctuary. Before him was a patch of swamp, the lizardman's settlement. It seemed more developed than before. Indeed, they had lost many people during that war. However, the five tribes were now one, and in the end they had formed a stronger, larger village. The boundary fence encompassed a wide area. At some point, watchtowers had been built in the muddy swamp, and upon each of them stood a skeleton probably a Nazarick old guarder scanning the surroundings with an arrow knocked to its undrawn bow. Several Nazarick old guarders could be seen walking around in the swamp, presumably, they were conducting reconnaissance in case of enemy attack. Ah, where's Kokaitis San? Kokaitis stood out in many ways. If he were in the village, then he ought to be instantly visible from here, if he were inside a building, there ought to be vassals like the ones Mare brought along waiting outside. With that in mind, he looked around the entire village, but could not find him. Could one of you please ask where Kokaitis San is? Certainly. A moment, please. One of the overlords Aurelius headed back into the sanctuary. Mare looked out at the swamp at the lizardman's peaceful and quiet village. Nobody here was wary of the Nazarick old guarders. Even the lizardman children were the same way. Both sides seemed to be coexisting, like it was the natural thing to do. Though they were attacked and conquered by the undead, they don't seem to bear any resentment for them. Was this because of Kokaitis san policy of friendliness? Or is this the nature of the lizardman? As he idly pondered the matter, Aurelius soon returned. Forgive the delay, Mare Summer. The people in the sanctuary do not know the whereabouts of Kokaitis Summer. However, they say that Shajariu Shasha the leader of the tribal alliance might know. Ah, then, um, let's go visit him and take a look. Mare's entourage proceeded under Aurelius' leadership. They did not cross over the swamp to go to the Lizardman village, but followed the edge of the lake, 
walking a short distance through the forest. The forms of Nazarick old guarders could be seen in the distance. Once the group exited the forest, they saw a large-scale construction project underway on the other side of the swamp. The flow of water here had been dammed, and roughly ten stone golems were excavating the soil. The sand and mud they dug up were carried away by lizardmen with pushcarts on the shore. As Mayor watched what they were doing, a strapping lizard man ran over in a hurry. This lizard man was covered in old wounds. His physique was imposing and he was distinctly different from the average lizard man. The medal around his neck swung wildly due to his haste in running over. The medal was a symbol of loyalty, and also a mark of protection. It was not magical in itself, but by wearing it, they could prove that they were Eins's property. Therefore, nobody from the great underground tomb of Nazarick who revered the supreme beings as gods could harm the lizardmen intentionally. Of course, it would be a different matter if they deserved death, but fortunately, the lizardmen were not that stupid. They knew their place and acknowledged the strong as their masters. I welcome you, Mayor Summer. My name is... Your Shajariu Shasha-san, right? Indeed, I am. I am honored that you know my name. Ah, uh, I, I heard it from Kokaitis-san. Ah, uh, do you know where Kokaitis-san is now? Shajariu waxed thoughtful for a bit. I recall Kokaitis Summer brought several of his subordinates and several dozen trainee lizardmen on his expedition to subjugate the Toadmen. Toadmen? They are the Demi humans who live in the northeastern reaches of the lake. They look like frogs, and we do not get along too well with them. They possess the ability to control large monsters and magical beasts, so they are very tricky opponents for us. I hear that there was a war once during my grandfather's time. We were soundly defeated and one of our tribes was dissolved as a result. As, as expected of the northern species, they're quite strong. This lake was shaped like two smaller lakes joined together, or an inverted gourd. The smaller lake on the south where the lizardmen dwelled was half swamp and half lake, and due to the shallow water there were few large monsters there. In comparison, the water in the larger northern lake was deeper, so many large monsters lived there, and they were stronger than the monsters of the south. Of course, it made little difference to Mare. That's right, when you mentioned Toadman, were you talking about a species called the Tuvegs? Mare was referring to the monsters who lived in the poison swamp around Nazarick in the past, he knew his sister had several of those monsters as servitors. Well, I am not too sure about that. Perhaps you could ask Kokaitis Summer after he comes back? He will probably return soon. I understand. Then, I'll ask about something else, about... about that. You seem to be building something big here, but what is it? It's quite a distance from the village, but it doesn't look like a fence or some other kind of defense. Yes. In truth, we are building our fourth fish preserve here. As he heard Shajariu's words, enlightenment dawned on Mare. It was good that the Lizardman tribes could be united but once their population grew, food shortages would naturally result. While many people had died during the war, they could not hunt or trap enough to feed their people. Of course, they could solve that problem by returning to their former villages to fish, but Kokaitis, the new ruler of the Lizardmen, did not agree. It was one thing for the entire village to move as one to another part of the swamp, but if only a few people moved by themselves, there was a high chance they would be attacked by monsters the lizardmen's numbers were already greatly decreased. Kokaitis did not want to lose more of them. In order to ensure the prosperity of the lizardmen, Kokaitis took action to solve this problem the food problem. First, he imported rations from Nazarick with Eins's permission, naturally and distributed it to the lizardmen. After that, he began studying methods to ensure a sustainable food supply. It went without saying that the solution he had discovered was the fish farms built by Zarisu. After that, he discussed the matter with Demiurge, and began to build superior fish farms. They had worked at a fever pitch and built three gigantic fish farms, and this was the fourth one. But the fries haven't been raised yet, am I right? Yes. What we? No, what my brother learned was not raising them from fries, but breeding already grown fish. However, 
Thanks to Demiurge Summer's guidance, we have made preparations to farm fish fries. If all goes according to plan, we should be able to support twice the present population of lizardmen through the produce of the fish farms. Aye, I see. In a few years' time, you won't need to take fish from Nazarick. Ah, of course, if an emergency crops up, I imagine you are always welcome to take fish. Every member of our tribe is deeply grateful to Ein Summer's merciful kindness in giving us so much fish. Although, the fish Ein Summer gave us lack internal organs, so how do they live? Are they like certain monsters who do not need to eat? No, they do not even have bones, what sort of life forms are they? They are the food which was made by the power of Ein Summer and the other supreme beings. The food Kokaitas had given them was made with a magic item called Dada's Cauldron. What? Ein Summer could actually make enough fish to feed us all? Shajariu shook his head. When Zarisu and the others visited the fortress of the Supreme Ones and came back with tales of what they had seen, it sounded like they were dreaming. They said the great underground tomb of Nazareth contained many smaller worlds within it, a true land of the gods. Is Ein's Ulgaon Summer truly a god? But of course. Why was this lizard man stating the obvious? Mayer could not understand him and tilted his head in confusion. Ein's Ulgaon was the greatest of the gods. He was their creator. I see. So all this was bestowed upon us by Ein Summer. My thanks to Ein Summer. Hmm. I'll let Ein Summer know that. Nazarick time, 10.30. You're making too much noise. Quiet down. Eins motioned with his left hand, and held that pose. He took a step back and returned to his original position. You're making too much noise. Quiet down. Once again, he motioned with his left hand and froze mid-pose. He checked the reflection of himself in the mirror and slightly adjusted the position of his left hand. Good. Is this the spot? No. Would it be cooler if I extended my hand a bit more to the left? He returned to his initial position. You're making too much noise. Quiet down. Finally satisfied with the pose, Eins grabbed the memo pad on the table beside him. Since I finished the pose, I should practice the lines while I have extra time. He circled the phrase he was practicing earlier with a pen, and then turned a page. The majority of the sentences written on there were variations on the phrase I shall consider it. The phrases that were too dull or too over the top and thus too lame were all crossed out. For Irons, who used to be an average person, acting like a leader was difficult. Thus, he repeatedly practiced playing that role just in case a situation called for it. Of course, the entire memo pad was filled with phrases Irons came up with. Even though an hour had passed since Eins started practicing, he did not require any rest. Eins was the supreme overlord, but in reality, he barely did anything. Unless there was an important decision to be made or an emergency situation that required his leadership, there was nothing to do. Albedo took care of all the details and all Eins had to do was skim through the reports. Since there was never anything in the reports that required his attention, he really just skimmed through them all. It was a little dangerous for a ruler, but as long as Albedo was around, and there was no emergency, there would be no problem. All proper organizations should be like this anyways. It's not good for someone who stands above others to work on the front lines. It was a foolish move for the supreme commander of an army to participate in the fighting on the front lines unless he was there to raise morale. If he did, it would be very dangerous. I should give up this adventurer business and gather knowledge to deal with emergency situations, I know I have to train my mind as well, but what should I do? Who's going to teach me? How can I not ruin the image of Ein's all gown that everybody believes in? Everyone inside Nazarick respected Ein's as an absolute ruler and knelt before him. That was right. Ein's received respect from his subordinates which his had former comrades created, who were, in some ways, their children. Just like how a father could not betray the respect his children placed in him, he could not betray them as well. That was why he practiced acting, in the hope that he could at least appear to play the part. Of course, Eins was fully aware that it was embarrassing. Otherwise, 
why would he lock the door and forbid the maids and the eight edge assassins that guarded him from entering? Sometimes, he would even plant his face in the pillow and scream a rare. When he could not stand it any more. Something fitting the supreme overlord of Nazarick. A form that one can respect. Eines felt like he would cough up blood as he flipped through the pages. There were still many more lines which he had come up with in his spare time, and the finish line seemed nowhere in sight. Ein's Ulgaun was undead and emotions over a certain threshold were suppressed. But. I need a break. The remnant of Suzuki Satoru was weary from mental fatigue, and he wailed. I'm sick of this, he cried, however Ein silenced that cry with a grinding of his teeth. What am I doing? I need to work harder. After rebuking himself for trying to run away, Eins's eyes filled with strength, and he looked himself in the mirror again. Suddenly, a digital pi 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 noise rang out. The sound coming from the bracelet on his left arm was like music to Eins's ears. He turned off the sudden beeping and sighed deeply. If time's up, then it can't be helped. Yes, time's up. Eins returned the memo pad to a box. When he closed the lid, he could hear the sound of several locks engaging. If someone tried to forcefully open the box, it would trigger an extensive array of attack spells, all of which would be centered on the box to destroy it. The defenses on the box were formidable enough that nobody but a level 90 rogue type character or a level 80 specialized rogue character could breach them. After securely locking the item, he returned it to his pocket dimension. There were many other rare items in there as well. Still, a high-level thief could steal items from a place like that as well. That said, a thief could not just immobilize his opponents and rob them blind. They were limited to one or two items at the most. Still, the prospect of being robbed just once or twice made Eins, who should have known no fear as one of the undead, shudder in terror. In addition, unknown powers such as talents existed as well. That was why he placed the box among other rare items, so thieves would steal them instead of the box. After he put it away, he checked it again to make sure. It was as though he were a housewife checking that the main door was locked before heading on a trip. After he did so, he finally breathed a sigh of relief. Only after doing all that did Eins finally leave his bedroom. The place he was headed to was the room he regularly used as the study. The ones who bowed deeply to him there were the regular maid, albedo, and mare. The first two were hardly a rare sight, but the boy did not come here often, and it surprised Eins. He cut across the room, circled around his ebony table and sat down, in a way which he had practiced over thirty times before. Sitting in this way meant not stepping on his robe or making noise when pushing his chair out of the way. After that, he had to be careful about how he leaned back in the chair. It would not look good if his movements were too rushed or if he put too much weight into the back of his chair. Kings had a kingly way, maybe, of sitting down. But I don't know how kings take a seat. I should go observe how a king sits down. It was recommended for company men to lightly sit in the middle of the chair without leaning on the backrest. But Ein's Ul Gown was no longer a company man. Therefore, all Eins could do was realize the image of an ideal king within his mind. Raise your heads. It was only then that the three of them looked up. Eins was annoyed by the fact that they would not raise their heads without an explicit command, and he felt that it was a waste of time, still, he could not disregard the loyalty they showed their master. Therefore, Eins bore with it every time and replied in the same way. Then I shall begin with a question. Mare. What business do you have? Ah, yes. Perhaps Mare was nervous, but his voice cracked a little. Ein smiled. Of course, there was no way his fleshless face could twist itself, but he still did his best to exude an air of kindness. Perhaps Mare had sensed it, but he breathed a sigh of relief. He seemed less stiff now. Ah. That, this, er, uh, I brought it. Eins was not a cruel superior who would go, what did you bring? Since Mare had brought it, Eins ought to receive it from him. For all he knew, it might have been an order he had given and forgotten about. Really now no, that's fine. 
Ainz reached out a hand to stop the day's duty made as she sought to take the item from Mare. Mare, hand it to me in person. Yes. Mare held his chest high as he walked up to Ainz and gave him the folder he was holding. Ainz magnanimously accepted the folder and opened it. This is. The circular I sent out. All three guardians had circled going to Ainz's invitation. By right, Kokaitis should have sent a minion to deliver this to me. Thank you for going to all this trouble, Mare. And not at all, it's nothing, nothing of the sort. Kokaitis san was busy, so I insisted on helping him. And besides, Mare lovingly caressed the ring on his left ring finger. That's the ring of Ein's all gown. No, I'm glad he values it so highly, but putting it on that finger means. More to the point, why is that boy looking at me with dewy eyes? Ein's shivered, and then he glanced aside to Albedo. She was smiling kindly, as always. Ein's line of sight shifted to Albedo's left ring finger. As expected, she had worn her ring there, just like Mare. It seemed as though it was the right place to wear the ring. Where did that practice come from? It was from ancient Greece, right? He recalled what Yomeko had once told him about the meaning of wearing a ring on different fingers. Apparently, the ancient Greeks believed there was a blood vessel which ran from the left ring finger to the heart, and so if the left ring finger touched something harmful to the body, it would send a signal to the heart, which was why they dispensed medicine with their left ring fingers. Does Su Chef do the same thing too? Ah, this is bad. He's gazing at me again. Eins meshed his fingers on the table. What is it, Mare? Did you see something? Has something gotten onto my face? He chose his words carefully, making sure his reply did not sound like mockery. No. Not at all. I simply thought you looked very handsome, Eins Summer. I am handsome? Eins unconsciously stroked his bony face. Foo ha ha. You're quite the flatterer, Mare. It's not flattery. The loudness of that voice did not sound like it could have come from Mare. F forgive me, Ein Summer. But, I really do think you look handsome. Even just now, the way you sat down looked just like how the supreme ruler of Nazarick ought to be. Eins looked questioningly at the duty made. The homunculus sensed her master's intentions and nodded silently and vigorously, as if to say, precisely. Eins did not look at Albedo, yet she was also nodding vigorously, and there was a patter patter sound as her wings flapped. Really now? That is good to hear. After that brief reply, Eins rose from his seat and walked before Mare, then gently patted the head of the boy who had tensed up in anticipation of a scolding. It was a casual act, yet one filled with kindness. I Ein Summer. Thank you, Mare. Your words have always pleased me. It was incredibly embarrassing to say that, but he did not display any of these Suzuki Satoru like emotions. I have always been thinking this, I ought to thank my friends. Do you mean the supreme beings? Eins knelt, so his eyes were level with Mare's. Precisely. I want to thank them for making the great underground tomb of Nazarick, and for making you and everyone else. You and by this I mean Albedo and Sixth as well. Albedo's wings stood fully erect. The maid who had just been suddenly addressed was in a panic. She was typically calm, so after seeing this rare side of her, Eins laughed cheerfully. You are all my treasures. Eins scooped up Mare. I can hardly bear to let Bukabakushagama san have you. Thank you, Ein Summer. Tears of joy streamed down six cheeks as she answered on behalf of Mare. When all the supreme beings left this place, only you remained here until the end, and everyone in Nazarick is grateful for that. Perhaps we have failed to meet your expectations and perhaps we have often upset you. I understand that speaking in this way to our Creator is deeply rude, but I pray you will allow that you will permit us to pledge our undying loyalty to you. I permit this. I recall that in the past, Albedo and Demiurge said something similar to me, so hear this I am the master of Nazarick, I am your master, Eins Ulgaun. Eins had never rehearsed these lines before, so he was quite surprised by how smoothly he could recite them. However, when he thought about it, 
that was only to be expected. Since he was speaking from the heart, it made sense that he could do so in such a natural manner. Mare hugged Eines and buried his face in Eines's shoulder. Good thing I'm not wearing my usual gear, the calm part of Eines's mind said. He felt a wet sensation spreading through the shoulder of his robe, but Eines left Mare where he was. As the sound of Mare's sniffling gradually died down, Eines gently caressed his head. Eines produced a handkerchief from his pocket. He had never wiped someone else's face before, so perhaps his movements were a bit rough, but Mare allowed Eines to wipe him. Come now, Mare. Go wash your face. Ah. Uh, what about you, Eines Summer? Ah, uh, I'll be heading over to E. Rantel afterward. I need to meet the guildmaster. I've been putting it off because it's annoying, but I can't delay it any longer. Now then. Eines glanced at Albedo, who had been remaining silent all this while. Her long hair covered her face, and he could not see her expression. However, the non-stop quivering of her body was enough to strike terror into Eins's heart. The image of a volcano simmering with anger, on the verge of eruption, flashed through his mind. What's wrong, Albedo? And in that moment, Guga. Eins's field of vision shifted just as he felt an impact on his back. Naturally, it did not hurt. Eins's body could only be harmed by magical means. He did not feel pain from the light impacts which resulted from bumping into things. However, the remnants of his humanity made him shut his eyes in reflex. This sudden development left him unable to think. The mental makeup of the undead meant that they did not panic or the like, so this confusion must have been Suzuki Satoru's. NH, NGGHHH. He opened his eyes, and saw the eight edge assassins on the ceiling. In other words, he was on his back. When he realized this, Eins immediately tried to stand up, but a strangely soft object pinned his entire body down, and thanks to that, it was hard to move. Impossible. My items grant me immunity to mobility impediments such as pinning. I should have been liberated the moment I was completely immobilized. In other words, someone's using a very powerful binding technique on me. Eins checked to see what the soft life form pinning him down was, and as expected, it was Albedo. Eins Samar. Albedo was straddling Eins in a full mount and pushed him back down as he tried to rise. What? What's this? What's happening? I, I can't take it any more. Albedo suddenly opened her eyes. Her flaring golden pupils sent a chill down Eins's spine. You. What are you saying? Albedo ignored Eins's panicked question and instead brought her hands to the front of her dress. With the HNG of effort, she tried to pull it off, but she could not budge it. Magical clothing is so annoying. You need a skill to destroy it or take it off normally. Calm yourself, Albedo. Get off me. Eins thought to push her off with sheer brute force, but Albedo was a level 100 warrior. Also, Whenever Eins tried to push her away, his hands made contact with something soft and squishy, so he could not use his full strength. Albedo's hands moved, seeking to remove Eins's robe. Don't take my clothes off. Stop wiggling your hips. Why? Ah, a wa wa wa. It's your fault, Eins Summer. I've been bearing with it for so long, but then you said that and I couldn't take it any more. It's all your fault, Eins Summer. I just need a little bit. Just a bit. Just a little bit. A little bit of your love. Just count the eight edge assassins on the ceiling and it'll be over before you're done. If Albedo had chosen this moment to scold Eins for changing her backstory, perhaps he would have lost the will to resist. However, Albedo looked like she was going to swallow him whole, and so he did not feel guilt, but the terror of one who was about to be devoured that instead caused him to struggle even more desperately. It was only then that his subordinates, who had been stunned by the sudden development, finally went into action. Albedo Summer has gone mad. Albedo Summer has gone mad. The eight edge assassins descended as one from the ceiling. Pull her off Ein Summer. No, don't try to immobilize her, she'll slip free right away. Just pull her away with brute force. No good. 
What's with this strength? I'd expect nothing less of the guardian overseer. Mayor Summer, we request your aid. Oh Wawa. Oh okay. In the end, Eins was finally freed, and after smoothing out his rumpled robes, he looked to Albedo, who was seized hand and foot by the eight edge assassins, and said. Albedo shall be confined for three days. The eight edge assassins dragged Albedo from the room. Ah. I'm Summer. Are you all right? I'm perfectly fine. Has Albedo always been that strange? Did she eat something funny? Granted, demons don't need to eat or drink, but it's not like they can't. As Eins asked that question, Mare averted his eyes. I see. No, well, hmm. She must have a lot going on, for all I know, it could be pent-up stress from work. Eins rose to his feet and called out to the maid. He regained his dignity which had been previously scattered to the winds and spoke in a commanding tone. Summon Nabral and Hamsuk. It is time for me to leave for E. Rantel. Nazarick time, 1335. Eins pulled on the reins from where he was mounted on Hamsuk's back, bringing Hamsuk to a halt. He silently regarded E. Rantel's city gates. Eins quite liked these thick and sturdy gates, which looked like they could repel an army. While there were many gates in Yggdrasil which were bigger and cooler looking than this one, this gate was not a mass of data, but made by the hands of mankind although they might have had magical assistance. As he stood before these gigantic steel gates, an indescribable feeling whirled up inside him. There were guilds in Yggdrasil who conquered cities too. In the past, I thought it was troublesome to use a location that was so difficult to defend as a guild base, but... I think I can understand those guilds now. Ruling a big city might be a male ambition. In Yggdrasil, there were frequent city battles between guilds. Many of Ein's all gowns members simply watched coldly from the side, unable to understand them, but there had been those who said they wanted to take part. Were they battle maniacs? In the past, Eins had not liked those words much, but when he thought about it now, they were good memories. Is something the matter, my lord? Not at all, don't worry about it. Hamsuk had been curious and asked its question because its master had bade it stop, and yet had not done anything. Eins's flat reply had shut down that topic. He felt embarrassed about letting Hamsuk know that he was reminiscing about the past. Now then, to the Adventurers Guild, where we'll show our faces for the meeting and then immediately take on a monster extermination quest. He could have stayed in an E. Rantle Inn, but he did not have the luxury of making such pointless expenditures. The reason why Eins who did not eat or drink had to book a room in the highest end inns was purely to highlight his status as the most highly placed of adventurers. After that, it was a matter of making connections. However, he had already met all the influential people in this city, and he was assured that they would receive him warmly if he sought them out. Therefore, Eins had no need to book a room at an inn. Besides, whenever Eins checked into an inn, he would immediately teleport back to Nazarick, where he would produce undead and work on other things. That being the case, it would be wiser to take a monster extermination mission and leave the city as soon as possible. Frankly speaking, he did not feel that there was further merit in staying around E. Rantel. Is that so? Verily, my lord does enjoy battle. It's not like I enjoy it or anything. Besides, when I wipe out monsters, I take them out right away and spend most of the time in Nazarick. Eins lightly wrapped Hamsuk's large head, I intend to give you all sorts of training so you can use weapons and armor. This one has always been working hard. This one has asked the lizardman to teach this one all manner of tricks, and soon this one will surely be able to learn a super move. Ho! Oh. Well now, it would be perfect if you could learn martial arts. Also, how about your fellow disciple? Do you think he'll be able to use martial arts? You mean him? He never speaks so this one does not know. However, this one feels he cannot use them yet. Indeed, Eins thought. There was no way that one would enjoy speaking, and Eins felt that the chances of it being able to learn martial arts were slim. It was little more than an experiment. That said, 
If it a death knight created by irons could actually learn warrior techniques, their future plans would have to be greatly altered. That was because if he could strengthen monsters by training them, then it would most likely become a top priority. The undead do not need to sleep, and neither do they tire, they can perform combat training forever. So in theory, he ought to have learned martial arts before Hamsuk. The fact that he has not probably indicates that it's not possible. A moment please. He strives hard in his own way. Even after this one returns to this one's abode, he continues training without a single word of complaint. I pray thee spare his life. No, I did not intend to kill him, you know. What exactly did you take me for? Indeed, there is nobody more merciful in all this world than Ein Summer. Ein Summer even took pity on a pathetic little creature like you and spared your life. Those frigid words came from Narbril, who was riding behind them, and they made Hamsuk shudder. Narbe, we're coming up on E. Rantel. Address me as Momen from now on. Understood. Also, Hamsuk is a being with an important part to play in the plan to strengthen Nazarick. You must take the appropriate attitude with those who work for Nazarick's sake, I am not simply referring to Hamsuk, so keep that in mind. Yes. My deepest apologies. Also, stop calling humans ticks or lice or whatever, Eins wanted to say, but no matter how he ordered her, Narbrill would not listen, so recently he had decided not to bother. That was because if Narbrill Gamma had been designed to unconsciously refer to human beings in such a manner, forcing her to correct herself would essentially be trampling the wishes of his friend who had designed her that way. All right, let's go. Yes, my lord. Eins rode forth on Hamsuk. He could see several people lined up in front of the gate. It was only to be expected that immigration would be more strictly vetted than emigration, and all items they carried would be carefully inspected. Therefore, if travelling merchants or peddlers wanted to enter E. Rantel, they might have to spend a long time queuing up for an inspection. I hope it won't take too long. Should you not have priority in going in, moment Sar N? Narbrill asked while they were lined up behind several travellers including a group in adventurer's garb, she was right. When Eins had first come here, he too had been subjected to extremely troublesome checks, but as his adventuring record grew, the inspection process had grown simpler, and now he practically had a free pass to walk right past them. In addition to that, sometimes he received permission for preferential entry to the city. This privilege was not unique to darkness, just about all mithril-ranked adventurers and above received such special treatment. Perhaps it was because the city did not want to displease their trump cards. In that case, why not just do away with the entry toll as well? The tolls were inexpensive compared to the payments adventurers received, but Eins was the top outside earner for Nazarick and having to pay displeased him. That said, he could not bypass the walls with flight magic either. Momen was a hero. Therefore, we can't cut in line. Unless there's an emergency, or we have to enter the city with all due haste. He saw Narbrill bow from the corner of his eye, and Eins looked ahead of him from where he was mounted on Hamsuk's back, still, they're not moving at all. The queue was just like a highway choked up by a traffic jam, nobody was moving. What's this? It looks like they're inspecting a cargo wagon. And doing a pretty good job of it too. No, they're just surrounding it. Did they find some contraband? Excuse me. Eins called out to an unsophisticated-looking man in front of him. Ah, yes. What is it? Don't worry, I just noticed that the lion wasn't moving, so I was wondering if you knew what was going on. I'm not too clear about what's going on, just that they took a village girl to the duty station. And then... After listening to the man... Ein still had no idea what was going on. He stuck his neck out towards the duty station. He tilted his head to listen in, and heard the sound of an argument. Suddenly, something piqued Ein's curiosity. When he had first come to this city, they had asked him a whole pile of questions at the main gate, but he had not expected to be let past so easily. He had been surprised at the time, and thought that this world was surprisingly kind to rootless people like mercenaries, 
adventurers or travelers, but the truth had not been what he had expected. In that case, what were they asking this village girl? Currently, Ainz's status as an adamantite-ranked adventurer meant that very few cities would refuse him entry. That was why Ainz wanted to know exactly what sort of questions were being asked. In the future, he might have to infiltrate a city in future outside the guise of Mom and the adamantite-ranked adventurer. He had to learn more so there would be no difficulties when the time came. You two wait here for a while. I'll go see what's going on. Please allow me to accompany you. There's no need for that. I'm just taking a look. He dismounted from Hamsuk's back and walked towards the duty station. All the soldiers exclaimed in surprise as they saw Ainz. There was nobody here who did not know the adventurer Momen in E. Rantel. Ainz took care to look as cool as possible as he approached the duty station. He saw an excited looking magic caster, a soldier, and a seated village girl. We wish to enter the city, but. What's going on? You ooh. The two men exclaimed in the same surprise as the soldiers outside. The village girl was stunned when she saw it. If. If it isn't Moment Summer himself. Forgive us. Now, what's going on here? Hmm. This girl is. She seemed familiar. Eins felt that he knew her and he searched his hippocampus though he did not possess such an organ for information confirming her. Yes. We were investigating a suspicious girl, which took some time. We sincerely apologize for inconveniencing you, Moment Summer. Ainz was beginning to find the man's chatter intolerable. Then, inspiration struck, and he recalled the village girl's name. Henry, right. You must be Henry Emmett, am I correct? Uh, ah, who are you? Uh, no, I am. Ah, you were the one who came with Nferia that time, right? I don't remember speaking to you. Did Nferia tell you my name? At that moment, Ainz instinctively pressed his hand over his mouth. He had met Enri when he was the masked magic caster Ainz all gown. Now, he was the adamantite ranked adventurer in jet black armor, Momen. Crap. I spoke in my normal voice. This is terrible. I need to leave here right away. But still, what's that village girl doing here? Won't it be troublesome if she finds me no, finds Ein's Ulgaun here? I need to clarify the details with her. She did not seem to have divined his true identity from the conversation just now, but he could not rule out the possibility that he had been exposed. Granted, he did not think she would have matched his voice from several months ago to a few words spoken through a layer of armor, but it was best to be prudent. Eins beckoned the magic caster over. He felt that the man ought to know more than the soldiers. He led the magic caster out of the duty station, and they went some distance away to avoid being overheard by the sentries. It's like this. That girl's a friend of a friend. Can you tell me what happened with her? He was not lying since Nferia was indeed a friend of Ainz and Momen, the magic caster's eyes went wide. He appeared to be shocked, but that was not the case. It was more like connecting points of data to form a beautiful line. It was as though a mystery in his heart had been solved. I see. As I thought. Could you please hurry up the process of accepting the facts? Ainz very much wanted to say that, but he bore with it and waited for the man to speak. She said she was just a village girl, but she was carrying a powerful horn-shaped magic item. I wasn't sure why she had such a powerful item, and I had other questions of my own, so I wanted to clarify things. What sort of horn was it? What effects did it have? Its effects were. After listening to the whole explanation, Eins could not help looking up to the sky. That was because he was trying to run away from the knowledge that it was an item which he had given her. At that time, Ainz had not known that such an item was beyond the comprehension of this world. He had given her the horn simply for her to protect herself. Who could have imagined that it would have created so much trouble for her? Ainz could probably have come up with an excuse along the lines of I did nothing wrong, but ignoring her plight was not good either. I'll help her out a little. I didn't do anything wrong, but I did give her the item, after all, so the responsibility lies with me. 
If I abandon her and it falls into someone else's hands, it'll end up being more troublesome for me. Besides, if she gets locked up. Nfoya knew that Moman and Ayn's all gown were one and the same. Given these circumstances, if Henry told him about this, he would surely think that Ayn's had left her to her fate. It'll definitely leave a bad aftertaste between us. I don't care about causing difficulties with worthless humans, but he's a very valuable being. As the saying goes, I ought to turn this danger into an opportunity. If I lend her a hand, Nfoya ought to be grateful to me. If I do this, I can chain his heart closer to me with more obligations, Ein spoke, in a tone which he believed combined calmness and dignity. There is no need for you to worry. I am very familiar with her character. She will not go around causing trouble, so could I impose upon you to let her pass? Could you? But of course. If she is a friend of Moman from darkness, and you are vouching for her, then we would allow her in, no matter how vicious a criminal she was. Really now, my apologies, then. In that case, I'll leave that to you. Also, I apologize for this, but could you allow us darkness to enter the city first? After receiving permission, Ainz returned to Nabral and Hamsuk. We've been allowed in. Let's enter the city. He mounted up on Hamsuk's back and bypassed the line of people. The queuing people all looked at him, but once they saw his black armor, his great swords, Hamsuk and Nabral, they all averted their eyes. They understood that Ainz's status was far greater than theirs. The gate sentries bowed deeply to them as they passed by, and then they entered Erantel. Now then, Nabe. I have something to ask of you. Understood. Please command me as you see fit. Since they were both adventurers, it did not seem good for her to display such loyalty on the streets. However, Ainz had gradually realized that it was pointless to lecture her, and so he continued speaking. The girl driving the wagon from just now Enri will be entering the city soon. Go ask her why she came to E. Rantel. After that, Ainz found a place to hide himself. This was because he wanted to avoid speaking with Henry too much. He surveyed his surroundings and saw a stack of tall wooden crates he could probably hide behind, and so he commanded Hamsuk to make haste towards it. The soldiers working there panicked when they saw Ainz and Hamsuk approaching them. Gentlemen, are you free? I'd like to ask about these crates. Once he was certain that he would not be spotted from the city gates, Ainz addressed one of the soldiers. Of course, he was not interested in the crates at all. He had simply made up a pretext to be there because he was worried others might chase him away for interfering with their work. Ah. All right. We're very glad that you'd take an interest in our work, Moman Summer. The crates are filled with vegetables from the Grandel province, known as Kinshu. These vegetables. As Ainz listened to the soldier's earnest explanation, he mumbled replies like I see and so that's how it is. The soldier did not seem to mind the half-hearted responses and continued his lecture. After learning how to cook the vegetables called kinshu in exacting detail, he sensed Nabral approaching from behind him. Forgive me for interrupting your explanation. I learned a lot, thank you. However, my companion has returned, and so I must leave. After his one-sided farewell to the soldier, Ainz ordered Hamsuk forward. How did it go? Firstly, she wanted me to thank you, Moman San. After that, she said that she had three aims, namely selling off the herbs she had collected, checking the temples for people who might want to move to the village, and finally, traveling to the Adventurer's Guild. The Adventurer's Guild? What kind of request is she putting in? Forgive me, but I did not ask about that. Shall I capture her and force her to talk? There's no need for that. Besides, we'll be heading to the Adventurer's Guild too, so we can just ask the Guild when we get there. Surely she did not intend to directly thank Ainz Ulgaun. If it was for that objective, she could simply leave a message with Lupus Regina, whom he occasionally sent to the village. Oh yes, Nabe. Have you received any special reports from Lupus Regina? Nabral shook her head, and Ainz furrowed his naturally, they were non-existent brows. He had originally planned to station a shadow demon in the village, but he had instead sent Lupus Regina over in order to forge friendly relations. 
he had ordered Lupus Regina to report anything that happened in the village to him immediately. However, no information had made its way to Ains up till this point. Therefore, he had believed that Kani village was fine, was that not the case? While there was no need to tell him about trivia such as Enri went to E. Rantel by herself, uneasiness still shrouded Ainz's heart like a cloud. I've always thought Lupus Regina was a hard worker. Nabe, what do you think? It is as you say, Ainz Summer. While her tone makes her seem very casual, that is only an act. She is cruel and cunning, an excellent maid. There was no way cruelty and slyness could be taken as compliments. Ainz glanced at Narbrell's face, wondering if she thought ill of Lupus Regina, but her cool expression only contained her respect for a colleague. Then my lord, shall we proceed presently to the Adventurer's Guild as you said earlier? Yes, do you know its location? Narbrell, you sit behind me. Since you've already put away the statue of Animal, War Horse, there's no need to go to the trouble of taking it out again. Ainz grabbed Narbrell's hand and sat her behind him. Hamsuk seemed eager to move off and picked up the pace, he was no longer embarrassed to ride Hamsuk through the streets. In addition, Hamsuk could understand language and take orders, which pleased him. It felt just like riding a cab. Soon, the adventurer's guild appeared before his eyes. At the same time, he saw the wagon from earlier, and Enri's back as she entered the guild. There's nothing else to be done. Hamsuk, we'll go in through the back door. Circle round the back. Understood, my lord. Usually, adventurers were not allowed to enter the guild through the back door. However, anything was possible for adamantite-ranked adventurers. Incidentally, it was also Ainz's first time doing this. He might be of a privileged class, but abusing his privileges would damage his reputation. After entering the guild through the back door, he asked the first guild employee he saw to take him to the guildmaster's room. Fortunately, the guildmaster was in. Oh, if it isn't Momen Kun. Welcome. The guildmaster Einzak opened his arms wide to welcome Eins, and then he warmly embraced Eins. While he thought nothing of it because he was wearing his armor and a helmet, there were many reasons which would have chosen made him avoid that ardent embrace if he were in a thin layer of clothing. He patted Eins intimately on the back before slowly releasing him. I've been so lonely because you haven't come around lately. Come, come, have a seat. Let's chat a bit before the others show up. The guildmaster looked like he was welcoming a friend he had not seen for a long time as he happily indicated the sofa. Thank you. After Eins took a seat, the guildmaster sat down beside him. The two of them were very close. Their knees were touching, and it was stifling. Momen Kun, we've known each other for so long, surely we can speak more freely around each other, hmm? No, there must be politeness even as there's familiarity. This is very important, it's what my seniors taught me. Granted, if he were a salaryman, he would have spoken with more closeness sometimes, he even spoke to customers in a normal tone. However, he did not wish to get so close to the guildmaster. He felt that maintaining a businesslike attitude was the right answer. Getting too close to the group will only become a burden. I don't want to be too closely tied to the adventurer's guild of a single city. Should I leave for greener pastures soon? Besides, Ainz glanced at the guildmaster through the eye slits of his helmet. Besides, why the heck is he sitting so close to me? Normally, you'd let Nabral sit beside me, and you'd sit opposite me, right? Their proximity made him feel uncomfortable, it was no wonder Ainz began to suspect if the guildmaster was gay. I heard the magician's guildmaster say he had a wife. Or is his wife just a beard? 8. I thought he was just trying to get me on his side. But it's having the opposite effect. Or does he think I'm gay? That final mental image made Ainz shudder. Ainz was heterosexual. No, to be precise, he used to be. Incidentally, Suzuki Satoru preferred larger breasts. That point had, probably, not changed, even after gaining this body. That was because he preferred albedo slightly more to, say, cochitis. Ainz adjusted his sitting position, 
moving slightly away from the guildmaster, and then he turned to face him. Forgive my rudeness, but I came here with a question. It's like this one of my friends should have come to the Adventurer's Guild by now, and I'd like to know what sort of request she put in. Well, the rules make it somewhat difficult to tell you about this. Thus, I seek your understanding in the matter. I do understand I'm imposing, and I understand the need to obey the guild's rules. However, I hope you will lend me your help in this. Eines bowed his head, to which the guildmaster responded by folding his arms and staring at the ceiling, a stern look on his face. However, he only held that pose for a short while. I understand, he smiled to Eines. Since it's you asking, Momen Kun, I can't exactly reject it either. Then, could you tell me that person's name? She is Enri of Kani Village. No, Enri Emmett. Enri, is it? Then, could you give me a little time? Before long, the guildmaster returned. He was followed by one of the receptionists which Eines had seen before. She moved stiffly as she entered the room. Moment summer. My apologies. This was the first time Eines had ever seen someone walk while moving both the arms and legs on the same sides of their body at the same time. He thought, that's quite something and there's no need to be so tense, but in the end, he still nodded haughtily. Part of the challenge of being an adamantite-ranked adventurer that he could not appear too relaxed. This receptionist attended to Henry Emmett of Kearney Village. It would be better for you to ask her directly. Ask her anything you wish to know. Is that so? Then no, before that, perhaps she should have a seat, Guildmaster. But this is your room, and it is not up to me too. No. There's no need to bother you. I'm fine with standing. Perhaps Suzuki Satoru might have felt that it was very wrong to be seated while his opposite number was standing. However, in the process of being Ein's all gown of being the leader of the great underground tomb of Nazarick he had gradually lost such feelings. He was slowly becoming used to the difference between a leader and a follower. Perhaps this was an indication that his actions as a master, role-playing, were not a waste of effort, but he had indeed accumulated experience points. How much more until I level up? Oops. I see. Then, let's get down to business. I would like you to tell me about her request, in as much detail and possible. This is a very important matter, so can you tell me everything about it? Why yes. The receptionist's forehead was beaded in cold sweat. What is it? Is there a problem? No, I mean. The receptionist's eyes were flickering from side to side. Am I asking the wrong questions? Perhaps, so let's try this. Was she looking for someone in particular to help with her request? No. It's not, it's not like that. Ah, I see. Then, what sort of request was it? Or was it not even a request? Actually, she did not make a request right away, just said that she might make one in future. And then she mentioned something about monsters called the Giant of the East and the Serpent of the West, who were comparable to the wise king of the forest which you tamed, Moment Summer. That, er, uh, that's all. Eines was quite surprised by how tongue-tied she sounded, but he continued asking. So it's a future request, then? No. It's not. I, I didn't know she was a friend of yours, Momen Summer. If I'd known, I would have asked more carefully. Really. Eines was quite perturbed by the receptionist, who was wailing while on the verge of tears. Could someone as emotional as this really man a counter? Guildmaster. My apologies. We did not oversee this adequately. Why is it like that? Isn't that how the guild's rules work? After listening in on their conversation, Eins realized how they had misinterpreted his intentions. The receptionist and guildmaster believed that Eins and Enri were friends, and while he had intended to take her job for free, he had decided to give the adventurers guild their due deference and thus they hand arranged for him to accept her request through the guild. However, the receptionist had coldly chased away Enri by bringing up the manner of fees. Therefore, the two of them were arguing about who should be taking the responsibility for chasing away the friend of an adamantite-ranked adventurer. No, if this was a rule of the organization, 
then wouldn't she be right to have obeyed it? Ayn stared at the guildmaster as he rebuked the receptionist, and his opinion of the man took a sharp dive in his eyes. If a subordinate makes a mistake, her superior ought to cover for her. Or is this some sort of high-level technique where he savagely scolds her in front of a customer to earn the customer's sympathy and thus his forgiveness? I mean, look at how he's laying into her. Eines felt that that the receptionist had handled this correctly, and the guildmaster should have known that as well. However, just like how he had come in through the back door and leaned on the guildmaster for a favor, adamantite-ranked adventurers could easily bend the rules. That was because they were valuable enough that the guild wanted to keep them around, even if they flouted the rules. That was probably why the two of them were arguing now. I didn't know. Eins gently spoke to comfort the weeping receptionist. The fault is not yours. The receptionist's eyes went wide, and her tears flowed out from them and rolled down her cheeks. Obeying the organization's rules is very important, even if they must be overlooked from time to time. I will not hold this incident against you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then, I hope I can trouble you to go get the details from her. Please don't say I'll be taking it, only that I want to be ready to make a move at any time. I understand. I. I'll go ask now. I'm very sorry. The receptionist turned and ran off like the passing of a typhoon. While I know you wanted to gain my sympathy, I would prefer if you did not falsely blame someone who was innocent. It displeases me. As I thought. I can't pull the wool over your eyes, Moman Kun. Those words sounded like they had been squeezed out of the depths of his soul, and Eins knew that his guess had been correct. So the techniques of the Japanese salaryman are universally applicable. However, the problem is... The form of Lupus Regina came to Eins's mind. Why didn't Lupus Regina have any information about monsters that even a village girl like Enri was aware of? Was it a failure in the construction of the intelligence network? I need to make sure. As Eins waited for the receptionist to report to him, he mused that he would need to return to Nazarick and sort this out. Nazarick Time, 1641 A nervous-looking Lupus Regina entered Eins's office. The panic and unease of being suddenly summoned was written all over her face. Inside the office were Lupus Regina, the regular maid sixth, the battle maid Narbrill, Aura, who was the one most familiar with the forest, the eight edge assassins on the ceiling, and the owner of the room, Eins. Incidentally, Albedo was still in confinement. Lupus Regina was about to prostrate before Eins when he interrupted her. Lupus Regina, is there something you've kept from me? After seeing the confused look on her face, he wondered if she did not know about it after all. Eins decided to repeat what he had heard about the Giant of the East and the Serpent of the West from the Adventurer's Guild. However, as he saw that Lupus Regina seemed to have known about this long before, Eins's mood rapidly deteriorated. He exhaled long and loud. So you were aware of this, then? Yes. About that. You fool. Ruled by anger, Eins's wrath-filled shout echoed through the room. As the others recoiled like they had been struck by lightning, Eins felt something suppress his emotions, but even after the peak of rage was cut off, his anger surged up again, and there was no way he could fully rein in his ire. Why did you not report this to me? Were you trying to keep this from me? N no. Nothing like that. Then why? Why did none of this reach me at all? What was the reason for that? B. Because I th thought it wasn't a big deal, s so I didn't report. For some reason, the sight of the frightened battle made peeking up at him only incensed him further. Lupus Regina Beta. I am thoroughly disappointed in you. Lupus Regina was not the only one who flinched at this. Nabe and Sixth were trembling too, and the eight edge assassins on the ceiling seemed to have frozen up as well. I gave you discretion over handling the village, but that does not mean you can do as you please. You were told to report anything that happened in the village, anything at all, so what is the meaning of this? That's... Eins's face twisted as he looked down on Lupus Regina, who was unable to answer him. This was an unforgivable sin for a worker, no, for anyone. 
These rules were obvious for anyone who did business, or rather, for anyone who worked in society at all, report, communicate, discuss. It was an abbreviation of reporting what you had learned, communicating clearly with others and discussing issues as they came up. They were very important, the lifeblood of the giant that was working society. If she can't even do that, I don't think I can forgive her from the perspective of a leader. No. As he looked on the terrified Lupus Regina, Ains could not help but think that he was at least partially to blame. These mistakes would only result if a superior was unreliable and could not properly direct his subordinates. A failure in the group's communications is my fault. I couldn't take proper control of this. Maybe I should step back and let Demiurge or Albedo handle this sort of thing. Lupus Regina, are you aware of Carney Village's value to Nazarick? Ha? Huh? No. Yes. Ah, uh, I heard you say that village is very valuable, Ein Summer. No, no, I mean, what do you, personally, feel is valuable about the village? W. Well, there's a lot of toys there, and... Ah, uh, that's how it is. Well then. I'm sorry. It was my mistake. I did not realize you thought like that. Eins laughed tiredly. He realized it had been his fault after all. I take back what I said about you being a disappointment. I went too far. Please forgive me. W. What are you saying? It was my foolish mistake. In that case, just be more careful next time. Now then, I explain again, so pay close attention. That village is very valuable to us. Especially that boy, Furya, and his grandmother Lizzie. They are of great importance to Nazarick. E? Is is that so? Indeed. I have handed the task of creating new potions to those two. Ah, but that's right. I have something to show you, and Summer. Lupus Regina suddenly shouted that last part as her face turned pale. She took out a vial of purple potion and Nabril, who was closest to her, took it and handed it to Eins. This is... Eins looked at the potion through the light. Why, yes. This is Nferia's new healing potion. Eins's anger flared again, and he tried his best to quash it. With this potion, the bear family's importance has risen again. Eins laughed quietly as he saw Lupus Regina's clueless face. This purple potion Furia made had been concocted using various items provided by Nazarick. The most important thing was that without possessing Yggdrasil's potion creation skills, they had managed to use ingredients from Yggdrasil to create something other than this world's blue potions or Yggdrasil's red potions. For starters, the healing potions of this world are blue. But the healing potions I know of are red. Curious, don't you think? Eins rambled. The knowledge and powers of Yggdrasil could be used in this world. From the angels he had first encountered, to the apparent existence of world-class items, there was a very high chance that players had been here in the past. In that case, why was it that the potions were not red like in Yggdrasil? There were three possibilities. First, the downfall of a country might have resulted in the loss of those potion-making techniques. These techniques should have been quite widespread, and nothing short of an entire country's destruction would be able to wipe them out. The second reason might have been that Nferia simply did not know these techniques, since they had not spread to the nearby countries. Perhaps distant countries might be using red potions. After all, in Japan, the same noodle soup looked completely different when prepared on different sides of the country. The third reason was optimization, making Yggdrasil potions would require Yggdrasil materials. Maybe those materials were difficult to find here, or they were not available at all, and that was why only blue potions were the best that could be made with this world's materials. That is to say, except for the second possibility, this potion that Nferia made, Ein swirled the purple potion in its vial. This might be a once-in-a-century technological revolution, for all I know. Well, if it's the third possibility, this might turn out to be a failed product after all. His hard work in the future will give me the answer. What Eins wanted from Furia was for him to make Yggdrasil potions without using Yggdrasil materials. Or he might come up with something else and end up making a third, completely different potion. In that case, 
would it not be more effective to let more people research the subject? Narbrell's question made Ayn's frown. That is a foolish question. Narbrell. Indeed, the work would proceed more quickly, but it would be very dangerous. Knowledge is power, and freely distributing it is a foolish action. Yggdrasil was also like that, so Ayn's could confidently say that. For example, there is a possibility that his potion could be refined to the point where it could kill me with a single attack. Then, it would be safer to monopolize this knowledge than to spread it. It's better for slaves to be a little ignorant, but one must always keep abreast of technological advancements. This is the same for Nferia and his potions, though I would like to lock him up in Nazarick and make him focus solely on research and development. This would both prevent the spread of the technique and the usage of the potion. Then, then why have you not done so? Narbrell's eyes seemed to say that she would do it immediately if ordered, and so Ains hurriedly squeezed out a reply. Rather than imprison him and force him to work, I will build his trust in us, as a long-term scheme that will bring better benefits to Nazarick. Demiurge analyzed the situation and concluded that it was better to shackle him to us with a debt of obligation, hmm? What's wrong, Lupus Regina? There's one thing I don't understand, could you explain it to a fool like me? Why did you give the potion to someone like Britta, Ein Summer? Eins had no idea who Britta was, going by her name alone. While trying to maintain a look which said all is within the palm of my hand which was to say, a carefully blank expression, he struggled frantically to think of a solution. Could it be that potion? Eins recalled the first night he spent in E. Rantel. As he remembered what he had said then, Eins was grateful that his body could no longer sweat. What should I do? What should I say? He could not keep silent forever. Demiurge. Albedo. Why aren't you here? No, Demiurge is currently abroad performing his tasks, and Albedo is in confinement. It's too late to call her over. Is that so? You really don't understand? Yes. I apologize for my lack of knowledge. Please enlighten me. Just don't ask. Eins wanted to shout. However, he had no other options, so all he could do was roll the dice and hope for the best. Courage filled him as he decided on his course. Fufu. Ha 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 ha. Indeed, it was a dangerous move that you, Lupus Regina, have the right to be curious about. It could have resulted in a development that we would not be able to control. However, there was a motive for taking such risks. A motive? Wasn't it just meant to compensate her for the loss of her potion? Narbrell's interruption made Ayn swallow the words he was about to say. His brain spun into high gear, and he struggled to recall that encounter in E. Rantel. That's right. At that time, I just did it so I wouldn't get a bad rep. Damn. Ayn's maintained his calm demeanor. He would have to lie to cover up another lie. He struggled to muster up the vestiges of his rapidly vanishing courage. Is that all you thought I was doing, Narbrell? I am very sorry. No, this isn't something you should apologize for. At the time, I wasn't confident my plan would work out, so I chose a simpler explanation. Then, what was your real aim? In the face of Narbrell's questions, Ainz's jaw hung open for a moment at a loss for words. But in that moment, inspiration struck. With that as the basis for his confidence, Ainz prepared to speak. It was Nferia. As Ainz slowly opened his mouth, he took in the subordinates around him. If Demiurge or Albedo were present, they would probably interrupt and say, Ah, so that's how it is, as expected of Ainz's summer. Narbrell, on the other hand, could only furiously furrow her brows. Furia? Ainz cupped his chin with a silent umu. Fear began creeping over the faces of Narbrell and the others, because they thought Ainz's pose meant, do you still not understand, even after I've said this much? In truth, Ainz had made that gesture unconsciously, not knowing what to do with his hands. In a short period of time, Ainz had been subjected to extreme tension and the emotion suppression that blanked it out. Between these two clashing forces, an epiphany came upon Ainz. Without knowing where he would end up, Ainz clung to that last straw and took a step into the darkness. Mm. 
I managed to get the attention of the pharmacist known as Nferia, was that enough of an answer? That's right. Normally, what would you do if you got your hands on a potion that was completely different from any other potion that you had ever encountered? Discuss it with someone? Exactly. Lupus Regina, it is exactly as you said, as I predicted, Britta brought the potion to the pharmacist she trusted the most. That was how I came into contact with Nferia. He remembered that Nferia had apparently said something similar when they met at Kani village. Ah. So that's how it is. That was your objective all along. You seem to get it. That was the bait for my hook to catch a master alchemist. Although there was a chance it could have ended up in a strange place and caused problems, it was still worth a try. A sense of understanding filled the air, and there were looks of admiration on their faces. I managed to join the stories together. Just as Eines was about to mentally sigh in relief, a sudden, unexpected question came. Then. I understand I'm being very rude, but could I ask one more question? No. Stop. Please don't ask any more questions. Eines was crying inside, but his face remained impassive. What's the matter, Lupus Regina? If you have something you need to discuss, feel free to look me up. Yes, Lupus Regina swallowed, and with a serious expression on her face, she asked, Do you always think two or three steps ahead when making plans, Eins Summer? Most of the time, Eins made things up on the spot. Of course, sometimes he tried to plan his next move, but more often than not, the results were completely different from what he intended. Of course, he could not say any of that. Eins laughed quietly. It was a practiced laugh. Of course. I am the ruler of the great underground tomb of Nazarick, Eins Ulgaun, am I not? Quiet exclamations of O. Oh, rose up from all around him, and Lupus Regina's eyes went wide. What's wrong, Lupus Regina? A wise king. Lupus Regina's gasped words made Aura frown, and she took a step forward. However, Ein stopped her. Pay it no heed. Is that all you have to ask? Then, er, uh, then, I've got another one. Wouldn't it be better if we let the monsters attack the village, and then Ein Summer would swoop in to save them, wouldn't that be better? I mean, wouldn't Feria and his grandmother feel extra grateful to Ein Summer for plucking them out of the fire? That would make them more useful. Right? Well, that is a very good plan, and worth considering, however, if that happened, Nferia might end up hating the monsters too much and then he would no longer be willing to cooperate with us. Now, it would be a different matter if it was humans who did it. In that case, perhaps it would be more effective if we saved Henry Emmett as well, the better to chain his heart up further. However, Kani village was a village that had been saved by the magic caster Ein's all gown. It had its uses, so burning it down was of questionable value. By the way, the most important people in that village are in descending order, Feria, his crush Henry Emmett and finally his grandmother Lizzie. You must protect these three people no matter the cost. Everyone else is expendable. If need be, sacrifice your life to protect Feria. That's it. Is that all, Lupus Regina? Yes. Thank you very much. Now then, Lupus Regina, I will forgive you for this lapse. Now that you know my objectives, you will not be forgiven next time. Do you understand? Of course. Very good. Then go. Complete your assigned tasks. Lupus Regina bowed and exited the room, followed closely by Narbril, who seemed more like a police officer escorting a criminal. After the two of them vanished out the door, Ains turned to the guardian beside him. Now then, Aura. Do you know anything about the giant of the east and the serpent of the west? Suddenly, a loud shout came from outside the room. Seriously, Ein Summer is amazing Sue. I can't believe he thought so far ahead, and in such detail. He must be some kind of monster Sue. The voice that came through the thick door was not very loud, but it was enough to interrupt the conversation. Given that they could hear her words so clearly, how loudly was she yelling in the corridor, just outside? Should we tell her how thin the doors are? I think she's just too excited, let me go pound some sense. 
There was a smashing sound from outside the door, and then the sound of something heavy being dragged into the distance. Aura, I don't think you need to go any more. Back to the previous topic, let me know what you found. Yes. Uh, I'm very sorry, but I haven't heard anything about the giant of the east and the serpent of the west, after we fought that tree monster called Xi'apostrophe-T.L. Key, I did a quick sweep of the forest, aside from the underground caverns, which I didn't investigate. I didn't find any strong enemies. Well, if they're only as strong as Hamsuk, I understand why you wouldn't have paid any attention to them. Even a gardener could not be expected to know how many ants were crawling in his domain. Missing out on things due to the difference in strength was a problem. I am truly sorry. Then, I'm summer, will we be doing house cleaning? That sounds like a good idea. We'll swat those pesky flies and put the forest under Nazarick's complete control. Got it. Then, I'll send some of my pets along. Umu. It seems a little boring that way. I'd like to see what sort of monsters this giant of the east and serpent of the west are, who can rival Hamsuk. Then, shall I drag them here in chains? No, I think I shall go visit them in person. Thanks to Hamsuk, I found another way of appreciating the value of collectibles as well. Ainz laughed at the puzzled expression on Aura's face. Well, of course that's not all. I also want to see if I can arrange a test for Lupus Regina. Nazarick Time, 1916 Fenrir crept leisurely through the nighttime forest. Neither the branches which stuck out or the coiling vines hampered Fenrir's movements or the two people on its back. In fact, they seemed to move like incorporeal wraiths, without even disturbing a twig. This was the effect of one of Fenrir's skills, Landwalker. According to my vassal's reports, the giant of the east's lair seems to be just ahead. There was no tension in Aura's voice, even in this world of darkness, cut off from the starlight by the densely packed trees. Ainz and the others were not like humans, who lacked special visual modes. They took in the darkened forest around them like it was broad daylight. Is that so? We would be very lucky if the giant of the east and the serpent of the west were to gather in the same place. However, that's probably being greedy. If the Serpent of the West is not here, then I'll leave its disposal to you, Aura. Yes. I'll do my best. But how shall I deal with these fools who dare make hostile moves on you, I'm Summer? Let's try communication first. Aura looked behind herself at Ainz with a puzzled look on her face. Eh? Weren't we going to make them swear themselves to us? That's because the giant of the east and the serpent of the west are unknown monsters. Starting with an attempt at rational communication ought to be better from just about every angle. If they're monsters which don't exist in Yggdrasil, then I would like to keep them. You're so kind, Ein Summer. There was no mockery within Aura's tone. Is. Is that so? I feel that only the worthy deserve my kindness followed by those who belong to Nazarick. I'm doing this because they might have some value if they're on Hamsuk's level. I suppose you could call this seizing an opportunity? You mentioned Hamsuk just now, but is it really that valuable? Oh yes, it's quite useful as a guinea pig. Hamsuk was currently studying to be a warrior under Zarasu of the Lizardmen. Incidentally, one of the death knights made by Ainz was also studying under him. Training the two of them a hamster and a monster was intended to see if they could acquire warrior class levels. This was particularly true for the Death Knight. If he could gain warrior levels, that would greatly increase Nazarick's combat power. While he felt it was probably impossible, he still had to conduct the experiment to be sure. Are you having the blacksmith make armor for Hamsuk because it's that important? You're quite well informed. That's also one of the reasons. I may have to ride it onto the battlefield in future, so enhancing its defense might be critical. Hamsuk should have no problem wearing full plate armor once he had warrior class levels. Currently, putting it in armor greatly decreased its evasion and mobility rates due to its weight. Ainz felt that it needed training for that reason. However, armor hampers its movements as it doesn't have warrior levels, that much is the same as the game. No, I can't even wear metal armor at all due to the game's restrictions. 
from that point of view, its restrictions are a lot more lax. If only there were a second hamsuk, then I could study the differences between the two. These restrictions which resembled those of the game were still a mystery even now. If he let Demiurge and the others perform in-depth investigations, they might be able to find the right answer, but for some reason, Eins did not want to do that. This is a magical world, and it might run on physics that are vastly different from ours. Perhaps all I can do is force myself to accept that this is just one of the principles of such a world. Just assume that anything could happen. Ein Summer, what's wrong? Hmm? No, it's nothing, what is it? No, it just seemed like you were thinking, and I wanted to ask if something was the matter. Oh, indeed. I was just thinking about some things, it's nothing much. I see. Aura seemed relieved and faced forward once more. Eins looked at the back of her head which was covered in silky golden hair and his eyes roved down. His eyes passed over her slender back, and then they focused on his hands which were wrapped around her slender waist. She's so slim, are children's waists all so thin? Having never had children of his own, Eins was curious, and he could not resist the urge to pat her waist, like he was inspecting her. Then, Eins raised his hand to lightly pat her back. However, he did not use much force because he was mounted on Fenrir. However, Aura jumped up and suddenly jerked around. You are. What? What is it, Ein Summer? Her face was very red. In fact, it was so red that even someone without, dark vision, might be able to see how red it was. Ah, it's nothing, I just thought your waist was very thin. Have you been eating well? You're equipped with items that negate the need for eating and drinking but you can still eat, right? I, I can. I won't gain any magical enhancements from doing so, but I can still eat. In games like Yggdrasil, humanoids and demi-humans had designated lifespans, and in turn they could grow. Conversely, heteromorphs had no maximum lifespans and so they would stop aging after a certain period. If that character aspect had carried over to this world, then Aura and Mare would slowly grow older. Eins did not want their growth to be affected because they had not received proper nutrition as children. While his companions were not around, the growth of these kids was Eins's responsibility. You need to eat well, okay? Yes. I'll eat well and make Shiltir regret it. Eins had no idea why Shiltir had suddenly come up, but he did not inquire into it. Items that remove the need for eating and drinking might affect growth, so depending on the situation, perhaps you should swap them out for other items. Growing up. Perhaps one day, you two will have lovers of your own. Aura and Mare were very cute children, and when they grew up, they would surely be very handsome and beautiful. Eins imagined men and women of all sorts confessing their love to them although, Eins had never had experiences like those, so what he imagined had all come from TV shows. Perhaps he had been influenced by the previous topic, but for some reason he imagined a huge pile of hamsukes. Hmm? He visualized a young Aura and Mare being surrounded by vast amounts of hamsukes. It seemed quite pleasing, but it was completely different from the plan which Eins had in mind. Hamsukes related to rodents, so hamsuk ought to be capable of reproducing in vast quantities. Is it best to sterilize it? Although I'd like to let it breed a little more. I wonder if there are any males of its species? Eh? It's still too early for that, I'm summer. I'm only seventy. I, I see, you're right. You're still young. Well, anyway, Aura, who do you like most in Nazarick? What's your type? While Eins had no experience in love, he still got a little jealous whenever he saw dashing lads and pretty girls being all lovey-dovey on the roadside. However, Eins was sure that he could genuinely wish the NPCs well if it were them. I like you the most, Eins Summer. Ha ha, well, that's good to hear. Eins was quite happy to hear such flattery from a young child like Aura. He loved the children, NPCs, very much, and how could he not be pleased to hear that they liked him too? Then, who do you like the most, Ein Summer? Who do you like the most between Albedo and Shiltir? Ha ha. Well now, I have to say I like you very much, Aura. 
A. Eins caressed Aura's head from behind. The soft strands of her hand fell from between his fingers. A. Should I start considering the problem of sex education? If there are dark elf schools, should I send Aura and Mare there to study so they can grow into good adults? What would Bukubakushagama san think if she were here? But still, schools. School love comedies. Pererinchino san once raved about it before, and he said he wanted to make a Nazarick academy with Sura Tan san. 9. Where did the data for that go? A. What is it? You're being too loud, Aura. Ah. I, I'm sorry. The giant of the East's lair ought to be nearby, but... It's fine, there's no need to apologize. Leaving that aside, about the future. The... The future? Why yes. Is something the matter? You look flustered. Did something happen? No. Not at all, it's nothing. Yes. Um. You were talking about the future? Oh, yes. I was thinking that if there was a kingdom of dark elves, it might be worth paying them a visit, and at that time, you ought to come along too. A? Eh? Ah, yes. Of course. So that was what you meant by the future. I get it. Please allow me to accompany you there. Also we're almost there, Ein Summer. In the darkness ahead of them, they could see a decidedly unnatural light source through the gaps in the forest. I see. Aura, forgive me, but could you station all the magical beasts you brought along around this region? I'll be making some preparations on my end as well. Eins used one of his skills and summoned powerful undead creatures. A sinister-looking knight appeared, mounted on a pale white horse. More appeared every time Eins used his skill. All right, four ought to be plenty. Now then, pale riders. Stand by in the sky, and if anyone tries to flee, capture them. The pale riders indicated their understanding without saying a word, and with a tug on their reins, the pale horses leapt up and galloped into the sky. The pale riders discorporated, passed through the tree branches, and flew into the air. All right, we've set up an encirclement. Now all we have to do is appraise them. Yes. Ah, don't we need to test their durability? We'll save that for a last resort. My aim is to settle this without any combat. I'll try it and discuss mutually beneficial topics first. That was the truth. Eins was not looking for a fight. While he was perfectly willing to be ruthless if there were benefits to it, that did not mean that he was a cruel person. Eins would not step on the ants crawling around in his path. A rational dialogue would be best. Fenrir approached the gap in the forest. It was called a gap in the forest but the truth was that it was simply a place within the forest where trees did not grow. This area was covered with withered trees, just like the mountainous region around the evil tree. There were some areas which ended up as withered forests for special reasons. There were many of those reasons, and in this case it was probably because of monsters. The trees had been felled and scattered everywhere. It would seem someone had tried to build a large structure and failed, and had then thrown the logs around in a fit of rage. How laughable! Aura, they were probably trying to build a structure like yours. The work of fools is truly unsightly. They live in caves and don't know how far out of their depth they are, resulting in this sort of thing. Indeed. Ein Summer, their lair is over there. There was a fissure in the scarred ground, which had been burnt barren, nobody's standing watch. How careless! All right, it can't be helped. We'll knock next time. With Aura by his side Eins walked toward the entrance to the underground cave. He peered inside, and it looked like a gentle slope, and the interior seemed quite spacious. The ceiling was high, and it would seem even large creatures could live inside without problems. This reminds me of Dungeon Delves in Yggdrasil. Back then, we used to get curious and excited every time we discovered mountain caves and the like. If this were in the past, they would have let Tigris Euphrates and people like him lead the way, while Ein's Momonga would follow behind them. Then, they would summon monsters, and in Ein's case he would have the undead walk ahead of them, allowing them to trigger traps as they forged boldly ahead. This was known as a warrior's disarm, 
or a summon disarm. Those were the days. The memories of the past lightened Ainz's steps, but within a few seconds, his cheery mood vanished. The stench from below made him wrinkle his non-existent eyebrows. It was not poison gas, but rather, an odor of beast fat and decay which clouded up the air. Is this a stinking gas cloud trap? I don't think these cave dwellers could set such an elaborate trap. Perhaps it formed naturally. Eins was undead and did not need to breathe. He was completely immune to gas vector attacks. Aura was also protected by magic items, so if this stench was some sort of attack, it ought to be ineffective. That being the case, this was probably just an ordinary stink. It seems the giant of the east is not a particularly clean person. I hope he's at least a little intelligent and can speak with me. Yup. Although, that might be a little difficult. Going by the footprints, this cave seems to house several life forms of the same kind, but they're all barefooted. The footprints are large, and going by their size, they all seem to be over two meters tall. I see. So he must be one of them. Ains and Aura had not stopped walking, and as they descended the slope, they saw two monsters at the base of the slope. Ains summer, those are. Ogres. The two ogres were tearing at something and shoving it into their mouths. A new reek wafted over to Ains and Aura. Ains slowly extended his finger and smiled bitterly. If this were a simple dungeon hack, he would have killed the ogres quietly, and then advanced forward without making a sound to wipe out all the other enemies, however, his objective this time was different. I'm not here to massacre everyone, so I need to communicate in a friendly manner oi, you ogres over there, sorry to interrupt your meal. The two ogres turned simultaneously to look at Ains, and then they roared. The echoes within the cave were intense, and there was no way to accurately judge position, but it would seem a similar howl had come from the depths of the cave. Well, this is quite a crude and noisy doorbell stand back, Aura, he glared as the ogres ran over. What a pain, Ein sighed. That was because he realized that they did not wish to communicate with him. Skelton. Skelton. Anamai. The ogre screamed hoarsely as it came up to Ein's, and then swung its club at Ein's without a moment's pause. I have. The ogre's club whistled through the air as it swept at him. To apologize for barging. It struck Ein's with a thump, but a mere non-magical club could not possibly hurt him. Into your home. The ogre raised its club again and hammered at Ein's. Ein's's field of vision wobbled slightly as the club struck his head. While it did not hurt in the least, it was still quite annoying. That said, if anyone set foot into Nazarick, Ains would certainly be angry enough to want to kill them. With that in mind, it was only natural for them to want to attack him, so Ains should probably take the blows. Once an envoy of peace drew a weapon, there would be nothing left to say. The other ogre approached slightly later. It did not swing its club, but reached a hand out at Ains. It had probably seen how the attacks of the other ogre had proven ineffective, and wanted to grab him instead. Ains quirked his eyebrows. Of course, there was nothing on a skeletal face which could move. Ains was originally willing to let the ogre grab him. However, his, dark vision capable eyes saw the blood staining the ogre's hand. Disgusting. Ains immediately produced a staff from thin air and swung it. While this staff did not possess any special magic powers, it was focused on inflicting bludgeoning damage, and with a single strike, the head of the ogre who was reaching out for Ains burst like a rotten grape. A mix of fresh blood and brain matter showered the ogre beside it, which dropped its club and took a step back. You. You, no, Skelly. It is quite vexing for you to lump me in with other skeletons. I'm here to see your boss, the giant of the east. Could you go fetch him? Although, I'm fairly sure he'll come even if you don't shout. Ains waved to bid the ogre get lost, and it promptly turned and fled into the cave. Good grief! If they had seen the discrepancy in our respective strengths from the start, we wouldn't have to waste this time. Ains felt the area where the club had struck him as he finished descending the slope. There were several goblins more of masticated corpses, really where the ogres had been just now. 
While their remains were little more than chunks of meat and it was impossible to tell how many there had been, there must have been more than just one or two. Ains and Aura detoured around that area as they continued downwards. What a gaff! I was annoyed and used too much force. I'd originally planned to avoid killing before negotiations broke down, to proceed in as friendly a way as possible. It couldn't be helped. It's the fault of those filthy ogres who tried to touch you, Ein Summer. Hearing you say that pleases me, Punito Mosan once said, punching them in the face is a good way to make the other party behave. Or was it warrior Take My Kazuchi San who said that? Since the Supreme Being said so, then it must be correct. Eins could not recall which of these two polar opposites had said that. Just then, a horde of monsters emerged from the depths of the cave. All of them were far taller than a human being. Well, if it isn't a pack of trolls. While calling them giant smacks of false advertising to me, it's not as though it's a complete lie. Trolls were giants with long ears and noses. They had very ugly faces and their muscular bodies were as revolting as that of any heteromorph. They wore what seemed to be tiger skin clothes their heads emerged from their shoulders. They were nearly three meters tall, stronger than ogres, and possessed of powerful regenerative abilities. It was said that unless they were killed with fire or acid, they could come back from the dead even after being reduced to scraps of meat. There were six trolls here, and ten ogres on top of that. The one which caught Ainz's eye was the troll standing at the head of these monsters. It was more muscular than the other trolls, and its ugly face exuded confidence. It was better equipped than the other trolls too. It wore leather armor which looked like it had been sewn together from several animal hides. Its mighty arms bore a great sword which was larger than the ones which Ainz used in his moment guise. The great sword seemed to be magical, and the central fuller oozed a slippery liquid towards its edge. Is he on Hamsuk's level? Feels that way. That being the case, this troll ought to be the giant of the east. That being the case, what sort of troll was he? Ein studied the giant of the east carefully. Trolls were highly adaptable monsters. They varied greatly according to their environment. For instance, there were volcano trolls who lived in volcanoes and who were resistant to fire. There were sea trolls who were adept at swimming in the ocean and could breathe underwater. There were mountain trolls, who lived in the mountains and were especially strong. There were also toll trolls, rare trolls who lived under bridges. There was a never-ending variety of mutant species and subraces like those. In that case, what was the troll standing before iron specialized in? Trolls adapted to cavern living were called cave trolls. But they looked different from this one. This was a new species of troll which he had encountered for the first time in this world this unknown monster kindled Ainz's collector spirit. The troll known as the Giant of the East had achieved a very rare form of evolution. He was a troll who had been born amidst countless battles, adapted to them, and specialized in fighting ability. If one had to name it, his species would be war trolls, a particularly outstanding example among the many troll subraces. One could say that its combat prowess was unrivaled among others of the same age as him. Granted, his body was smaller than that of a mountain troll, however, the muscles of his body his physical abilities far outstripped those of the latter species. In addition, he did not use a primitive club that could be easily swung with brute force, but instead used his inborn abilities to skillfully wield a sword or weapon which was inferior even to a club if one did not know how to use one. One could say he was a troll who had awakened his warrior abilities. You're the giant of the east, I take it? After hearing no denials, Eins pointed slightly to the right of the giant. Then, I believe that chap over there is the serpent of the west. Am I correct? Someone with ordinary eyesight would surely think he was pointing at empty air. However, Eins could clearly see the heteromorph hiding there, as though it were illuminated by the sun's light. Perhaps you think you've hidden yourself with invisibility, but my eyes can see through it. Stop wasting your effort and answer me. A monster appeared out of what had originally been thin air. It had probably dispelled its invisibility. Indeed, it was a snake. No, to be precise, it had a snake's body. 
It had an old man's torso from the chest up, but it had a serpentine form below that. It was a heteromorphic monster. Unlike the giant of the east, Eines had seen monsters like this in Yggdrasil before, and so he could immediately state the name of his race. A naga, then. While it wouldn't be wrong to call you a serpent, don't you have a better name for yourself? No, there's already the case of the wise king of the forest, so this was only to be expected, no. If thou couldst see through my invisibility, then thou art surely no ordinary. What are you doing here, skeleton? The naga was only halfway through his words when a thunderous voice filled the cave and drowned him out. The giant of the east took a step forward. Irons turned to face his counterpart. First of all, let me get this straight, I am not a skeleton. I wish to correct that mistake of yours, what are you, if not a skeleton? The king of the eastern lands, Gu, permits you to state your name. Gu. Ainz had no idea what he was talking about for a moment. He thought that it was some kind of title, like a king or a chief, and it was only after a while that he realized it was the troll's name. I see, so your name is Gu. Pardon my delayed introduction, my name is Ainz Ulgaon. At that moment, laughter filled the cavern. Fua 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 fua. A coward's name. A soft and weak name, unlike my strong and mighty name. The other trolls laughed distastefully in response to those words. A cow. Ayn stopped Aura before she could take a step forward. It's fine. Don't get upset over a trifling matter like this. Remain calm. We're here to talk, we're ambassadors of peace. Oh yes, just for reference, why do you think I'm a coward? Ah, his ilk takes long names to be a sign of timidity, O oh mysterious undead. The old man's face of the Naga creased with a mocking smile as he spoke from the side, so he's not a collectible, but trash. Then, do you feel my name is that of a coward's as well? This one certainly would not think so, because this one bears a long name as well. Indeed, this one is the serpent of the west of which thou speakst Euraria Spinia I in Darun, O invader Eins all gown. This one has often hoped that his mind would be as developed as his body, but if that were the case, he would have dominated this forest long ago, truly a dilemma. You have just saved your own life. A look of suspicion crossed Eurarius' face as Eins let his innermost thoughts slip out. Unfortunately, just as he wanted to clarify, Gu and the troll stopped laughing. So what are you weaklings doing here? Come to feed me? Bones are delicious and crunchy. I'll eat you starting from your skull. I am the one who ordered the undead and the golems to build the fortress in the forest. You've heard of it, haven't you? The mood changed in an instant. Gu and his band radiated hostility, while Eurarius was filled with caution. I know. You pest. If not for this damn snake making noise I'd have killed you long ago. This saves time. A coward and a black little runt. Ah so we can talk. In truth, I came to negotiate with you. Eins gestured to Gu to kneel before him. Swear yourself to me if you want to live. Are you retarded? How could we serve a coward? I'll eat you right here and now. Then I'll eat that runt behind you. Gu. He rules that fearsome structure. You underestimate him at your peril. And the dark elf behind him, this forest belonged to them before the demon tree chased them away. They might well be mighty foes, but he is not listening. Eins could not help laughing merrily. Ha 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 ha! You're better at barking than a dog, meatball. How about this? I, whom you call a coward, challenge you, who bears a mighty name, to a one-on-one -on -one fight. I trust you won't run in fear? If you're afraid, then get on your hands and knees and beg me for mercy, and I could find it in myself to rear you as a slave. Very good. I can handle a moot like you by myself. I'll chop you to bits and eat you all up. Very well. Since you have made your choice, negotiations have broken down. Aura, stand back. I want to play with him by myself. Just as he finished saying that, the upraised sword hacked down on Eins. This was the blow Gu had struck with the great sword he held, which was over three meters long. Eins did not move, 
simply took the hit square on his body. Huh? What's wrong? What's so surprising? Eines was untouched. Gu's ugly face twisted in surprise, and this time he chose a sweeping slash. However, the result was the same as before, Eines took the blow head-on. Mayu? Gu backed up several steps. He looked at his sword, and then at Eines. He proudly turned his back on Eines, then walked up to one of his minions. In the next moment, the greatsword whirled and cut into one of this troll minions. The sword cleaved into the troll's neck and shoulder, effortlessly parting its flesh, and a geezer of fresh blood spewed forth. The troll screamed stupidly, at the top of its voice. Gu watched in satisfaction as his minion spun and fell to the ground, and he nodded. That was probably to verify that his weapon was working. I see, is that trollish regeneration at work? Quite an impressive sight when you witness it with your own eyes. The wound surface healed over swiftly. It was not so much turning back time as a fast forward of the recovery process. Gu must have known that the troll would regenerate before testing his blade on him, but the evil look on his face as he looked down on his fallen minion suggested that he would have cut the creature up anyway, even if it could not regenerate. It is the privilege of the strong to kill or spare the weak. However it deeply displeases me. Ayn stepped forward. He was no longer in the mood to play around. Gu gripped his greatsword tightly, waiting for Ayn's to approach him, step by step. Gu. That Ayn's Ul gown is no mundane individual. Let us band together to fight. Shut up. You sit there and watch, coward. You go Ul. An explosive series of slashes rained down on Ayn's. The combination attack was made using physical strength that far surpassed the capability of the human body, and it was among the most destructive assaults Ainz had ever faced from the inhabitants of this world. However, his strikes could not blow away a castle wall, and neither could it scar the land. How could it possibly harm Ainz? The greatsword's edge sliced through the wind, and Ainz took it full on his body. Good grief! Could you not crumple my clothes? Ayn seemed to find it all uninteresting, and he turned away after tugging on his robes and straightening them out. Then, a thought apparently came to mind. Ah, are you satisfied yet? Guo. Gu decided that slashing attacks were ineffective, and so he took one hand off his greatsword and threw a punch. This blow struck like a huge maul. If it hit a human being, they would surely have been pulped by its power and sent flying. Yet, Ainz took this blow which was assuredly fatal for a human being straight in the face. After that, he calmly dusted off the place where Gu had struck him, like he had been touched by dirty hands. Gu ceased his attack. His ugly face contorted into an even uglier shape, and he glared at the unmoved Ainz. So, is that end of the attack you're so proud, he of the brave name? It's only your defense, Gar. Ayn stepped forward to close the distance between them and swung his staff, which destroyed half of one of Gu's legs. Unable to stand, Gu collapsed heavily to the ground. Even with that acorn-sized brain of yours, you should be starting to realize that cowards aren't necessarily weak, no? The trolls and ogres watching the fight shouted in shock as they saw their leader's disgraceful state. Ha! Ayn's was beginning to tire of this, and sighed. The fact that they did not understand the situation even at this point proved that these monsters were worthless. Of course, it would be a different matter if they were smart enough to try and flee. Aura, seize him. He is the only one who cannot be allowed to flee. Aura immediately understood Ainz's terse order, and sprang into action. In the blink of an eye, she had caught up to the Naga, who was trying to sneak away invisibly. Got him, Ainz Summer. What should I do with him? Ainz paid no heed to Gu and looked to Aura, who had the Naga by the neck. The way he treated Gu made one thing clear to everyone present. In other words, he could not be bothered to deal with the Gu fellow before him. Gu growled from between his teeth at this utter humiliation, but Ainz did not care. Curse you, brat! The Naga's serpentine body started constricting, and it wrapped around Aura. I'll crush you too, I-e-e-e. A cold, 
calm voice came from the midst of the balled-up naga. You know, I can't watch Iron Summer like this. If you continue struggling, I'll use more force and crush your throat. Don't worry, you won't die from it. Her small fists were enough to make the naga realize the difference in their respective strengths, and the naga slowly loosened its coils with a strangled wail. Aura, while time is money, wastefulness is also foolishness. Please move a little further away so he doesn't end up getting killed by accident. Understood. Aura leisurely dragged away the naga who weighed several times more than herself as she left. Ainz shifted his gaze back to Gu, who had barely managed to stand up again after his regeneration caused his shattered leg to bulge up mightily as it repaired his ruined flesh. Ainz might not be as tall as his opponent, yet he towered over Gu. Oh, so you're healed. Then let us continue. Ainz rapped at his shoulders with his staff, then calmly took a fighting stance. His attitude said that he had no intention of defending himself. You. You, what? What did you do? What are you doing? Magic? Gu slowly backed away as he held his sword, while Ainz stepped forward like he was giving chase. Gu's stride was shorter than Ainz's. The distance between them was greater than when the battle had begun. Ainz snorted. Hmm. Well, isn't this strange? I, the one with the cowardly name, am advancing, while the bravely named Gu Summer is backing off. I wonder why that is the case? Someone replied from behind in a deadpan voice. That's because Ein Summer's name is the brave one, and that weird Gu name belongs to a coward. Isn't that right, Snake? Why, yeah. Ein's Ulgan Summer ish the greatest. After hearing the sweet little girl's voice and another voice which was on the verge of tears, Ainz nodded several times. I see, I understand now. Short names are the mark of a coward the name of Ainz Ulgan belongs to a brave and wonderful person, am I correct? Why you? Shut up, coward. Gu's anger overcame his fear, and he swung his blade at Ainz as though to hack him in two. Ainz did not parry or dodge, simply swung back with his staff. Ainz's blow did not permit Gu to block with his sword or evade. The staff shattered part of Gu's body, Abba. Gu's piteous wailing sparked fear in the hearts of his underlings as they watched the battle. Well, that's a troll for you, with their regeneration, they can even come back to life after being reduced to mincemeat. Still, pain does seem to hurt. That was the weakest attack you made so far. All you were thinking of was protecting yourself. You feared being hit by me. It was a coward's swordsmanship. Before Ainz was Gu, whose head was half its normal thickness. A normal creature would have died long ago, but his head was slowly returning to its normal shape. Gu's restored face was twisted into an especially disgusting shape. It was etched with terror. He was even more afraid than before, it was the reaction of one who had been broken by fear. You. What, what are you? Why couldn't I do anything to you? Ainz tilted his head, and then slowly spread his arms. I am death. I am he who brings death to you. You. You lot. Kill him. Good grief. I expected nothing less of a coward, to renege on the terms of our duel. Still, it does suit your name, so I will forgive you. Ayn seemed very happy as he said this. Gu's minions were scared stiff by this mysterious monster, and so they remained still. That was because despite their stupidity, they could feel the sheer power of Ayn's, and they had certainly witnessed enough of it. They were probably wrestling with themselves, unable to decide who was more fearsome. Nobody dared to move, they simply looked back and forth between Ayn's and Gu. Hurry! But they still did not move they could not move. The same applied to Ainz. There was a delicate balance here, one which rooted everyone in place. If Ainz made a move, this balance would collapse, and they would all flee for their lives. It would be troublesome if they escaped just the thought of hunting down and killing each and every one of them felt tiresome. In that case, let's do it this way. Playtime is over. Ainz activated one of his abilities, which he had not had the chance to use, and was too powerful for this world, 
despair aura v, instant death. The surging aura billowed out from Imes. The trolls, ogres and goo went limp and collapsed like puppets whose strings had been cut, slumping to the ground. The fallen monsters did not move. It was clear that although their bodies were still warm, the flames of their life had been utterly extinguished. An old man's voice rang through the silent cave. What? What didst? Thou do? The naga was curled up into a ball, doing his best to stay away from Eins. Eins turned around and replied. I simply used a skill. Trolls can regenerate, but that does not immunize them to instant death attacks. Honestly, you lot are worthless. I was simply thinking that rather than slaughtering you all outright, I should see what uses you might have, but since they refused to bend the knee, I decided to kill them all. This one gladly consents to be your subordinate. It is only natural for the weak to obey the strong. From now on, this one shall commit his entire strength to thee. Ains calmly looked down upon the prostrated Naga, and then shrugged weakly, Eh, whatever, it's fine. Besides, I came here to talk anyway. How? How fearsome! Thou thinkst nothing of this one. Thou regardst this one, who has long ruled the western forest, as little more than an animal-shaped pebble by the roadside. No, I am somewhat more interested in you than that. Didn't you mention something about the dark elves? Tell me everything. But of course. Of course I shall. This one shall gladly tell thee everything this one knows. Although, ah. Ein's wave to bid the Naga continued, and he said, Wilt thou spare this one's life after this one tells his tale? That I promise you. If you are loyal to me, if you serve me sincerely, I will reward you appropriately. But first, a question. Where are your minions? Or are you like Hamsuk? The beast who ruled the southern forest by herself? No, this one has underlings. However, this one came for the sake of negotiations, so this one did not bring them along. That was because this one's minions cannot make themselves invisible, so once negotiations broke down, they would have no way to flee. I see. Now, for my next question, do you have any troll minions? Only one. Excellent. In that case, can I have him take the place of the giant of the east? No, that's two. That might be a little troublesome. Very well. In a few days, I will bring my subordinates to know, you will go to the structure that she built. Aura, release him. Is that really all right? It's fine. He's already sworn his loyalty to me. If he betrays me, I'll simply think of some other way to use him. Aura's slender hands released the naga's neck, leaving hand-shaped bruises on his flesh. The naga was still nervous, but he was much more relieved now. Eins paid him no heed, but walked up to Goo's corpse. I wonder what sort of data a troll zombie contains. Eins could create undead beings from corpses with a skill. While they were little more than zombies or skeletons, he could make stronger zombies if the corpse of the base creature was powerful enough. A more famous example of those would be dragon zombies. Eins picked up the greatsword which had fallen to the ground. It was far longer than Eins was tall, but thanks to the basic principle of magic arms and armor, it shrank down to a size which best fit Eins. If Eins tried to swing a sword which he could not equip, he would be forcibly disarmed, but just picking it up did not pose any problems to him. Should I strengthen that village's fighting power? In that case, perhaps this magic weapon might be the best choice. Besides, there's no value in bringing it back to Nazarick. Eins Ul Gan Summer isn't he done yet? Eins tiredly turned to look at the Naga. This. This one will never betray thee. Only the fools who have never seen thy icy gaze that regards all before him as mere ants would dare betray thee. I did not think my eyes were as expressive as that. Or is this a skill of yours too? Even Demiurge, that master of scrutiny, could not tell what I was truly thinking. It hardly qualifies as a skill but this one can still sense whether someone is interested in this one. Eins thought, perhaps that's a Naga racial ability. Really now? Very well, I understand. Stop wasting time and gather your minions. This is my first order. Yes. 
Nazarick time, 2107. Demiurge's elegant form appeared within Eins's office. First, he bowed deeply to the seated Eins, and then nodded in deference to Mare and Cochitis, who were waiting within. He spared the maid a sign to this room a glance of acknowledgement. Eins answered with a look, and then spoke to Entema via, message. All right, Entema, tell Lupus Regina she has permission to set off. Those three must be protected no matter the cost. Understood. I will relay your orders to Lupus Regina. Demiurge walked to the center of the room, free of worries. His stylish stride made Eins envious. How shall I describe it, every move he makes overflows with confidence, is it because his back is very straight? Demiurge halted crisply, bringing Eins back to his senses. It is good that you've come, Demiurge. Yes. I thank you for summoning me before you, Einsummer. Have you finished speaking with Entema? Everything is fine. She reported back to me, and discussed the matter with me. She has passed this test. Wonderful. In addition, I thank you for making time for me, Einsummer. Pay it no heed, Demiurge. It is only fitting that I should match myself to the man who has done the most for Nazarick. In addition, you are not late, so do not worry. Now then, tell me what you think. Eins handed the piece of paper he was holding to Demiurge. Demiurge received it, and Eins saw him quickly scan it from top to bottom before asking. As you can see, this is a menu, but what do you think of it? The meal is for a human male and female, and possibly a child. I think that any human being must consume whatever you deign to provide for them without complaint, Ein Summer. However, I feel that is not the answer you seek, therefore if there is a child, they might not enjoy foie gras. In addition, hmm, lighter dishes might be more ideal. I see. That certainly bears consideration. I thank you. You honor me with your praise. Ein Summer, do you intend to invite people to the great underground tomb of Nazarick into the sanctuary of the supreme beings as your guests? Indeed. I intend to be hospitable. Or rather, it was not so much hospitality as entertaining them. This was a form of coercion backed by wealth, intended to keep them on good terms with him. Is that wise? Does it matter? Is there a problem? No, none at all. After all, Whatever you speak is correct, Ein Summer. In the past, when this had all been in the game world, the great underground tomb of Nazarick had played host to very few people other than the guild members. At the very most, they had invited the little sister of the guild member Yamako, whose player name was Akemi Chan, a few times. However, the guild did not forbid inviting anyone. It was simply that nobody had thought to do so which is why my friends ought to have no issue with me inviting Thuria and the others. Invaders are different from guests. Imes then turned to Demiurge who was pondering something and the other two guardians who had been waiting in the room before he asked. Guardians, are you ready to enter the baths? Forgive me, Mare and I were planning to borrow bathing equipment along the way. I see. Then, Kokitus O, oh, you brought yours along then we shall meet in the baths. Increment, if anyone comes, have them wait for me here. Understood. After hearing the maid's reply, Ein stood up and left his room. After ordering the vassals who usually trailed him around to remain where they were, he led the way to the baths, which were also on the ninth floor. Ein's very much wanted to chat with Kokitas as they walked side by side, but Kokitas was a very serious person and would never do such a thing. This made Eins feel a little lonely. Kokitas probably had not read his heart, but he approached Eins and asked. Eins summer. There. Seemed. Two. B. Fewer. Eight. Edge. Assassins. In. The. Room. Just. Now. Did. You. Send. Them. Somewhere. Eins felt a little disappointed when he discovered that it was work-related, but he also comforted himself by thinking that this was what Kokitas considered casual conversation, and so he replied to Kokitas. He very nearly let the excitement creep into his voice, but in the end he decided that it would be better to keep it a secret. 
they are at the E. Rantle Inn. Narborough is waiting there in case we have an unexpected visitor. They ought to be observing the situation from afar. Is. It. Not. Dangerous. To. Leave. Narborough. Alone. By. Herself? Quite. If anyone plans to attack, they ought to do so now. I see. So. She. Is. Live. Bait. Then? Indeed. If the person who brainwashed Shiltier is observing our every movement, this bait will surely have them drooling. After Momon defeated the mighty vampire Shiltier granted, she was known by a different name nobody attempted to approach him. That being the case, if Momon is not around, leaving the magic caster all by herself. They. Will. Take. The. Bait? I don't know. But if they do, I will be a master baiter. Eins mind the action of pulling up a fishing pole. Will. We. Mobilize. All. Our. Forces. Then? As if. I won't do that. First, we'll feel out our opponent. If they're as strong as us, or stronger, then we'll have to be more humble. Cochitis groaned. He understood the reasoning behind that decision, so he had no choice but to bear with it. The. Logical. Part. Of. Me. Knows. It. Is. Only. A temporary. Thing. But. Emotionally, I find. It. Hard. To. Keep. My. Cool. Bear with it until we've checked them out thoroughly and found our opposition's weaknesses. Once that happens, I will have them taste the purest of pain. I will not forgive them for daring to brainwash Shultier and forcing me to put her down. Even if they were players, Eins did not feel the slightest bit of empathy for them. The only people Eins cared for were the NPCs or his old friends. If anyone aroused his ire, he would subject them to a fate worse than death in order to show them the foolishness of their ways. Repay good unto good and evil unto evil. Is that not to be expected? Ein smiled coldly, as a surge of excitement welled up inside him. If the opposition really were players, then he could conduct far better experiments. The first of them would probably be the one he dared not perform with himself that of death. An. I. Four. An. I. And. A tooth. Four. A tooth. Then? Correct. However, did you know? That phrase was originally meant to warn against excessive retribution, so I did not use it. That's because I intend to pay them back with interest. Punito-san said that, Eins added in his heart. Oh. I expected. No. Less. Of. You. Ein summer. Not. Only. Are. You. A supremely. Skilled. Warrior. But. Your. Intellect. Is. Beyond. Compare. Truly. I. Am. In. Or. Eins did not need to look back to feel the wave of respect pressing down on him from behind. Then. Do. You. Plan. To. Spend. The. Entire. Day. In. Nazarick. I'm summer? No, after I bathe with everyone, I'll take care of some work here before going over there in the middle of the night, because there's a lot of things which need to be settled over there as well. How about yourself? I plan. To. Temporarily. Return. To. My. Position. Guarding. Nazarick. Since. The. Matters. Which. Require. My. Personal. Presence. At. The. Lakeside. Have. All. Been. Concluded. Once you return, the only ones working outside will be Demiurge, who has many tasks to complete, Sabas and Solution, who are gathering information in the royal capital, Aura, who is building a base in the forest, and then Nabral and myself. I find. It. Hard. To. Accept. The. Fact. That. A supreme. Being. 
must, personally, handle, work, we, should have, taken, on. Ha ha, forgive me, Cocytus. There, is, no, need, I'm summer, you, rule, this, place, and, so, your, every, word, is law, what, I just, said, was, mere, foolishness, in, addition. The mood in the air seemed to have changed, and Eins found it odd. Looking back, he saw Cocytus looking somewhat gloomy although he could not tell from his face. If. We. Were. All. As. Capable. As. Demiurge. You. Would. Not. Need. To. Exert. Yourself. In. The. End. It. Boils. Down. To. Our. Lack. Of. Ability. That's not true. When everyone made you, they sought to create the right person for the job. That being the case, the most important thing for you is to finish your assigned tasks. Frankly speaking, it doesn't matter if you can't do anything else. Although, the fact that Demiurge is somewhat more intelligent and more knowledgeable means he can tackle a wider range of problems. Kokaitis did not seem to be able to accept that, so Eins continued. In that case, you should focus on slowly learning how to handle more things, for instance you are now in charge of the Lizardman village, so you should have learned a lot from it. Ruling that village will surely aid you in the future. As long as you slowly proceed, step by step, someday you will come to be on par with Demiurge. Can. I really. Do. That. I feel that you can't say it's impossible, Eins replied in a roundabout manner. Nobody can surpass Demiurge's intellect. In order to equal him, you must walk an arduous road. But I believe your efforts will not be wasted. The two of them continued silently along the corridor. Soon, Kokaitis quietly said. Thank. You, Ein Summer. I don't think I've said anything which deserves your thanks. All right, Kokaitis, we're almost at the bath. Cheer up before Demiurge and Mare come. Yes. Spa Resort Nazarick was located on the ninth floor of Nazarick. It was a comfortable place of leisure which boasted nine separate outdoor-themed baths and seventeen indoor-themed baths for both men and women, the most impressive of them was the Cheerinkoff bath. Its warm water radiated an actinic blue light, allowing bathers to enjoy a decadent atmosphere. Eins, who had reached the baths in Kokaita's company, was utterly shocked when he saw an unexpected someone. I'm Summer. Heart. It was Albedo, who seemed to be ending her sentences with hearts today. No, it was not just Albedo alone. Shultier was behind her, along with a tired-looking aura. In contrast, Demiurge and Mare were nowhere to be seen. Perhaps they were waiting for Ains and Kokaitis in the changing room. A hey, Albedo, what are you doing here? Hmm. I simply came to bathe with everyone. You too, and Summer? Ah, um yes, I did. What a coincidence, Albedo. What a lovely coincidence indeed, I hear that it's best to engage in some light exercise before bathing in order to work up a sweat. Shall I sweat with you, Ein Summer? A chill ran down Ein's spine. Well, table tennis is not a bad thing. Or... I didn't mean that, really, you should take a hint. She closed in on Eins with the technique of a level 100 warrior something which Eins, as a magic caster, could not hope to evade and reached out a finger to Eins's chest, which was covered only in a robe, in the hopes of tracing letters on it. However, her finger, as soft and delicate as a minnow, instead slipped into the space between Eins's ribs. Ah. Ah. Both of them made the same sound in unison. What a stupid scene. Ein smiled bitterly, intending to address Albedo, and then his face froze up. I put my finger into Ein Summer's precious place. Albedo's face was flushed red, her eyes dewy, and an overwhelming fragrance rolled out from her body. 
that scent was very similar to the odor he sometimes smelled on his bed. Oi, I asked before, but has she always been this weird? Eins tried his best to speak in a normal tone to Aura, who was trying to hold back a struggling shiltier. Forgive me, Eins Summer, a lot of things happened, um, please treat this as stress that she built up after working hard for Nazarick every day. Yes, please think of it that way. If. If that's how it is, then it can't be helped. Uh. Umu. Albedo, thank you for your hard work every day. Ein's plan to swiftly retreat, but someone grabbed his robe. No, there was no need to look, he already knew who it was. Albedo, what are you doing? Has something driven you to abandon all restraint? What you said to me just now. It lit a fire in my heart, and it made my belly twitch. So, Ein Summer. Uh, no, hang on, wait a minute, calm down, Albedo. Cococitis. Understood. A gust of chilling air filled the passage. The sudden temperature change seemed to have brought Albedo to her senses, and the light of reason returned to her eyes. I cannot. Sit. Idly. By. As. Someone. Disrespects. I'm summer. Even. If. It. Is. The. Guardian. Overseer. Herself. Cocytus cut between Ains and Albedo. He had his platinum halberd in hand, a wordless threat that he would gladly act on if Albedo tried anything funny. I apologize, Ains Summer. I seem to have forgotten myself. I accept your apology, Albedo. After hearing his master's judgment, Cocytus stepped aside. However, he did not put away his halberd. I understand your duties are weighty, and that there are times where you wish to cast everything aside and relieve your frustrations. In any case, go take a bath and let go of your stress. Thank you, Cocytus. Saying so, Ein sought to scurry into the male bath, but the footsteps from behind him made him halt. Albedo, why are you following me? Perhaps you do not know, so I will tell you, but this is the men's bath. You should be going to the ladies' bath. I was hoping to wash your back. Ein Summer? Denied. Besides, I'm not bathing alone. The male guardians will be with me. Do you wish to appear naked before them? Just as Ein thought, she might actually say it's okay because she's a succubus, Albedo promptly replied. In that case, there are family baths elsewhere. Family baths are not meant to be used that way. But Ein Summer, I feel it's unfair how you're only spoiling the men. That's right. That's right, Shiltia whined as she covered Aura's mouth. However, Aura who had been forcibly dragged along had dull, blank eyes that simply hung open. Behind them was Cocytus, who seemed quite unhappy. We're just bathing together, what does she mean by spoiling them? The same thing happened last time, is something wrong with Albedo? Could it be she's gone a little mad ever since then? Albedo, permit me to say something. I prefer women to men. I am purely heterosexual. Albedo seemed to want to say something, but Ains raised his hand to interrupt her. It is certainly possible that such a relationship might take place some day. However, I have not even figured out our place in this world, and so, as the leader of this organization, it is inappropriate for me to pursue such a relationship with you all. You are you. Albedo knit her brows. Besides, you are all like the daughters of my friends I am conflicted about that, I was wondering what was happening at the entrance. It would seem you were all inconveniencing Ein Summer. Oh, Oni Chan. She. She's dead. I'm not dead, a weak girl's voice replied. I've been waiting a long time for you too. Forgive our tardiness. However, the guardian overseer should probably learn how to rein her emotions in. Demiurge's typically narrowed eyes were cracked open just a little, allowing the hostility within to seep through. The air around him turned dangerous, highlighting how scary a typically gentle man could be. Seemingly affected by this, Cocytus appeared ready to do battle with Albedo. The smile remained on Albedo's face. No, it had grown wider. You fools! Eins could not hold back his anger and shouted at them. 
I forbid you guardians to quarrel in front of me. You idiots! All the guardians trembled, and fell to their knees in unison. Please forgive us, Ein Summer. All right. Get up, all of you. After seeing that everyone had risen, Eins used a gentle tone, like he was chiding children, to admonish them. Do not squabble over such petty matters. That will only disappoint me. Do you understand? As he heard them simultaneously reply that they understood, Eins let his anger vanish. All right, let's go bathe and clear the air. The men will come with me. Also, Aura, I order you to keep an eye on the ladies. Keep an eye on the two behind you and do not let them mess around. Understood. Aura's eyes blazed furiously. She probably felt that this was a chance for a counterattack. Such was the scorching heat rolling out from her that Albedo and Shiltier were visibly shaken. Eins entered the door hung with the men curtain, and deliberately ignored the racket coming from behind him. He shed his clothes in the locker room. If he were normally equipped, he would have to remove many items and it would be very troublesome, but he had prepared before coming here, and so he shed his clothes swiftly. After quickly disrobing, he went on into the baths. Every time I strip off, I always wonder how exactly I can move. He was a fleshless skeleton, and the fact that he could actually move was a mystery to Suzuki Satoru. That said, moving skeletons were a common sight in this world, so all he could do was take it for granted. Even so, he had his doubts from time to time. I'll be heading in first. Please. Please wait for me. A naked mare scampered up behind him. He might have been a trap, but looking at him like this, he was most certainly a boy. His body was that of a child's, with virtually no muscle mass. The fact that his body, which felt so soft, could exert so much force was probably due to some unknown natural law of this world, much like Eins's own. As he gazed upon Mare's nude body and pondered that question, Eins chided him. Don't run around in here. The floor is wet, and it's dangerous. It was impossible for a guardian to die from falling and hitting their head. However, after seeing Mare's childlike body, he could not help but worry for him. Uh, yes. I'm very sorry. Do you have to apologize for that? Eins wondered. Forgive the delay, Ein Summer. After that, Kokaitis and Demiurge showed up. Demiurge's body was sheathed in firm, wiry muscle, and he gave off the impression of being toned. One could not design the body under one's clothes when making a character, so perhaps Albert had written his physique into his backstory. Kokaitis, you look the same as always. Well, he's typically naked. Could. You. Please. Not. Phrase. It. In. Such. A perverted. Way? Forgive me. Kokaitis uses an exoskeleton, so his usual appearance can't be helped. Exoskeletons were a kind of natural weaponry, much like Shiltier's nails and teeth. Such equipment gained in hardness and durability as their users leveled up, as well as increased data crystal capacity. Their merits were that they did not need to be changed often, and could be used for long periods. Even if they were destroyed by weapon sundering attacks or skills, they could be restored along with their users' HP through the use of curative magic. In addition, they would not be dropped upon death, among many other advantages. Conversely, they were inferior to the primary gear most players of an equivalent level used, be it in terms of hardness, durability and data crystal capacity. Even at level 100, almost no natural weapons and armor could match up to a divine class item. Perhaps one might be able to do so if one possessed job classes which strengthen such bodily armaments, but even Irons did not know if it was possible. Natural weapons and armor were not very advantageous for players, but they were quite useful for NPCs. This was because one did not need to gather a big stack of armor and weapons for them in other words, the player making the NPC could save himself the trouble of equipping them. Thank you, Ein Summer. Kokaitis bowed in thanks, but Irons had not spoken in his defense, still. Could it be that everyone uses that to tease him to make fun of him to the point where he has to thank me for stepping in? Should I try to subtly tell the others to lay off? 
Was it like this for teachers with bullies in their classes? He did not know how Yumeko-san had handled this sort of thing in the past. As he pondered the topic, he spoke to the male bathers. All right let's go in. The group entered the baths, led by Eins. There were twelve areas in this large bathing facility. The first was the standard bath area, then the jungle bath, which was the largest, the ancient Roman termi, which were very atmospheric, the pomelo baths, where pomelos floated in the water, the sulfur baths, the jet baths, the electric baths, which had a mild electric current to numb the skin, the cold baths, with charcoal floating in them, the cheering cough baths which glowed with a mysterious blue light, as well as the open air, granted, the outside scenery was all fake, mixed baths, there were also the sauna and rock bath areas, and finally the rest room. So, which would you like to try? Share your views with me. I feel. The. Cold. Baths. Are. The. Best. I would. Like. I'm summer. Two. Experience. The virtues. Of. The. Cold. Baths. Eins was resistant to cold damage, and even entering the chilly cold baths was not a hardship for him. However, something felt wrong about suggesting someone take a cold bath right after entering the bathing area. Kokaitis san. We came to bathe, so. After hearing Mare speak, Kokaitis seemed to have realized that he had made a mistake somewhere. Just then, someone proceeded to mount a follow up attack. We came here to bathe so perhaps you should have recommended a hot bath to promote circulation. Oh, that's right, I should ask you a question. Can you bathe in hot water? You won't look like a cooked lobster, I trust? It's fine. This exoskeleton of mine is fire resistant. Even if you consider it a naked body. Kokaitis said proudly. Ah. Ah, then I think perhaps we should go for a normal bath. Cold. Baths. Ah. The. Best. Taking. A cold. Bath. While. Clinging. To. A chunk. Of. Ice. Is. Very. Comfortable. I won't say only you would like that sort of thing but I doubt many people would share your tastes. All. All right, it would be quite boring if we went and bathed on our own, so let's take turns using them all. We'll start with the jungle bath my friends put a lot of effort into making it. After his subordinates replied, we're all looking forward to it including a somewhat dejected Kokaitis Eins led them to the jungle bath. There were fake trees and fake grass here, and it was made up to look like a forest. Even though they knew it was fake, it was realistic enough that everyone half expected monsters to emerge from the woods. This bath was modeled after the Amazon River of the past. Its creator was Bell River San, with the assistance of Blue Planet San. Eins turned his back on the impressed guardians, then he took his basin and bath stool to the washing area. Why are all the basins in this spa yellow? When I asked about it in the past, he said it was tradition. Are the water basins in all spas supposed to be yellow? Needless to say, you need to clean yourself before getting into the bath. However, the way in which I bathe is quite messy, so you should probably stay away from me. With that terse message, Eins dumped the basin full of hot water on himself. The water went straight through him and splashed onto the ground. Due to the many gaps in his body, it was very hard for him to rinse his entire body in just one round of pouring. After repeating this several times, and making sure that he was wet, he took out a brush. Irons loaded the brush with liquid soap and began to scrub himself. Just like before, the many gaps in his body meant that scrubbing himself was like scrubbing a colander, and so foam and bubbles sprayed everywhere. Umu. Maybe I should have brought my cute little bathing assistant Miyoshi-kun with me. Irons felt that it would be unsightly to let his subordinates see him all covered in slime, so he had not brought it out. However, he had not bathed himself in a while, and it was quite troublesome. As Eins frantically scrubbed himself, Mare approached him with a yellow stool in hand. He was clearly nervous, 
but he smiled to Ainz, his face flushed from the heat of the baths. A Ainz Summer. Please. Please let me help you wash your back. Hmm. Oh, I see. So you want to help me bathe? Although, I have to say that my body is quite tedious to wash, so you should use this brush. Cleaning it with a towel is very tiring. Ainz turned his back to Mare, and Mare began slowly scrubbing his back with the brush he had received. You're doing a good job. Thank you very much. Honestly speaking, Ainz could not tell if it was a good or a bad job. However, he had said so to Mare because he was grateful. Ainz looked at the other two. They seemed to be saying, Then, I'll help you wash your back, and thank you. Kindly. Ainz could not keep the smile from his face, although skeletal faces had no facial expressions. The great underground tomb of Nazareth really is the best place around. Behind him, a boy's voice said, I think I washed this place before, right? And it only broadened Ainz's smile. Thank you, Mare. Now it is my turn to help you. Don't be shy. Ainz grabbed the boy's shoulders and turned him around, then applied bathing foam to Mare's towel and lathered it up. He gently scrubbed Mare's body, taking care not to hurt him. He thought about the strength he used to wash himself, and tried to use less force than that. Does that hurt? No. Not at all. After helping Mare who had gone all stiff for some reason wash his back, Ainz returned him his towel. You can do the front yourself, right? Of. Of course. Ainz picked up the brush and scrubbed his ribs. Mare was rubbing himself beside him, so Ainz took care not to spray him with his foam. Then, I shall head over first. After Demiurge finished rinsing himself off, he headed for the tub, swishing his tail behind him. He was followed by Kokaitis, who probably had as hard a time bathing himself as Ainz did, but who could effectively use all four of his arms to save time. Naturally, Mare was next. Ainz finally finished washing up several minutes after everyone was done. The tub was quite broad, and a skillfully carved lion statue disgorged hot water from its mouth into the steaming tub. Ainz walked through the water vapor and noticed that Kokaitis was especially distant from the others. The other two were enjoying the hot water, at a distance from him. Ah the hot water feels nice. Ainz thought that as a child, Mare would swim around in the tub, but instead he simply folded his towel and put it on his head, a relaxed look on his face. That attitude was less fitting of a child than an overworked adult. As Ainz saw it, he felt surprise, and then he wondered, is the job of a guardian of Nazareth really that tiring? Oh yes. I feel the fatigue flowing out of my body. Demiurge had removed his glasses. He splashed some hot water into his face and went a tilde, looking just like a middle-aged uncle. So. Hot. That. That's strange, er, uh, didn't you say you were resistant to this? I. Am. But. I. Do. Not. Usually. Soak. In. Hot. Water. So. I. Am. Not. Used. To. It. Still, that's no reason to use your cold aura. I hope you will keep your distance, I prefer my hot water somewhat scalding. Now he knew why Kokaitis was so far away. The water around him was probably only warm now. You. Are. Fire. Resistant. So. It. Is. Fine. For. You. Why. Not. Try. A cold. Bath. That does not interest me. Besides, I have not engaged my resistance, I am simply enjoying the hot water. Kokaitis, do you find this much unbearable? Demiurge. Coming. From. You. Such. Taunts. Are. Shallow. However, you. Are. On. Stop that. Baths should be enjoyable. If you want to test your endurance, please do so in the sauna. You don't need to force yourself to bathe here. Hawa. Mare exhaled hotly, his forehead beaded in sweat. Look, you need to enjoy the bath like Mare's doing. Mare, don't push yourself either. 
If you feel hot, you need to get out. It. It's fine, I'm summer. If anything happens, I can use magic. Using magic isn't quite right either, Ainz thought. However, he did not say anything, and simply looked at Kokaitis. Is it right to use one's resistances when bathing? I think some people do bathe in that way, Ein Summer. For instance, as one of the undead, you will not be dizzy no matter how long you soak. Is that not the same way? Indeed. He could feel the warmth slowly seep into his body, but it did not feel as good as it had when he was still human. An undead body has its merits and flaws. Just as Eins was mourning his lost joys. Hmm. He raised his head clear of the steam rising up from the water, and looked around. Is something the matter? I think someone was calling my name. Could. It. Be. Coming. From. The. Other. Side. Kokaitis pointed at the wall behind him. That's ah, I see. The lady's bath. I see. No, but. The walls should not be that thin, no. Perhaps the echoes made their voices louder. Eins could not resist the urge to prick up his ears and listen. There was no ill intent in what he did, he was simply curious about what a group of ladies would talk about when there were no men around. Therefore, he did not place his ear to the wall, doing so would damage his dignity as the ruler of the great underground tomb of Nazarick. He even stepped away from the wall and turned to face it. Albedo, you're so bushy down there. Eins frowned as he concentrated and heard the conversation from the other side. Aura, don't describe it like that. Our Eins summer ought to be behind this wall. I wonder if there are peepholes or anything. Eins carefully studied the entire wall, because he was worried that someone might actually have installed some sort of strange mechanism into it. There was a time when some of the guild members had been obsessed with making strange devices and gimmicks. The relics of those times might have remained until now. Usually, they'd be the ones peeping, right? I doubt that's the case. There's no need to peep at us, if Ein's summer commands it, we will let him look at us. Why peep? Oh, it's rare to hear you make sense like that, Shultir. What do you mean by rare, how rude? By the way, is that a toothbrush? Could you please not brush? I mean wash your teeth in the bathroom? I can't help it. Cleaning them is really tiring, so I have to do it in a big room like this. Otherwise it'll be very troublesome. Albedo's voice came from a somewhat higher position, followed by the sound of a loud scrubbing. Hmm. That does look quite tiring. Oh well, it can't be helped, so I'll let it slide. Thank you. You were, don't shake your head and look at me, it's really gross. Shultir, not brushing? I brush on my own in my room, so I don't need to. Still, will we really get cavities and so on? Even if we don't, bad breath when kissing can cool off even an ages old love. The sound of brushing suddenly stopped, replaced by the sound of plodding footsteps. Eh? Wait, don't tell me you're going to jump in like that? At least do something about your body. First, there was a loud plunk, followed by the sound of water splashing. She must have jumped forcefully into the tub. Wah! Cough cough, cough, if I were a storybook vampire, I'd have drowned by now. You're not a kid anymore, don't just jump in. Foo foo foo. Ah this feels great. I'll come here to bathe from now on. You ought to learn some bathing etiquette. Huh? What happened? That's weird, is that lion moving? The ill-mannered are forbidden from the bath. Exterminate. A male voice suddenly spoke, which made Eins and the other men look at each other. Uh, ah, that sounded like a man's voice. I have. Not. Heard. It. Before. But. Could. It. Be. The. Area. Guardian. Of. The. Baths. However. Why. Would. There. Be. A man. In. The. Ladies. Bath. No, I've heard that voice before. It's Lucy Fursan. 
As he heard the voice of that troublesome man, Ainz recalled how several instances where that man had given him trouble. Honestly speaking, Ainz did not like him much. Is. That. The. Voice. Of. A supreme. Being. It's so hard. This isn't an ordinary iron golem. Die, you golem craft bastard. There was a loud crash, and then the sound of something hitting the wall at high speeds. That hit even shook the walls of the men's bath. Just in case, get your weapons ready and prepare to charge into the ladies' bath if anything happens, Eins ordered the clearly demoralized guardians. If friendly fire was not in effect, perhaps it might end in laughter, but given the present circumstances, someone might actually get killed. Their fighting power was lowered without their gear, and depending on the circumstances, they might really need to be rescued. I'd like to be able to bathe in peace next time. Ein stepped out of the tub with a splashing of water and headed for the changing room. As they heard him speak, the other guardians nodded in unison.